in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. It seems to me the entity that planned mankind made a very wise decision not to let us know our future. How many of us would be defeated before we began? As it is, only the fortunate few get an even break from destiny. This tale concerns two men, pursued and captured by their fate. Said Lord Chesterfield, My fate is like that of an eagle who, being shot down, observes his own feathers on the arrow that kills him. Of this story, he couldn't have said it better. Paul, when I saw you eyeing the maid of honor at your wedding to Louisa, I knew right then and there Louisa was marrying the wrong person. Now, hold on. Till the day she died, Louisa never thought so. I never let her find out anything about me that would hurt her. Hmm. You really think she knew nothing? Not unless you told her. <laughs> a fine friend you are. Oh, Paul, you don't need a friend. You need a keeper. Our mystery drama, Let No Man Put Asunder, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by James Agate Jr. and stars Michael Wager and Russell Horton. I shall return shortly with Act One. Start your book. Let me set the scene for you. It is December 31st. By special permission of the warden, architect Mark Young is permitted to visit inmate Paul Raymond, now residing in cell 101 in the Arizona State Prison. It's a long-standing custom of theirs to celebrate New Year's Eve together, and the warden felt that kindness could do no harm. Permission granted. Mark! You're here, Mark. Mark, I'd like you to meet the gentleman who just opened my cell door. Happy keeper of the keys, guard extraordinary in charge of such suspected murderers as myself, Paul Raymond. Oh, you're not serious. The, the charge isn't murder, it's suspicion. Would you mind standing up, sir? Mr. Young? Uh, me? Uh, stand up? Thank you. Hands out in front of you, please. Look, I, I don't like being frisked on New Year's Eve when the warden has okayed my visit here. And I'll tell you what else I don't like. I don't like Mr. Raymond being suspected of anything illegal, let alone the murder of his wife. I'll tell the warden. Ah, oh, what a world this is. Those outside the bars and those inside. <laughs> and who would have thought a year ago today we'd be seeing the old year out in a prison cell? Or that Louisa would be dead. Is it fate? What is it? I wonder. What is it? As long as I've known you, and that means going back to our college days, that the two women who've loved you... Isn't it strange what, what's happened to them? Mark, what are you, are you thinking of Janet? Huh. And Louisa? The way they ended up? Yeah, I agree. A terrible way. You know, Mark, I... I never forgot Janet. I can say that honestly now. Paul, I don't know how to make you out. I really don't. Am I that complicated? I've never met a man as tough as you, almost as though you had no conscience. Ah, reminisce with me, old chum. I don't think you'll want to hear this. Try me. Do you remember the last day of college? I was putting all my books together, packing clothes, taking the pictures on the wall. You, I don't know where you were, raising cane somewhere. It was getting late, around one in the afternoon. We were supposed to be out of our rooms by six. You hadn't been in since the night before, and there was a knock on the door. It's unlocked. Come in. Ah, oh, hi, Janice. Uh, Paul's not here. Are you packing? <laughs> that I am. Are you going home? Yeah, for about a week. Then I'm off to uh, Pace Architectural. Then I'm putting a whole summer. Mark, do you know where he is? Paul? Oh, hey, you got me. You think he'll be back soon? We better be. Everyone's supposed to be out by six. I'll wait for him. Um, uh, Janice, I, I can't guarantee Paul's going to show up. I mean, you know him. He's not going oh. to show up. <laughs> He's very good at making a liar out of me. Hi, Janice. Come to say goodbye to us lucky seniors are getting out. Next year it'll be your turn. Paul, I... 
<laughs> hey, honey, you better see the doctor. Mm-hmm. Colio doesn't sound much better than it did over the weekend. I've been to the doctor. What do you say? Will you live? Everything connected with me will live. Uh... Look, uh, kids, if you two want to be alone, I have to return these books to the library anyway. No, no, stay. I, I just came up for a pack of cigarettes. We're due out of here at six on the button, Paul, and you haven't even started packing. Plenty of time. I have a business deal cooking in town, which I just have to lock up before going. Paul, I have to see you. Okay. So you have to see me. Have a good look. I mean I want to talk to you. So talk, kid. Go ahead. I have to talk to you alone. Uh, I'm on my way out, guys. Uh, Look, I can't right now, Janice. How about about down at the boat? I'll say in half an hour, 2.30. Good, quiet place to talk. I'll get back here in plenty of time, Mark. Don't you worry your little head. See ya. Oh, I hate him. Janice. What's this all about? He's not going to show up at the boathouse. Well, does it really matter? So you've had a little quarrel. Friends always do. Friends? He knows. I told him. Now that there's a problem, he's he's just giving me the brush. You mean Paul won't do anything? He says it's all my fault. He's right, of course. It, it was all my fault to be taken in by him. To believe we'd be married. Well, I thought he was very serious about you. He can walk away. But I can't. You don't know my family. Well, Janice, take it easy. Now, I, I know Paul really loves you, but in many ways, he's just an irresponsible kid, and he hasn't come to terms with the situation yet. The doctor said if I, if I wait much longer, it'd be dangerous. How long has it been? Three months. You've known that long that you were pregnant? So did Paul. He kept saying, wait, wait, and I thought... Oh, what a fool I was. I thought we'd get married right after he graduated. Well, what makes you think you won't? Because he told me so last night. He said I'd better go see a doctor. He's got no conscience at all. I know how he feels about you. Don't give up on him. Then you know more about him than he does. Look, I'm going. Uh, uh, Janice, will you keep me posted? I, I want to know. I, I, I want to help. Mark. Give this to him for me. Okay. Uh, should I know what's in this envelope? Fifty ten dollar bills that he gave me last night to take care of things. I don't want the money. Well, where are you going now? I don't know. Walk around the campus, I guess. Janice, will you come see me after you've talked to him in the boathouse? I, I want to know what happened. You think something will? Well, how do you know it won't? He may be going to pick up an engagement ring at Silver's right now to surprise you. Oh, I'd like to believe that. Just don't give up on him yet. I'll go to the boathouse and wait for him. Thanks, Mark. Oh, hi, Paul. Well, you took your own sweet time. Now, look, it's 6 o'clock. I'm sorry, buddy, but I I can't hang around. Wait! Sit down, please. Something... Something terrible's happened. Something awful. I... I don't know what made her do it. I... Listen, Janice and I were... We were going to get married, you understand? We, we... We really were. That's the honest truth, Mark. Oh, what happened? She's dead. What? I... I got to the boathouse... But we agreed to meet at 3.30, remember? Uh, uh, no, not, not 3.30, Paul. 2.30. What do you mean, 2.30? Well, that's what you said, 2.30. I heard you. I couldn't have said 2.30. I was buying Green's Variety Store. We had a closing at 2.30. I'm going to buy a lot of stores. So y- you got to the boathouse at 3.30. Then what? I couldn't find her. I couldn't find Janice. I, 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 I went out. I looked around. I asked Roberts, the caretaker. He's seen me. He went back inside with me and he found her. She had hung herself. It was awful. Paul, um, there'll be an autopsy. They'll find out she was pregnant. How did you know? Well, she came here. She gave me this money to give back to you. So you, so you knew everything? Well, not really. Only her side of it. You're still my buddy. Thank heaven for that. 
Oh, Mark. I would have married her. I just wanted a little time to get myself started. She, she had this crazy idea. I would give her to the brush. That wasn't true. Mark, you know me better than that, don't you, Mark? Yes, honorable guard? Just checking. Uh, guard? Yes, sir. Did the warden inform you I have permission to remain in Mr. Raymond's cell until after midnight? Yes, sir. I do not know why he keeps coming into my cell. <laughs> I don't want to expect to find. Janice. Oh. Yeah, Janice. That was a grim episode in my life. How long was it, Mark, before we saw each other again? I'm not sure. I was established as an architect. I kept reading about you in the papers. Paul with this merger, that merger. Oh, you read about me, didn't you? And I began designing office buildings while you appeared to be gobbling. You asked me to be best man at your wedding to Louisa. Ah, that's when we got together again, I remember. And it was right. After that, we started a little custom of celebrating a new year together. Mm. Yeah, I enjoyed that. What uh, time is it? Um, 10.40. I'm thinking it was about uh, a quarter to 11. Louisa would start her alchemy with that special hot punch of hers. <laughs> Darn to think. In all the years we were married... I could never get her to make a decent New Year's Eve punch. All you could taste was the cranberry juice and the apple juice and the cinnamon and the cloves. And the... She never put in enough vodka. So you ended up drinking with hot fruit juice. And I didn't mind it. You. <laughs> she could have served us a cinnamon stick to you with an olive on top of it, and you'd be groveling with gratitude. Was I that obvious? Oh, listen, I didn't mind. I, I had my diversions. Paul, uh... In a little over an hour, the new year will start, and um, I, I can't honestly face it without telling you something that that I hope won't hurt you, but it, it hurts me to keep it secret. <laughs> it's your problem is you've got a conscience. Yes, well, perhaps yours is that you haven't. Did you ever think that the girl you married might have known more about you than she admitted? Louisa. She knew nothing. We fell in love. We married and then, did she, uh, have any regrets? Why should she? I kept my other private life. Private. And who would have said anything? You? No. I never kept score. But you've always been pretty ruthless. Mark, after all these years, are you blaming me for Janice? No. Did Louisa ever find out about her? Now, you tell me, Mark, tell me! If I were to cry out to the guard, no more visits, nothing. Sorry, sorry. We couldn't have known. We had nine good years together, she and I. Very good years. This would have been our tenth New Year's Eve, so long as you believe she knew nothing. What is this? A Sunday school lecture? Look, I... Live my life my way, you live yours your way. But you don't care who gets hurt. Uh huh, so she did know you told Louisa. No, you didn't. I don't believe that. Fine friend you are. Oh, you don't need a friend, Paul. You need a keeper. If you are wondering why Mark made a special effort to spend New Year's Eve in prison with Paul. So am I. Why was he going back over a past they had both shared? Was it because there is something there neither of them can forget or wish to remember? I'll return shortly with Act Two to satisfy my curiosity. What? Friends have made a habit of spending New Year's Eve together. However, this hour before midnight on December 31st finds them in a prison cell where Mark, a successful architect, 
is visiting Paul, an equally successful businessman who, unfortunately, is being held on suspicion of engineering the death of his wife. Oh, right, Buck, I'm sorry. Let's say you didn't tell Louise anything. But why did you bring up the subject? Because of what I have to tell you now. Paul, there was once something between the two of us. Louise and you? Yeah, it, it, it started ten years ago. At your wedding. <laughs> when you were my best man. That's right, that's right. And Louise's father came down from Maine to give his daughter away. Uh, Mr. Everett's. I sure remember him. Dressed in his full regalia, chief of police of Pebble Harbor, Maine. I take thee, Louisa, to be my wedded wife. To have and to hold from this day forward. For better, for worse. For richer, for poorer. In sickness and in health. To love and to cherish. Till death do us part. I take thee, Paul, to my wedded husband. To have and to hold from this day forward. For better or worse. For richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish till death do us part. You and Louisa marched up the aisle married, and I went and stood by Chief Ever. Your daughter makes a beautiful bride. Did you see what she was doing? Your friend, Paul? Did I see what? All through the ceremony, while he was marrying Louisa, Paul was winking at the maid of honor. Why, uh, I didn't see that. Oh, yes, you did, young man. And you didn't like it any better than I did. He has a roving eye. I can only pray she's spared the heartbreak. So that was what that old man said to you. Well, you were so obvious about it. It was then I thought it was time you and I saw as little of each other as we could. Then, why did you agree after I married Louisa to come by for each New Year's Eve? You didn't like me. No, I didn't. And the more I learned about you, and how you spent your time, the big deals, the mergers, the more I knew how little we had in common. Well, then, why? Louisa... I had to keep tabs on her to make sure she was getting a fair shake. So I accepted those annual invitations year after year. What? Well, were you at the house our very first New Year's? I, I can't remember. I know I invited oh, you. Oh, yes, I went. And you weren't there when I got there. Oh, I knew where you were. It was in all the gossip columns. Louisa, uh... I hope I'm on time. Paul said to come at eight. Oh, come in, Mark. He's not here yet. Oh. I, I, I guess he's working. Well, he didn't say. Well, I didn't decide to come until the last minute. Uh, it's, after all, your uh, first New Year's Eve together. Oh. And what are you, a stranger? Paul's best man? As a matter of fact, you've turned down more invitations than you've accepted. Yeah, only work got in the way. I must show you this. Paul gave it to me at breakfast. Isn't he beautiful? He put the chain around my neck and... No, I can't take it off. The catch is bent. Oh, I can see from here a big gold disc. Mm -hmm. Must be two inches across. For our first New Year's. Uh, look, can you see what's written on it? Um, for the only love of my life. <laughs> I hope he meant it. Well, why do you say that? I thought you knew Paul. Oh, I think I do. Well, then you should... Share my hope. I do. I do. Uh, aren't you sure of his love, Louisa? No, Mark. I'm not. The hours pass. Nine o'clock. Ten. Quarter to eleven. Still, you hadn't returned. Oh, I knew where you were, Paul. And I could have killed you. That actress, Bianca. Well, was it? How could you be so unthinking? So so lacking in conscience? Bianca, yeah. That's who it was. You don't know what it did to me. 
Louisa was the first woman who'd come into my life since the death of my mother. Hey, that could explain a great deal. If you hadn't placed your mother on such a pedestal, perhaps today you wouldn't be a bachelor. Louisa came into my life. I felt she ought to be protected. I sat there. It got later and later. No, Paul. My heart went out to her. Louisa? Yes. Well, what can I do? We're waiting for Paul. What is there to do but wait? Oh, what time is it, Mark? Uh, midnight's only an hour away. I hope he's all right. He wasn't in an accident. I mean, you know how careless people get on New Year's Eve. There's a special angel that watches people like Paul. Keep them away from harm. <gasps> what was that? Oh. Oh, silly of me. It was just the clock. It's, uh, 11 o'clock. Oh, Mark, I, I can't bear this waiting. Uh, look, I I'm, I'm, I'm leaving. I'm, I'm going to go now. Where? I just can't bear to see you so upset. I, th- I think I know where Paul is. I- I'm going to go bring him back with me. Oh, no, no. Don't go, Mark. Don't you run out on me, too. I'd be all alone. I... I can't bear that. I... Oh, I just can't. Louisa. <laughs> now, don't cry. Come here. Put your head on my shoulder. You won't be alone, I promise you. I won't let you be alone. Why is he like that? He knows I love him. It is New Year's Eve. Couldn't he spare me the time? Tonight? Now, he'll be here. There's just some stupid little reason that's keeping him so late. Now, here. Here. Take this handkerchief. Thank you. Wipe your eyes. Oh, I can't. Why not? You're holding me so close. I can't move my arm. Well, well, that must have been quite a touching scene. I'm sorry I missed it. You came in soon after. You didn't notice me. I was shaking. Midnight came, we drank the punch, we sang Old Lang Syne, we pledged eternal friendship. Let me see if I can remember First New Year's Eve. Yeah, it was most decidedly Bianca. <laughs> I would have checked everything for her. That's the way I felt about Louisa. Oh? And Louisa? What did she feel for me? <sighs> Nothing more than a friend, I guess. But from that day on, I was a changed man. I never forgot. I haven't to this day, ten years later, the touch of her arms around my neck and the fragrance of her hair. She became all that was beautiful to me, and that was why, no matter how you behaved, Paul, I felt that I betrayed you. Oh, Mark, I can't get over this. Because of that little episode, that nothing, you felt guilty. Oh, I don't suppose you would. But to me, living in the same neighborhood, you so often out of town, me at my drawing board within walking distance of your house, and, and Louisa, but you were a good boy and you didn't drop in to see her while I was away. Is that what you want me to believe? I don't care what you believe. There are a lot of people who aren't like you. Oh, Mark, I wasn't always like that. It's the work. What I do... It's completely absorbing. And what I play, it's the same. Louisa knew the person I was before she married me. Now she's gone. That's life. Lord, you speak without any feeling. You don't know what I feel. Now, you finished with your mea culpas. Almost. Oh, happy the keeper of the keys will be coming back to make sure I haven't escaped. Whatever they're afraid suspected murderers will do. Then, what happened? Well, nothing until a year later. Again, I arrived at your house at 8 o'clock. Oh, and this time you were home. You'd been on a bender the day before and lay asleep on the sofa. Louise and I sat together in the kitchen. Very romantic. I'm afraid the kitchen's the only place we can talk without disturbing Paul. 
He's been so busy, he's, he's simply exhausted. Louisa, uh, I, I think I'll skip this New Year's Eve thing. I'll, I'll stay a couple of minutes and then go home. Oh, he'll be terribly disappointed. Have you had dinner? Yeah, I did, an early one. <laughs> I don't eat much evenings. I'm usually working then. Well, if you've no work to do, won't you please stay? For me? Yes. Mark, why have you been such a stranger? Oh, I go where people want buildings built, and I go home to design them and then back to supervise the building. Paul hasn't been home much either. He's always off on one of his surprise attacks, as he calls them. He works it out so a little company secretly buys up stock in a big company and then swallows it. Hmm. You've become quite a corporation wife in the past 12 months. Does it make you happy? Happy? Oh, I don't know. Disappointed. Oh? Why? Paul doesn't want any children. Um, Louisa, should you be... And Paul didn't come home. And then, for one moment, you and I... What, what, what I'm trying you to say You held me in your arms. And you comforted me. Louisa, I cannot bring myself to come to this house year after year seeing you as his wife. I cannot do it. Mark, listen, please. I still love him. Do you understand that? I'm married to him. And so far as my feelings go, he can do what he likes with whomever he likes and still come home and find me here, waiting. And the other thing, Mark, is that I want a family. We've talked about it, Paul and I. I want babies. But you said that Paul didn't... I think he will. In time. What does he say, yes or no? Well, now he says, let's wait, maybe. Don't you understand now why there can't be anyone else for me but Paul? He'll change. He'll settle down. and I want nothing on my conscience when he does. Okay. So be it. I understand. Uh, but, look, I can't stay tonight. Um... Tell Paul, when he gets up, I have to catch an early morning plane for Arizona. Oh, he'll be very disappointed. Is it because of me? Uh, no, no, no. I, I have a commission for a house near Phoenix. <laughs> I've always hankered to do a desert house, and this will be it. <laughs> oh, maybe one day you'll design a house for us? Well, well, why not? If Paul decides to remain in one place, uh, this, uh, this desert house would suit you. Oh, look, I, I, really, I really must go home. Oh, I'll take you to the front door. Mark, how would it suit me? Well, I'm, I'm doing it in exposed wood framing and um, a great sheltering slate roof with wide overhanging eaves. <laughs> and, of course, a pool, uh, natural slate rock. Oh, I can just see it in the Arizona desert. I've read so much about it. be a perfect house for Paul and me and four children. A lovely dream. I'll keep dreaming, Louisa. Uh, I'm sorry I made such a fool of myself before. Oh, Mark. You didn't. I, I just don't know what to say. Oh, you said it all. Goodbye. <laughs> Nobody ever died of heartbreak, we are told by the poets. Yet, as Mark Young remembers his farewell to Louisa, he also remembers that at that moment, he thought his life had drained away and was totally empty. I shall return shortly with Act Three. Taking a laxative? Yeah, traveling throws my system off. But so can a laxative. Not many really useful. That's been a...
Mark Young, a successful architect, shared his college days with Paul Raymond, today an extraordinary man of business specializing in company takeovers, known as mergers. What they could not share was the love of Louisa, Paul's wife. Set me as a seal upon thine heart, says the Song of Solomon, for love is strong as death, jealousy as cruel as the grave. And in a newly dug grave lies Louisa, and blamed for her death is her husband Paul, in prison, suspected of murdering her. Why, well, you've never stopped being my friend, Mark, and I... I appreciate that. Mark, you think I'm innocent? Yes, I do. And I'll tell you why. You remember I decided to stay on in Arizona and make that my home. <laughs> well, that's more. I remember two years later, we followed you out there. Paul! You are the last person I ever expected would walk into my office in this neck of the desert. And you do not know the half of it, Mark. Louise and I aren't just visiting. We're staying here. We've, we've decided to make Arizona our home. Oh, how is she? It's it's uh, been two years. Yeah. But she's all right. You don't sound very enthusiastic. Oh, well, I... I guess I'm not. <laughs> you, uh, really get to know a woman after you've lived with her for a few years. All that innocence they had you when you first meet them turns into real conniving after they've latched onto a good thing. Paul, I don't know what to say. That, that doesn't sound like her at all. In my business, uh, conniving... Getting your own way. It's the name of the game. This, this is Louisa's idea. Really, we we want you to design a house for us, Mark. In the meantime, we've rented the Thornton place outside of Phoenix. You know that? Oh, yeah. I drive right by there every day on my way to the office. No servants except for a housekeeper. We had her with us back east for over a year now. Good, capable woman. Paul, oh, any children? Oh, no, thank heavens. You didn't want them? I wouldn't have worked. I want to go all the time. Sometimes I like to take Louisa with me. You can't drag babies all over the world. Uh, I'm not much into fatherhood anyway. Well, I thought Louisa wanted a family. Mm, yeah, she still talks about it sometimes. But I think she's come around to seeing things my way. We have a full life. Mm. You see anything of Louisa's father? Old Everett? Chief of police, Pebble Beach. Yeah, Louisa keeps in touch. When did you rent the Thornton place? A month ago. Gosh, you, you two have been here all that time? Yeah. I'm, I'm surprised Louisa didn't call you. She, well, she hasn't been that well. I'm not sure Arizona's going to agree with her, but I've got to make this my base. Whole new development scheme. I shouldn't even be talking about it on the other hand, you're my oldest friend, so why not tip you off so you can make yourself a bundle? Uh, first things first. Now, I'll get your ideas on the kind of house you want. <laughs> you probably have a bundle by now. You mad? Uh, no, I, I haven't found Miss Wright yet. Well, I guess we've almost caught up on each other's lives. <laughs> now, this year, Mark, we've got to spend New Year's Eve together again. Like we used to, huh? What are you doing for dinner tomorrow night? Well, I, I tell tonight, but I'm flying to Vegas. I'll be back late tomorrow. Are you inviting me? We are. I'm nothing fancy. The housekeeper had to go back east. Her brother's sick. But Louisa loves to cook. Okay. I'll be there. Great. And uh, give Louisa my love. I'll just tell her you're coming to dinner. You can give her your love yourself. When I drove up to your house the next night... It was a blackened shell. Flames still licking at fallen timbers. The hoses still going. You were in front with the fire chief, and when you saw me, you ran over. They can't find Louisa. She's in there somewhere. They haven't found her. Louisa? Is he near? The chief says they have to wait till all the timbers cool off before they can send the men in. Well, I'm not waiting. Oh, Mark, don't. Maybe she's not even in there. Louisa? Louisa? Get back! Get back! Louisa! Where are you? Get that crazy guy! You sleep? Uh, no, I'm awake. 
Paul, which hospital am I in? Phoenix, General. How are you feeling today? Pretty alone. No visitors? You know what I mean. Louisa, gone forever. Oh, yeah, I know. Anybody, uh, stop by? Well, a couple of men from the office just left. They wanted to know how long I'd be here. When are they taking the bandages off? On the end of the week, I hope. It kind of went off my head, I think. I know how you feel. Do you? Yesterday there was a brief moment when they gave me an inkling of hope. But no, it, nothing. I had this crazy idea. I thought maybe it wasn't Louisa they found. Maybe, maybe it was your housekeeper. I wonder what time you thought of that. I mean, I, I did too. That, what I meant when I said it turned out to be nothing. They... They took me to the morgue to make a positive identification. There wasn't much to recognize except that gold charm I I gave her for our first New Year's. It was awful. She's really gone. In all that heat, would you believe it? You you could still make out the writing on the charm. Where's the housekeeper? Kick myself. I know her brother lives in Boston, but some roomy house. I don't know the address. She'd taken off the day before the fire. Oh. Yeah, you did tell me that. I remember now. Get well, Mark. You're the only link I have now with my sanity. Take care. Okay? I'll stop by tomorrow. Okay. Thanks. Is this the nurse's station? Yeah, I wonder if you could put through a prison-to-prison call for me to Chief Everts, the chief of police in Pebble Harbor, Maine. There isn't a word of truth to the murder charge they're holding me on. I... I got rattled. I, I said I'd come back on one plane from Vegas. I forgot I had to change planes, and I got in earlier than I said. I'm sorry about this, Paul. What? Fire department. They've got it all backwards. They said they found some gallons of gasoline in the whole closet. It was cleaning fluid. Whoever set fire to the house, it wasn't me. Like I told them, I was coming in from Vegas. And all the time, I thought I owed you an explanation. What for? Oh. Louise? Oh, that's nonsense. You want to know something, Mark? You want to know why I ran around and didn't care if she found out or not? She knew how you felt about her. She told me. She also told me that you were the one and only love of her life. Mr. Young, there's a visitor to see you and Mr. Raymond. Who is it? I don't want to see anyone. It's your father-in-law, Paul. Open the cell door, guard. Yes, Chief. Mr. Efforts. Now, listen, I'm sorry. Save it. Hello, Mark. I think I've got all the information we were looking for. What is all this about? Chief Everts has been doing some investigating since I got out of the hospital. Investigating? What's to investigate? It was an accident. Faulty wiring. Who knows? Oh, do you remember a girl called Janice? What is this? The year you and Mark graduated. What are you trying to pin on me? The girl you said had died in a boathouse. There seems to be some questions as to how she died, whether it was suicide or strangulation. An autopsy is being performed. What are you... They did that already, an autopsy, years ago. Perhaps not as carefully as they should. What's waking up all... Things that happened long ago. What's that got to do with my being held here? Oh, I see. You never liked me, Chief Everts. Not from the moment I married Louisa. So you're going to fabricate anything you can so that her death can be hung on me. You're wrong, Paul. You think I wanted to get rid of her, but I set fire to the house. I'm going to get myself the best lawyer there is and beat all of you. You too, Mark. You're against me. That's why you came here today, to rehash what we've lived through. Paul, 
You're wrong about one thing. I don't believe you're responsible for the death of Louisa. In fact, I'm sure you had nothing to do with it. Well, at least that's one honest opinion. And he's a chief of police, too. He ought to know what he's talking about. Yes. God, what is it now? I just wanted to tell you people it's one minute after 12. Thank you, God. Happy New Year. And there's someone here from the warden's office to see you, Mr. Raymond. Oh, it's a good thing I've got a decent-sized cell. Sure. Uh, let her in. The more, the merrier. Happy New Year, Paul. Louisa. Happy New Year, Daddy. Happy New Year, Louisa. Get out. Get out, all of you. I don't want to see anybody. It's a frame-up. You hear me? A frame-up? God, get these people out of here! This is my cell! I had no idea you might still be alive. Louisa, what a thing to do to all of us. Well, not to Father. He knew. I was staying with him at home in Maine. You see, Miss Benson, our housekeeper, she never made that trip to her brother. After Paul had gone to Las Vegas, her brother called and said he was out of danger. I just decided it was a good time to visit Dad in Pebble Harbor. I needed his advice about a lot of things. So I left Miss Benson to take care of the house. Well, did you know that Paul identified her as you because of the gold charm he'd given you? Yes, I- I've given it to her. It's a terrible thing. She had to pay the price of being mistaken for you. Well, any guesses on what happened? It'll all come out of the trial. But I suspect Paul got home early, set the fire, and left. Then later he returned, pretending he just arrived. Mark, Daddy told me you went into the house when it was burning to save me. <laughs> well, yes, yes, I did. And you ended up in the hospital. Bruised, but not burned. How can I thank you? Oh, I'll think of something. In the meantime, what about dinner? <sighs> Well, I guess in my marriage to Paul, I ended up burned, but not bruised. Do you think uh, you two might recover? Well, I don't know. We could give it a try. I like a story that ends on a note of hope. I like to know that in spite of tragedy... Here are two people who can pick up the threads of their lives and begin to weave a rewarding lifetime together. Louisa and Mark were fortunate to find their own road to a future which detoured well around an ugly past. I shall return shortly. Hi, I'm Susan Anton. Fitness that feels good by day needs firmness that feels good by night. That's why you'll love the third of perfect sleeper. Luxurious top comfort plus deep inner support. You get both with every perfect sleeper. So remember, be a perfect sleeper. Buy a perfect sleeper, perfect sleeper. It's a healthy investment in yourself. Honey, we're having cheeseburgers like we've never had them before. We are? Here's your fork. My fork? Yes, your fork. Where's my bun? Cheese. I want my bun. Help your hamburger stay cheese. Mm. Help your hamburger, help your hamburger, help make cheese for the Our cheeseburger macaroni is a blend of tangy cheese, hearty macaroni, and savory seasonings that give cheeseburgers a whole new meaning. Hamburger helper. Well, did you miss the bun? Help your hamburger. <laughs> what fun? I think of the character of Paul as ruthless, self-centered, and as we used to say at home, too big for his britches. I myself steer clear of people like that, and for what it's worth, I caution you to beware of a man who has no conscience. He is not of the order to be lived with. He lives by his own rules and dies by them. After all, he who loses his conscience has nothing left worth keeping. Our cast included Michael Wager, Russell Horton, and Joyce Gordon. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now... 
a preview of our next tale. They are bombs? That's correct. Only waiting to be exploded. My camera, which I substituted for yours, is a timing device. And the flashlight? That is the detonator. Now, as I am talking, I have put them all together. It only remains to set the... Another cup of Maxwell House coffee, George. Sure, pour me a cup, Gracie. You know, Maxwell House is always good to the last <laughs> drop. And that drop's good, too. Yes, it's Maxwell House coffee time, starring George Burns and Gracie Allen. <laughs> With our special guest tonight, Meredith Wilson, B. Benaderet, Hans Conried, Gail Gordon, Harry Lubin and the Maxwell House Orchestra, Bill Goodwin, and yours truly, Toby Ray. For America's Thursday night comedy enjoyment, it's George and Gracie. And for America's everyday coffee drinking enjoyment, it's Maxwell House. Always good to the last drop. <laughs> As we join the Burnses tonight, we find them discussing the gala New Year's Eve party they're planning for tomorrow. Gracie, we're going to have the greatest New Year's Eve party in town. Mm, you bet we are. Money is no object. I've hired an orchestra. You did? Yeah, and on New Year's Eve, musicians really come high. And they leave even higher. <laughs> uh, what about the food? Did you take care of that? Mm -hmm, I bought two turkeys. Oh, and I hired a maid to pass around the hors d'oeuvres. This is really going to be some party. Mm hmm I, uh, I bought champagne. You did? Uh-huh. And at midnight, we'll fill our glasses and drink bottoms up. Isn't that an awkward position? <laughs> yes, it'll spoil my hat. You know, darling, with an orchestra tomorrow night, you'll be able to sing your very best. Ah, no. People don't want to hear me sing. Oh, they do, too. And sometime before the party, be sure to learn that new popular song, Drop Dead. <laughs> a popular song called Drop Dead? Sure. Well, there must be. At every sociable, when you get up to sing, you say, oh, what would you like me to do when everybody oh, else... Oh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> That's my big hit. Oh, Drop Dead, oh, Drop Dead, oh, Drop Dead. <laughs> you are the ideal of my dreams. Yes. Is that how oh, yeah, I got it. Uh, by the way, uh, how many guests are coming? Oh, I must have sent out 20 or 30 invitations. Mm. I invited a lot of old friends we haven't seen for a while. Meredith Wilson, Good. Professor Korkendorfer. Wonderful. Gracie, you've really worked hard to make this party a success. I'm going to give you a kiss. Well, thank you. And tomorrow night, New Year's Eve, you'll get another one. Gee, two kisses in one year. <laughs> Got the one on your birthday. Oh. That was a big one, too. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I hope everyone shows up for the party. I haven't had any replies to the invitations I sent out. Well, did you say RSVP? Of course not. I said, come to the party. <laughs> Besides, do you don't have to spell things for me. RSVP. If you want to say Russ Voop, just say it. <laughs> RSVP is not Russ Boop. Oh. Uh, Come in. Howdy, little lady. Howdy, little man. Why, Mr. Judson, what a wonderful surprise. George, look who's here. Say hello to our dear friend from Texas. How do you Come do? Come in and sit down, Mr. Judson. Well, thank you. First, I'll wipe off my boots. I don't want to get this dust on your rug. Oh, what a gentleman. You're wiping your boots with a clean handkerchief just to save my rug. No, ma'am, to save the dust. It's from Texas. <laughs> After I shave, I, I use it for talcum. Oh. Well, George, why don't you speak to Mr. Judson? How do you well, do? Well, tell Mr. us all about yourself, Mr. Judson. Why haven't you been to see us? Well, my family's been in mourning, ma'am. Oh? Yeah, terrible tragedy. My sister. Young, pretty, never sick a day in her life. You mean... Yeah. She got married and moved to Oklahoma. <laughs> Oh, I am sorry. 
Thank you, ma'am. George. <laughs> do you realize you haven't spoken to Mr. Judson? How it's do you not do that he isn't glad to see you, Mr. Judson. <laughs> He's just shy. Uh, by the way, what brings you to California after all these months? Well, now, I brought some fine Texas steers up here for the stock show. Uh, oh, that reminds me, I've got to get back to my hotel and feed them. You keep the steers in your hotel room? Oh, why, sure, sure. Oh, don't you get complaints? Yeah. Yeah, them steers boil their heads off, but it's the best hotel you got. <laughs> well, I, I'll be moseying. You're now. not budging until my husband has the decency to speak to you. George, we're waiting. How do you do? <laughs> Is that any way to speak? Now, do it right. Oh, you you'll have to excuse him, Mr. Jackson. He's, he's got his mind on the big New Year's Eve party we're giving tomorrow night. Invite Mr. Judson to the party, George. George? Jo he's gone. Uh, yes, ma'am. He, he stepped into the next room. Well, here, I'll give you one of the printed invitations I sent out. I had one left over, so I put it in this drawer just in case, you know. Uh, oh, oh, my goodness. Well, what's the matter, little lady? You sound distressed. Oh, I am. Here are all the invitations to our New Year's Eve party. I forgot to mail them. <laughs> oh, George will be furious. Yeah, yeah, he'll bella like a short-tailed steer in fly time. Oh, I'd better hurry out and, and see all the guests personally and beg them to come to our party. You'll come, won't you? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, but i got to get back to the ranch and help my wife. Uh, the hogs has been slaughtered, and by now she's probably smoking sausages. Oh, I hope she doesn't inhale. <laughs> You hope she doesn't in here. <laughs> oh, I like your sense of humor, man. <laughs> but, Bill, you've just got to come to our New Year's Eve party tomorrow night. The Mortons and Bagley's can't make it, and Professor Korkendorfer has other plans, too. Well, so have I, Gracie. I promised to go to a party at Helen Burkett's house. Uh, we're going to do a little smooching. Well, uh, couldn't you come to our party for a while? Well, no, I'll be tied up all evening. Tied up? You won't have much fun if you can't use your hands. <laughs> you no, know, Gracie, I mean, it's a date I can't break. You know, it's a, it's a real thrill to spend New Year's Eve with Hollywood's most... Glamorous blonde. Yeah, well, I guess it is. Well, sure, I can't rob the poor girl of that thrill. Oh, gee, I wish you'd change your mind. <laughs> Bill, we're going to have two turkeys and George will sing. That's three turkeys. <laughs> well, I still have to turn you down, Gracie. Your invitation comes too late. Well, I better hurry along and try to get the other people. If this party doesn't come off tomorrow night, George may get so mad he'll walk out on me. He he'll leave me to starve. Well, don't worry. After he's starved a while, he'll come back. Oh, but Mrs. Vandal, if we've paid for the food and musicians, and George's heart will be broken if no one comes to the party. I'm terribly sorry, Mrs. Burns, but Chester and I plan to spend New Year's Eve with the Butterworths of Pasadena. We're friends of long standing. If you come to our party, you can sit down. <laughs> no, we shall sit down. We shall sit before the fireplace and toast each other. Oh, come to our house. We're using marshmallows. <laughs> we'll drink the toast in champagne. I love champagne. It makes me want to get up and dance, and the bubbles tickle my nose. <laughs> when you dance, you better not hold your bubble that high. <laughs> When you've had a few too many, you don't know what you're doing. We will not get loaded, intoxicated. <laughs> oh, Mrs. Vandalip, please say you'll come to our party. If you don't, I'll have to go home and face a horrible disaster. Well, wish him a happy new year for me. <laughs> Well, Meredith Wilson is my last chance. I hope he's home. Hello, all. Meredith, how are you? Uh, 
Meredith, you were supposed to get a beautiful invitation to our New Year's Eve party, but I forgot to mail it. Well, that probably accounts for my failure to receive it. Yes, yeah, yeah. So I'm inviting you right now. You've just got to come. It means so much to George. Oh, I'm afraid I have previous plans for tomorrow night, Gracie. I'm proposing to a lovely young creature, just the type I've always wanted to marry, a girl. <laughs> Must you propose to this girl? George will be so disappointed. Why? I've never given him any encouragement. (laughs) No, I mean, he'll be disappointed if you don't come. Can't you propose at our party? Oh, no, I fear that's too public. Besides, I've promised to kneel before the very sofa on which her father proposed to her mother. Oh, did she accept him? I presume so. Uh, uh, Do her folks approve of you, Meredith? Oh, yes. Her entire family has taken me to their, if you'll pardon the expression, bosom. (laughs) How nice. It's unfortunate that your party isn't tonight, Gracie, as my betrothed is working and I'm quite free. Yes, if tonight were only New Year's Eve, all the people I invited could come and that... Meredith, I've got it. What? I'll make tonight New Year's Eve. Well, have a care, Gracie. You are assuming powers greater than those of Patrillo. I mean, I'll make George think it's New Year's Eve. But that's 24 hours away. That's the idea. He's going to bed early tonight, so I'll get all the guests over and wake George up and tell him he slept 24 hours. That's a brilliant idea. Gracie, no one else has a brain like you. Except possibly me. Mm-hmm. We do make a great team. We're like those congressmen who support each other in Washington. When we put our heads together, it's a solid block. Only one more day, friends, and Old Man 1948 will be ready for the history books. There's a grand song that's part and parcel of this New Year's season, an age-old favorite. But now let's see if you name it after hearing only the mellow harmony. We'll help you out by adding the rich counter-melody. And now to add the rhythm with good Scotch vigor. You'll be able to join in the chorus yourself as we blend in the full-bodied melody. Yes, it's the ever-popular Auld Lang Syne, a heartwarming favorite you've enjoyed many times when all of its fine musical parts are expertly blended in a full, rounded orchestration. And friends, it takes the same expert skill in blending to create the famous heartwarming flavor that has made Maxwell House America's favorite brand of coffee. Yes, Maxwell House is famous for flavor. Superb, good-to-the-last drop flavor no other coffee offers you. This mellow, deeply satisfying flavor is created by combining not one, but many choice varieties of coffee from the highlands of Latin America. First, Monticelli's coffees are selected for mellowness. Next, Medellin's add richness. Other choice coffees give vigor. And Booker Amongus coffees are added for fine, full body. This perfectly balanced Maxwell House blend is then radiant roasted to flavor perfection and brought to you vacuum packed and roaster fresh. And because you folks on the West Coast really know and enjoy coffee at its best, Maxwell House is blended and roasted for you right here on the West Coast to satisfy your critical tastes. So tomorrow and all the year ahead, 
Enjoy the extra flavor, the extra satisfaction that's yours in every cup of America's favorite brand of coffee, Maxwell House Coffee. Always good to the last drop. Everybody. Are enough people here to get the party started? Oh, sure, Gracie. Well, uh, does everybody know everybody else? Meredith, you haven't met the Vandalips. Oh, how do you do, uh, Mr. Rosen? How do you do? It's always a pleasure to widen my acquaintances. Thank you. By that, I mean I enjoy meeting new people. I'm sure that you and your wife are wide enough. <laughs> <laughs> well, I like that. Oh, uh-huh, I knew you'd get along. Now, uh, uh, put on your paper hats, everyone, and I'll go in and wake George and tell him it's New Year's Eve. Well, how long has he been in bed? Oh, about 15 minutes. Well, maybe he's still awake. Oh, no, no, I don't think so. He was lying on his tummy, and that way he usually rocks himself to sleep. (laughs) Now, I'll wake him up, and the party can start. Happy New Year! What's it? What was that? It's New Year's Eve, dear. It's... New Year's Eve? This is, this is Thursday. No, nah, no, nah, dear. It's Friday. You slept for 24 hours. Are you going out of your mind? Get out of bed. The guests are here for the party. Guests? Well, sure, listen. Happy New Year! Happy New Year! Get rest, dear. I must be dreaming. Hand me my robe. Here. I don't believe this. Happy New Year! Happy, Happy New Year! Year. I feel like I only slept a few minutes. You slept 24 hours, you sleepyhead, you naughty boy. 24 hours? Why didn't you wake me? Oh, I didn't have the heart, darling. You were so tired. Funny thing is, I still am. (laughs) Now, the the, the guests are waiting. Come on, I'll help you out of your nightshirt. Close your eyes. Close my eyes? My nose is shiny. <laughs> I feel so tired. Oh, here's George. Now the party can start. Happy New Year, everybody. Happy New Year. Blow your heart, George. Uh. <laughs> Having a good time? Yeah, fine, fine. <laughs> 24 hours, and I'm still tired. <laughs> yes, George slept for 24 hours. He's a regular Rip Van Wrinkle. <laughs> that's, uh, that's Winkle. I like it her way. <laughs> now, uh, before we start the entertainment, Tallulah will pass the hors d'oeuvre. Tallulah, stop trying to date Bill Goodwin. Why, Mrs. Burns, such a thought never crossed my mind as sure as my name is Tallulah Schwartz. Hollywood 5264. <laughs> All right. Pat the order. Oh, if you mean the weenies, they ain't burled yet. Well, please go and burl them. <laughs> Meanwhile, uh, while we're waiting for the order, Meredith Wilson will play a flute solo. Oh, good. That's well. Well, thank you. Uh, gentlemen of the orchestra, may I please have an introduction to the Andante Cantabile from Sigourney <laughs> I forgot to bring my flute. (laughs) Well, we won't let that spoil our fun. Happy New Year, everybody. Happy New Year. Oh, isn't this gay, George? George, wake up. Huh? You're not enjoying yourself. Here, blow your little horn, dear. Uh. (laughs) Now we're rolling. I'm so tired, I can't understand it. Well, here is Professor Korkendorf, huh? I guess I'm too early. There's nobody here yet. Let's show him, gang. Happy New Year! Somebody spoke? Yes, Professor, everyone's here. Now hang up your coat and join the party. Oh, yeah, I hang it up here on this nice long hook. Take your coat off my nose. 
<laughs> Can't you see? Of course I can see. I got ice like a hog. <laughs> So long, Professor. Where have you been? Oh, I, I was experimenting with a little monkey, and I couldn't bear myself away. Oh, interesting work, huh? No, no, no. Strong monkey. <laughs> George! <laughs> George, look who's here. George. George, wake up. <gasps> oh, you're not having fun, dear. Blow your little horn. <laughs> Hello, Professor Cockendorfer. Okay. 24 hours since I slept and I'm bushed. Well, look who's here, Professor. The monkey followed me. <laughs> this, is, this is my husband. Such a nice girl to marry a monkey. <laughs> oh, fine. Well, now that all the guests have arrived, Tallulah, pass the order. Okay. I got your weenies here. They're red hot. Weenies, anybody? Schultz and Newman's weenies. They're skinless. She means the weenies. Schultz and Newman both have skin. <laughs> have a weenie, Bill. Oh, thanks, Tallulah. What's the good word? Hollywood 5264. <laughs> All right. And now it's time for games. Uh, you can play too, Tallulah. Oh, much obliged, I'm sure. Well, uh, I would like to suggest a game. It's, it's called Word Association. Well, how's it played, Mr. Vanderlip? Well, we stand in a circle, and someone says a word, then the next person says whatever word that reminds him of, and so on around. Now, let's make a circle. Mrs. Burns, may I have your hand? No, I'm already married. <laughs> I only want to hold it. Uh, now, come on, everyone. Uh, uh, you take my hand, Professor Korkendorfer. Oh, sure. My, you've got such hot fingers. Get your hand out of the weenie. <laughs> Please. <laughs> now, if anyone says a word that doesn't fit, they must leave the circle and go into the next room. All right, we'll start with the uh, gems. Diamond. Zafaya. You're next, George. Wake up. Huh? Uh, oh, you're not having fun, dear. Blow your little horn. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll start again and we'll skip your husband. Diamond. Zafaya. Ruby. Coil. Emerald. Maxwell House Coffee. <laughs> That's a gem? Oh, you said it, brother. <laughs> what a coffee, rich, delicious, mellow. Only Maxwell House gives you that good-to-the-last-drop flavor. Mr. Goodwin, we are all aware that Maxwell House is delicious, but you cannot mention it unless someone else says a word that legitimately suggests coffee. Oh, oh, I see. Well, let's start again, then. Uh, Diamond. Zafaya. Ruby. Pearl. Emerald. Donut. Donut? Thank you, <laughs> Maxwell House Coffee. <laughs> Donut without Maxwell House. That rare blend of the choice Latin American coffees. Radiant roasted to the peak of flavor perfection. Mr. Goodwin, go into the next room. Okay. Uh. Now we'll start again with another category. Uh, England. Austria. Sweden. Maxwell House coffee. <laughs> Why did you say Maxwell House coffee? I want to go in the other room with Bill Goodwin. <laughs> Shall we try vegetables as a category? Uh, lettuce. All right, what's stopping us? <laughs> I was naming a vegetable. Lettuce. Rudebega. Corn. Maxwell House coffee. You too? I want to go in and see what Bill and Tallulah are doing. <laughs> yeah. Think I'm crazy or something? <laughs> Well, that does it. The game's over. Maxwell House coffee. We're not playing anymore. Who's playing? I want some Maxwell House coffee. <laughs> it's so delicious. Oh, say, that's a good idea. I'll go make some. Have fun while I'm gone, everybody. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. You having fun, George? <laughs> from the most talented member of the Burns family. <clears throat> oh, that, that's a swell idea. Sing for us, Gracie. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no
I'm not a good singer. Huh? Oh, you're swell, Gracie. Oh, I'm not. Huh? <laughs> well, really, Gracie, you're an excellent vocalist. Oh, I'm terrible. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> Look, would you like to hear from me? Yeah, blow your little horn. <laughs> Calling to me, not the bomb, the air, nor the tropical sea. It's a little brown gal in a little brass skirt, in a little brass shack in Hawaii. It is Waikiki, nor Kamehameha's Polly, nor the Beach Boys Free with their whole Molly Molly. It's a little brown gal in a little brass skirt, in a little brass shack in Hawaii. Through that island wonderland. She's broken all the Connie's heart. It's not hard to understand. For that, Wahini is a gallant part. But even soon, the thrill I'll enjoy. It's not the island moon, the fish or the poi. It's a little brown gal in a little brass skirt, in a little brass shack in Hawaii. of our party. Everyone be real quiet, and, and we'll hear from my husband, Sugar Throat Bernie. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh, the poor darling, he's sound asleep. Sh- shall I wake him up so he can sing? No. Oh. Well, then I guess the party is over. Happy New Year, everybody. Happy, Happy New, New Year. Year. Where am I? Gracie! Gee, everybody's gone. I can't get over it. 24 hours sleep and I couldn't stay awake at my own party. Well, I better get my Rose Bowl tickets out of this drawer. Got to start early in the morning. Holy smoke, what's this? All the invitations to a New Year's Eve party. Gracie didn't mail them. What goes on here? Hello, operator. Hello, operator. Operator, tell me, is this New Year's Eve? No, I'm not plastic. <laughs> it isn't? That's tomorrow night? Thanks. So the whole thing is one of her tricks, huh? Well, here's where I get even. Good. She's sound asleep. Happy Fourth of July! <laughs> <laughs> It's the 4th of July. You've been asleep six months. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh, oh, how wonderful. Now I can go out and buy all new summer clothes. <laughs> For me, nothing else. Now here again are George and Gracie. Ladies and gentlemen, George and I want to wish you all a very, very happy new year. Blow your little horn, dear. I can't, dear. I swallowed it. <laughs> Gracie, I've got a surprise for you. Next Thursday, our guest star will be Gregory Peck. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, I'll feel kind of silly standing alongside of a big, handsome guy like Peck next Thursday. Oh, don't worry, George. You'll have something he won't have. What? All the straight lines. <laughs> Good things. The easy way. Do you like good things the easy way? Then get instant Maxwell House coffee. So good. So good. True coffee flavor and fragrance because instant Maxwell House is not a so-called coffee product. It's all pure Maxwell House coffee in instant form. And so easy. So easy. Instant Maxwell House means great coffee instantly in your cup. No fuss, no muss, no bother. Today, try Instant Maxwell House, instantly good to the last drop. 
Until next Thursday, when our special guest will be Gregory Peck, good night and good luck and a happy new year from the makers of Maxwell House, America's favorite brand of coffee. Always good to the last drop. Meredith Wilson appears through the courtesy of the Jell-O family. The Jell-O program brought to you by Jell-O and Jell-O Pudding, starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Dennis Day, Rochester, and yours truly, Don Wilson. The orchestra opens the program with Be Young Again. Not just a little flavor. Be Young Again, played by the orchestra. And now, ladies and gentlemen, let us take you back to last Wednesday night and show you how Jack and the rest of us celebrated New Year's Eve. Our little story opens at Jack's house around 7 p.m., where Jack, assisted by Rochester, is getting dressed for a big night. Rochester. Rochester, where did you put the cufflinks for my dress shirt? The what? The pearl cufflinks. What happened to them? Don't you remember, boys? You said I could wear them to my lodge meeting the other night. All right, now give me my cufflinks. Well, here's what happened, boys. One of them slipped out of my cup and rolled under the pool table. Uh-huh. And when I got down on my knees to pick it up, somebody faded me. <laughs> well, I'll be... So you lost one of my links in a crap game. What happened to the other one? That lasted for about three passes, then bingo. Well, that's a fine fix you put me in. What do you expect me to do, keep my hands in my pockets all evening? Why don't you stick one of them in your vest like Napoleon? Napoleon? He was Emperor Frank. I know what he was. <laughs> you don't have to tell me about Napoleon. My cousin Boo Boo's worn his hat sideways since he was 12 years old. <laughs> Oh, well, I'll just have to roll these cuffs up a little and hope they stay there. Pardon me, Mr. Benny, but what conveyance are you planning on to take you to the Biltmore Bowl? You're driving us there in the Maxwell, of course. Then afterwards, the evening is yours. Are you going to celebrate tonight, Rochester? Yes, sir. I'm going to a ball at the Central Avenue. You walk in, if you're not carried out, you get your money back club. (laughs) Oh. Well, you better walk in and out. Now, remember, Rochester, you promise not to drink tonight. Yes, sir. I'll just order martinis and eat the olives out of them. That's right. You can eat all the olives you want. I got a bad tooth, though. I might have to float them down. (laughs) What was that? Now, Rochester... I'm warning you for the last time, when you come to work tomorrow, if you're not... Oh, hello, Mary. Hello, Jack. Aren't you dressed yet? I'm just finishing up. Well, hurry. Dennis is waiting outside for us in a cab. A cab? Mary, I told you Rochester's going to drive us down to the Biltmore and the Maxwell. I am not riding in that smudge pot with this new evening gown. You're going to take the Maxwell. You're not the only one that's dolled up, sister. I've got my tuxedo on. You can burn that under an orange tree, too. (laughs) All right, all right. We'll take a cab. Then come on. Let's go. I can't leave until little Carolyn Lee gets here. I promise to let her see me all dressed up. That kid is sure crazy about you, boss. Well, I have a way with the ladies, I guess. Whether they're six or sixty. But in between, you can't get one unless they're hungry. (laughs) Listen, Mary, I'm a ladies' man at any age. Then why did you phone at the last minute and make me break a date to go out with you tonight? Because Stella Buggenhaven happens to be working. (laughs) And I sent her an orchid this afternoon before I found out, like a darn fool. How do you know she's working? Because she canceled her date with me. She got to do retake on her new picture, The Sweetheart of Gopher Gulch. (laughs) Well, she looks like a gopher if I ever saw one. (laughs) 
Mary, if you ever looked a gopher right in the face, you'd see that they have beautiful, soft brown eyes. And so has Stella. Anyway, I'm hooked for an orchid. Oh, well. Come on, Jack. That's Dennis waiting for us in the cab. Well, run along. I'll join you in a minute. Here, take my violin with you. Oh, Jack, you always have to drag that fiddle every place you go. Mary, Phil's orchestra's playing there, and Phil may call on me to entertain. If he wants to remain on my program. <laughs> now, take it with you. Okay. Happy New Year, Rochester. Same to you, Miss Livingston. Well, Rochester, I guess you can run along, too. Have a good time tonight. Thanks, Mr. Benny. And look, Rochester, I know it's New Year's Eve, so I'm not going to be a wet blanket. I'll tell you what. It's okay with me if you take one drink at the stroke of midnight. There's 12 strokes, boss. Let's hit them all. <laughs> well, I'm not going to argue about it. You can go now, Rochester, but remember, I'm putting you on your honor. That'll take care of everything. Happy New Year. <laughs> Happy New Year, Rochester. Oh, by the way, have you seen... Oh, well, I'll find it. Must be around here somewhere. Not there. I had it yesterday. I can't imagine what happened to it. I wonder if it's in the... Oh, hello, Carolyn. Hello, Jack. Well, I'm wearing my tuxedo. How do I look? Gee, I think you're the prettiest man in the whole world. Now, wait a minute, Carolyn. You're taking in a lot of territory. <laughs> <laughs> prettiest man. By the way, honey, um, this afternoon when we were playing those games, did you, did you hide something you didn't tell me about? What do you mean, Jack? Well, I've been looking all over for a certain something, and I can't find it. Did you hide it somewhere? Huh? What do you think? <laughs> I think... I think you did. Now, tell Uncle Jack where you put it. No, you'll have to look for it. Carolyn, I'm in a hurry. Now, tell me, where is it? No, you'll have to guess. Carolyn, I'm in no mood for guessing. Look, kid, I'm going out tonight. I've got to have my toupee. <laughs> Now, now, Carolyn, please, please tell me, where did you put it? Well, I was out in the yard, and a poor little bird didn't have any nest. <laughs> oh, fine. Well, I'll just fluff my hair up a little. That'll have to do, I guess. I, I have to leave now, Carolyn, so, uh, so kiss me goodnight, and I'll see you tomorrow. I thought I was going with you. Carolyn, I didn't say tonight. I said, when you're 18 years old, I'll go out with you on New Year's Eve. But when I'm 18, you'll be 35 or 40. I'll take that. <laughs> now, um, good night, honey. Run along home and tell your mother I said Happy New Year. I want to stay here and have some bread and jam. You can have bread and jam tomorrow. Now, good night, Carolyn. Good night, Jack. Happy New Year. Happy New Year, sweetheart. <laughs> hmm. Four jars of jam already this week. <laughs> Not only that, my toupee is up in a tree somewhere. <laughs> oh, well. I'm coming, I'm coming. Ooh. Ooh, my shin. Darn, these dress shoes are too slippery. Got to wear them more often. Oh, hello, Mr. Billingsley. Good evening, Mr. Benny. A little cockeyed, I see. <laughs> No, no, I, 
I just tripped and fell down the steps. Say, uh, you're home rather early, Mr. Billingsley. Aren't you going to wring out the old and ring in the new? Not tonight. I always do my laundry on Monday. <laughs> oh. Oh, I see. Well, good night, Mr. Benny. Good night. A gentleman wouldn't say that. <laughs> I never saw one that didn't. <laughs> what does that mean? I can't figure him out at all. Hurry up, Jack. We can't wait here all night. I'm coming. I'm coming. Click, 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 click. Listen to that meter. 335 already. Wow. Say, Dennis, how come you haven't got a date? I thought you were going to bring a... Whoop, 340. <laughs> I, I thought, Dennis, I thought you were going to bring a girl tonight. What happened? She had to work. Oh. Oh, is she a chorus girl? No, she's a welder at Lockheed. <laughs> Well, I can, I can sympathize with you, Dennis. I had a date with Stella Bug Buggenhaven tonight, but she had to do retakes on the sweetheart of, hmm, 350. I know that thing is going too fast. Go for golf. It's too bad I sent her that orchid. Well, here we are at the Biltmore Bowl. Oh, look at that sign. Bill Harris and his orchestra, but come in anyway. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, how much is that, buddy? Exactly what it says, three fifty. Oh. Let me pay it, Mr. Benny. No, no, Dennis, this is on me. But I insist. Ah, <laughs> nothing doing, kid. This is my treat. Okay. Hmm. <laughs> here, uh, here you are, buddy. Thanks. Come on, Mary. Oh, boy, I bet we're going to have fun tonight. Oh, boy, oh, boy, if you can't talk sense, shut up. <laughs> Come on, let's go in. There's Phil's band. I hope he reserved a good table for us. Where do you think you're going, Dennis? I'm going with you. Oh, you are, eh? Oh, Jack, for heaven's sake, what's the matter with you? I can't stand a cheapskate. That's... <laughs> Table, didn't he? Yeah, right near the orchestra. Yippee! Dennis, have fun, but don't kick my violin. It's right there by your foot. Yeah, I wish I had a paper hat like everybody else. What do you want with a paper hat? You're supposed to wear one on New Year's Eve. I'll straighten this out. Where's the waiter? Uh, pardon me, are you the waiter? What do I look like with this napkin over my arm? A roller towel? <laughs> now, now, 
Now, just watch your step, bud. I happen to be a very good friend of Phil Harrison. You can have him, too. <laughs> now, look, waiter, you get me a paper hat, or I'll tell this young man with me not to leave a tip after he pays the check. Graham. The thing I hate is a fresh waiter. Well, 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 look who's here. Cash customers. Hiya, Jackson. Hello, Phil. You sure got a big crowd here tonight. Why not? Good music, good food, and just oodles of Harris. <laughs> hey, what more can anyone well ask? Huh? Say, Phil, I see you've got a bigger orchestra tonight. Isn't that a new man in the front row? Where? A big guy with a mustache. He ain't no musician. That's a house detective. Well, what's a house detective doing in your orchestra? He claims the bass fiddle is full of spoons. <laughs> Are you kidding? Why, that's ridiculous. Yeah, but if you ever looked in that tuba, we're cooked. Hmm. Well, see you later, kids. I'm going over to say hello to Don Wilson. He and Peggy are in a big party over here. Oh, well, time to drop over, huh? Hey, waiter. Waiter, what about that paper hat? Here you are, a gorgeous green one. How can I wear a green hat with my blue eyes? The color's class. Oh, what are you worried about? You'll be asleep in a few minutes anyway. <laughs> I'm going to stay up tonight. I took a Benzedrine. <laughs> Get me another hat, waiter. And here's something else. There's no confetti at this table. When it's midnight and the celebration starts, what am I going to throw? Chase that tuxedo and let the moths fly out. <laughs> now, listen, you one more wisecrack, and I'll speak to Baron Long, the owner of this hotel. He's a pal of mine. If you don't mind, we'd like to order drinks. What do you want, Mary? I'll just have a lemonade. Okay. I'll have a glass Good of... evening, Mr. Burney. Are you having a good time tonight? Hmm. Yes, yes, thank you. That's good. I'll have a... Who was that, Mary? Your pal, Baron Long. <laughs> oh, oh. Waiter, I'll have a glass of Muscatel. Uh, how about you, Dennis? Make fine a zombie. A zombie? You'll have a lemonade the same as Mary. Okay, but I'm going to hiccup... <laughs> All right, Hick, do anything you want. Waiter, that'll be two lemonades and a glass of muscatel for me. Yes, sir. I'll bet you're a beast when you have a couple of drinks in you. <laughs> Quite the contrary, I'm very jovial. And don't forget that confetti. Come on, kid, let's blow our horns and have fun. Have a big New Year's Eve. Hey, Jack. Huh? Jack, look who just came in. Where, where? Coming down the steps. It's Rodney Dangerfield, that corny cowboy. Oh, yeah. And look who's with him. Who? Well, I'll be Stella Buggenhaver. <laughs> so she was working tonight, eh? Imagine ditching me for that. Thing. Hello, Rodney. Howdy, ma'am. A mighty happy new year to you. <laughs> Same to you, partner. Hmm. And Jack, how be you? I be fine. <laughs> Now, uh, who's the young lady with you, Rod? Hello, Jack. Well, it can't be Stella Buckenhaven. She's working tonight. And where did you get that lovely orchid as if I didn't know? <laughs> hmm? Miss Buckenhaven? Why, Jack, I do believe you're jealous. Come on, Rodney, let's go to our own table. Oh, no, no, no. Do join my little party. I bought that orchid. I'm going to smell it. <laughs> One smell. Sit down. A waiter. Yes, sir. What do you have, Stella? A champagne cocktail, please. A champagne cocktail for Miss Buggenhaven. Do you want to go that high, Daddy? <laughs> Just bring it. And what do you have, Mr. Dangerfield? I'll have a great big tall glass of carrot juice. Carrot juice, isn't that a little too strong for your rod? <laughs> to see? Oh, Jack, you say the funniest thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've always got an answer, ain't it, Phil? Hey, kids, they're still back in the bandstand. Looks like the show's going to start. Oh, I hope he doesn't ask me to stand up and take a bow. Get the fiddle out of the cage, Dennis. Okay. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's about time for our second show. And I see we have a lot of sobralities sitting in our audience. <laughs> Sobralities. <laughs> and I'd like to ask a few of them to stand up and take a bow. Now, first, I want you to meet one of the greatest movie stars. Oh, I wish he wouldn't do that. <laughs> that famous cowboy of Western pictures, 
Rodney Dangerfield. Thank you, folks. Thank you. I'm sure sorry I didn't bring my guitar. Had to bring his gun along. What a ham. (laughs) And sitting right next to him is his lovely leading lady, that charming girl of the Golden West, Miss Stella Buggenhaven. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I love you all. (laughs) A very pretty speech, Stella. Brief, but it had a message. (laughs) You make me sick. Behave. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce a very dear friend of mine. A great radio star who needs no introduction. Uh, Dennis, give me the fiddle. I have been associated with this grand personality for a number of years. (laughs) And he came here tonight to relax and enjoy himself, just like everybody else. (laughs) There. But I know if we insist, we can get Dennis Day to come up and sing a chorus for us. What? Come on up here, kid. Well, I'm glad it wasn't me. I came here to relax and enjoy myself, like he said. Well, sit down. You look like a sap with that violin under your chin. Oh, oh, yes. How are you, Dennis? What's it going to be, kid? I'm going to sing a song I did on the Jell-O program a few weeks ago, Rose O'Day. Well, hit it, Pappy. Hand me his lemonade, Mary. I'm going to put pepper in it. <laughs> He loves best that he do. Rose all day, rose all day. You're my silly gadoosha, shinna marusha, balla rala, boom, tootie, rose all day, rose all day. You're my silly gadoosha, shinna marusha, balla rala, boom, tootie. You're daring, you're darling, oh, you're lovely. Sure that. What I mean when I say Rose O'Day Oh, Rose O'Day You're my sligadoochie shinamarooch of allarala boom booty boom booty boom booty Sweet Rose O'Day Thank you, Dennis. That was swell, kid, and I appreciate your getting up here. Hey, Phil! Don't be so obvious. If you can't see your violin, the heck with them. Yeah, that's right, the heck with them. And now, folks, sitting at a table on the other side of the room is my old pal and one of the greatest announcers in radio, Don Wilson. (laughs) Come on, come on, Don. Say something, will you? Okay, Phil. Hello again. This is Don Wilson speaking. Hello again. He stole that from me. And I hope you're all having as much fun as I am tonight. I've had six delicious dishes of jello and am I raring to go. Yippee! <laughs> I've been saying jello again for years. It's mine. In a few minutes now, it'll be 12 o'clock, and I want to wish you all a very happy and prosperous new year. Nice going, Don. Hi, Mary. Happy New Year. Same to you. 
Uh, Mary, pass me that glass of water, will you? What are you taking there? Another Benzedrine. I'm getting sleepy. <laughs> Thanks. And now, ladies and gentlemen... Hey, Phil, Phil! Oh, oh, yes, yes. And now, folks, here comes the biggest surprise of the evening. I'm sure that with a little encouragement and applause, we can get Jack Benny to come up here... And play a violin solo. Here I come. Well, I... <laughs> I'm a little embarrassed here. Thanks, uh... Thanks for asking me to come up here, Phil, although I'm really not prepared. However, ladies and gentlemen, I've had many requests... Sit down, you punk! Sit down! <laughs> one drunk, one drunk in the audience, he had to wait for me. <laughs> oh, well. Uh, ladies and gentlemen... I've had many, many requests to play Love and Bloom. And being in a sentimental mood this evening, I'm only too happy to oblige. Love and Bloom, folks. I hope you like it. It's 1942, folks. Happy New Year! One can of fruit salad cut into small pieces. Chill until firm, and then serve with a garnishing of spicy mint leaves and bright red cherries. You'll say, as does Jack, that this is one of the finest desserts you ever tasted. Many grocers are featuring canned fruit salad and strawberry jello all next week. Get both tomorrow and make up this grand treat. Just be sure when you buy to get jello, because jello's locked in process. Brings you the flavor for your enjoyment. This is the last number of the 14th program in the current Jello series. And we will be with you again next Sunday night at the same time. And, folks, that's exactly what happened when we went out and celebrated on New Year's Eve. Tell them what happened in the cab on the way home. All right, so I fell asleep. How many Benson Reeds do you think I carry with me? Good night, folks. <laughs>
You are listening to Chesterton Radio at ChestertonRadio.com. Mutual presents The Mysterious Traveler. This is The Mysterious Traveler, inviting you to join me on another journey into the realm of the strange and the terrifying. I hope you will enjoy the trip, that it will thrill you a little and uh, chill you a little. So settle back and get a good grip on your nerves, if you can. Where are we going? Well, let us say for the moment, we're taking a little trip into time. And a story I call... New Year's Nightmare. As the old year entered its last minute, the crowds at the Club Tropicana were waiting expectantly for the clock to strike midnight. At a ringside table, a lovely young woman angrily whispers to the man with her. Chris, if you take another drink, I'll leave. Oh, Judy, this is New Year's Eve. It'll be 1947 in another minute. Got to celebrate, don't I? Just one more. Just one more, just one more. That's what you always say. I wouldn't mind if it were just tonight, but you're always getting drunk. Waiter, another bottle of champagne. Nothing I say means anything to you, does it? Do you think because I've forgiven you a dozen times in the past, I'll do it again? But you're wrong, Chris. Happy New Year, darling. 1947 is going to be our year. No, Chris, it isn't. I won't marry a man who gets drunk in New York and wakes up the next day in another city. Oh, Judy, what are you saying? You don't mean that. You know I love you. Yes, Chris, you love me. But not enough to give up drinking. I'll miss you, Chris. I miss you terribly. But I know I'm doing the right thing. Judy, don't talk like that. I couldn't live without you. You know that. Won't you? I'm sorry, Chris. Here's your ring. Will you please take me home? You don't have to leave. If the sight of my drinking is too much for you, I'll go someplace else and do it. Martin will take you home. Happy New Year and goodbye. <laughs> I'm finishing that drink, mister. It's five o'clock in the morning and I'm dead on my feet. Sure. Sure, I'll drink up. No matter what she says. That's right. Now, you better go home and sleep it off. Good night and a happy 1947 to you. Thanks. And the same to you. Don't. Got to find another bar. New Year's. Got to celebrate. Hmm. Another bar across the street. Oh, got to celebrate. Hey, mister, look out for that car. You going to get run down if you don't? Look out! My head. Oh, it feels so funny. What's that noise? Those horns. Well, darling, it's midnight. New Year's. Oh, my head. It's throbbing so. Where am I? How did I get here? Why, darling, you live here. Live here? What are you talking about? Charles, I'd better call Dr. Smith. You look so strange. Hello? Connect me with Dr. Smith's apartment, please. I've never seen this place before. Hello, Doctor? This is Blanche Arnold. Yes, it's Charles. He isn't well. Could you come to our apartment at once? Oh, thank you. Goodbye. What do you mean, I live here? Who are you? 
Where am I? On your wife, Charles. This is our home, don't you remember? You're my wife. You can't be. I'm not married. What am I doing here? What's your game? Charles, can't you remember anything about us? What are you talking about? I never saw you before. And why do you keep calling me Charles? My name is Chris. Chris Andrews. Chris Andrews. So that's what the initial C.A. stood for. Oh, that noise out there. What are they making such a racket for? Because it's midnight, New Year's Eve. Midnight? New Year's Eve? But it was midnight hours ago when I left the club Tropicana. What are you talking about? Oh, that must be Dr. Smith. I'll answer it. Dr. Smith? I don't know any Dr. Smith. Oh, come in, Doctor. I'm so glad you're here. I think it's the amnesia. It seems to have left him all of a sudden. Charles? This Dr. Smith? I don't know him, and I don't know you. And please stop calling me Charles. I told you my name is Chris Andrews. Mm-hmm. Uh, won't you sit down, Mr. Andrews? I'd like to talk with you for a few minutes. What about? Uh, tell me, Mr. Andrews. What's the last thing you remember before finding yourself in this apartment? Why, Judy. She and I were at the Club Tropicana, celebrating New Year's Eve. I see. I remember we quarreled about my drinking. I walked out on her and had a few drinks someplace else. Uh -huh. That's all I can recall. Oh, my head. I've had hangovers, but I've never felt like this before. What time is it? Uh, it's just four minutes after twelve. But it can't be four minutes after 12 New Year's Eve. That was hours ago when I left the Tropicana. Mr. Andrews, that was New Year's Eve, 1947. What do you mean, that was New Year's Eve, 1947? Uh, this is New Year's Eve, 1948. 1948? What are you talking about? It's 1947. Well, here's the morning paper. You can see the date for yourself. Thursday, January 1st, 1948. No, it can't be. It can't be. The year gone? Just like that? Well, where did it go? I haven't lived it yet. Perhaps you'd better let me clear up a few things for you. 1948? Uh, my name is Smith. I was a resident physician until recently at the Park Hospital. Uh, while I was on duty uh, last New Year's Day... 1947, you were brought into the hospital seriously injured, having been run over by a car. When you recovered consciousness five days later, you didn't know who you were. You were a victim of amnesia. Amnesia? Yes, and we didn't know who you were as you had no identification papers. But my wallet of uh, letters... They were gone. The only clue to your identity was a belt buckle with the initials uh, C.A. on it. We didn't know your real name, so I called you Charles for the C. Uh, Blanche was your nurse. I've always liked the name Charles. And as for your last name, we thought Arnold was as good as any, so you became Charles Arnold. But what have I been doing since the day I recovered consciousness? Well, you weren't discharged from the hospital until May. Uh, then you went to work as an insurance clerk. As an insurance clerk? But I don't know anything about being a clerk. I'm a reporter. Well, there was no way of learning what your occupation had been. Uh, so when Blanche learned of this opening in an insurance office, you applied for the position. And that's where I've been working? Up to now? Yes. And then after you got your job, we were married. Married? Charles. I mean, Chris. Don't you remember? I'm afraid, Blanche, you really can't. Married. But Judy... Oh, it's like a dream. My head keeps throbbing. I keep expecting to wake up. There's a date in the paper. January 1st, 1948. Doctor, you said he might never get over his amnesia. Well, that was a strong possibility, but apparently the sounds of New Year's brought back his memory. You're going just like that. Judy, my friends, job, all gone. Doctor, where am I? I mean, what's the address of this apartment house? You're at 5718 North 13th Street, Philadelphia. Philadelphia? 
But how did I get to Philadelphia? Uh, that we don't know. All that I can tell you is that your accident occurred just a few blocks from here. Darling, I know what a shock it must be. Strange. You must have called me darling many times in the past. And yet this is the first time I've, I've ever heard you call me that. Yes. I know. What did you say your name was? Hello, Doctor. Come in, won't you? Thank you. How are you, Blanche? Mm, all right, I suppose. How's Chris getting along? He's fine. It's just... Why, Blanche, what's this? I've never seen you cry. Here, here. No, it's just that everything's so changed. Those six months Chris and I were married before he regained his memory were the happiest of my life. And now? This past month since he got his memory back, it's... It's been as though I were married to a stranger. It isn't as though he doesn't try to be nice to me. But it's all so obvious. He doesn't love me. Now, Blanche, you mustn't say that. It's true, I tell you. How can a man love a woman those first six months as he loved me and then fall out of love with her when he's regained his memory? Well, you must have patience, Blanche. It will take time for Chris to adjust himself to what's happened. He fell in love with you as Charles Arnold, and I'm sure he will as Chris Andrews. You just must give him time. Chris! Chris Andrews! Chris, it is you! Judy! <laughs> oh, Judy! Oh, just let me look at you. Can't be true. You're being here. Oh, well, it is. Ah, uh, it's been a long time. Yes. A year and a month since New Year's Eve, 1947. Chris, what are you doing here in Philadelphia? I live here. Well, so do I. I, I got a job with Ryan and Company as a copywriter here a few months ago. Look, Judy, we can't talk here on the sidewalk. <laughs> that's right. Uh, well, look, I, I live only a few blocks from here. We can go to my apartment. Oh, that's fine. There's so much I want to ask, and... There's so much to tell. Here, let me have your hat and coat. Thank you. Would you like something to drink? No, I uh, don't drink anymore. Oh? Chris, you have changed. You look so much older. Well, you don't. You're as lovely as that night I saw you last. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Judy... You'll have to let me explain what happened after I left you that night at the Tropicana. If you find it difficult to believe, I won't blame you. It still seems like a nightmare to me. That night, after I left you... And so now you know everything. From the moment I last saw you to this one. No wonder you look different after having gone through an experience like that. Well, you're all right now. You you know who you are. You're happily married. You have a job. I'm not happily married, Judy. Chris, you mustn't talk like that. Surely you must have loved your wife if you married her, and she hasn't changed. Judy, there's never been anyone for me but you. You know that. And you still feel that way about me. No, I don't. When we met tonight, that old look was still in your eyes. You do care. You know you do. Please, Chris, no matter how I feel about you, it's over now. You're married, and that's all there is to it. I, I, I wish you'd go, and I don't want to see you again. Chris, where have you been? I expected you home from work hours ago. I met a friend. Oh. oh, you look so tired. Do you feel well? Blanche, this past month I tried my best to be a good husband, haven't I? Well, you have been, darling. No, there's something missing, and you know it. Oh, it isn't your fault. It's mine. And as a result, we're both unhappy. You mustn't say that, Chris. I feel that in time, things will be as they were when we were first married. 
When you were Charles Arnold. Oh, but they won't be, Blanche. It's no use, I tell you. Chris, who is the friend you met tonight? The girl I was once engaged to. I see. Blanche, you've got to give me a divorce. No, Chris. I'll never do that. But why? You know I don't love you. What's the sense of going on like this? Chris, when you were Charles Arnold, you did love me, and we were happy together. I had your love once, and I mean to win it back. I won't give you a divorce. Hello, Judy. Chris. Chris, I... I asked you not to call on me again. Judy, I've got to talk to you. May I come in? Well, all right. But just for a few minutes. Thank you. Judy, even if we hadn't met again a week ago, things wouldn't have been any different between my wife and myself. I'll never love her. And I'm not going on with her. What do you mean, Chris? I'm going to leave her, Judy, and start all over someplace far away. I just came around to say goodbye. Are you set on leaving her? Yes. Nothing can change my mind about that. Now, you, you've got to understand my position, Chris. I could never be happy with you if I thought I'd been the one who came between you and your wife. But if you are going to leave her, I would like to see you again when you're free. Would you, Judy? Yes. But I don't want to see you until she's given you a divorce. Uh... Divorce? Judy, I am going to be free. Nothing's going to prevent it. Nothing. Blanche, uh, how would you like to go out tonight? Go out? Yeah, we might take in a show or... Go dancing? <laughs> Didn't I ever take you out when I was Charles Arnold? Oh, why, yes. We used to have wonderful evenings together then. Well, why not now? Unless you don't want to. Oh, Chris, there's nothing in the world I'd rather do. Hey, why the tears? Oh, it's just that I'm so happy. Oh, come here. Oh, <laughs> uh, did this Mr. Arnold ever put his <laughs> arms around you? Like this? Oh, yes, often. <laughs> oh, Chris, stop squeezing me so tight. Chris! Sorry, darling. Oh. Oh. You almost, you almost squeezed me to death. That's so you remember that I'm your husband and uh, not Mr. Arnold. And uh, Blanche. Oh, yes, Chris. I'm taking a week's vacation soon. Um... Uh... What do you say if we go up to the Adirondack Mountains for a week of winter sports? Oh, Chris, I'd love to. Well, it'll be like a second honeymoon. Blanche, you all right? There's only a few more feet to the top. I'm coming, darling. from here, isn't it? You're right. Being up here is like being alone in the world. Yes, just the two of us. Oh, this past week's been a wonderful one, Chris. I've never been so happy. Nor have I. Oh, be careful, Chris. Don't go so near the edge. That canyon's 4,000 feet deep. Oh, this ledge is perfectly safe. Come over here and take a look at the valley below. All right. Oh, please keep your arms around me, Chris. Looking down like this frightens me. There. You're safe in my uh, arms. Chris, why are you looking at me that way? What way, dear? I don't know. Is your head throbbing again? No, dear. Uh, I don't suppose you've changed your mind about giving me a divorce, have you? Giving you a divorce? But I thought we were so happy together. Yes, that's the impression I meant people to get. Chris, you can't be serious. Well, everything's been wonderful these past few weeks. 
Oh, you see, it won't be any use trying to talk you into it. What do you mean? I'm sorry, Blanche. I don't want to do this, but you've given me no alternative. It's really your own fault, uh, that you must die. Let, let, let go of me. Let, 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 no, you're no. struggling, darling. No one can see or hear you. And you can't possibly escape. You can't throw me off that ledge. Just, and I'll hang you. I don't think so, dear. Chris. We've been so happy these let past few weeks. Go. I'm sure the police will see it as an unfortunate no. accident. Stop but... pushing me toward the edge. Chris, don't know. I'll give you a divorce. I'll give you anything. I'm no, afraid no, it's please, too late no, for no, that. No, no. Good evening, Judy. Uh, may I come in? Why, yes, of course. How are you, Chris? Oh, I'm all right. I uh, want to thank you for the note you sent me uh, when Blanche died. I can't tell you how sorry I was to hear about it, Chris. Yes, it, it all happened so quickly. Mm. What have you been doing since then? Oh, just working. Trying to straighten myself out. Yes. Judy, perhaps I shouldn't talk about it now, seeing that Blanche has only been gone a month, but I've been thinking of leaving town. Will you come with me? Please sit down, Chris. You make me nervous walking back and forth like this. All right. But you haven't answered my question. Well, it isn't easy to answer. Oh, it would be if you said yes. Uh, I see in your eyes you mean No. Why? Chris, I've met someone else recently. Someone else? But you said if I were free, you'd marry me. I didn't say I'd marry you. I said if you were free, I'd like to see you again. But now I'm not even sure of that. You're so different from what you used to be. Stop being clever. If you didn't say you'd marry me, you, you implied as much. Please, Chris, you're, you're, you're making it so difficult for me. I'm making it difficult for you. And I suppose what I've been through doesn't count. I risked my life to get you. Risked your life? Chris, what are you saying? Are you such a fool as to believe that Blanche fell off that mountain? Chris, you didn't. Yes. And I didn't because you said you'd marry me if I were free. Oh, no. I meant a divorce. But she wouldn't give me a divorce. It was the only way I could gain my freedom. And now you tell me there's someone else. Oh, Chris. I did it for you. And you're going to marry me. No, I won't. If I can't have you, no one else will. Chris, what's the matter with you? Chris! We were meant for each other, darling. In life and in death. Chris, if you come any closer, I'll scream for help. No, don't! Chris, no! You won't marry me. You'll never marry no. anyone else. There. He'll never have you. Open up the door. I didn't want to do it, darling. But you forced me to. <gasps> oh, my head. It throbs so. Everything's like a nightmare. Open up in there. This is the police. The police? I've got to get away. <laughs> oh, they're closing in on me. There's no escape from this roof. Let's work our way down from this end of the roof to the other. They'll never take me alive. Never. I've got five bullets. Four for them and the last for myself. Maybe you should not go. <laughs> Maybe you had me had one of those chimneys. Oh, my head. It keeps throbbing so. If I could only think. All this can't be real. It's like a horrible dream. And they're coming for me. Wait. There's someone behind that chimney over there. Get them to cover. They'll never take me alive. Never. I'll show them. Keep down, Mike. Why don't you come and get me? If I can shoot it out with me, huh? I'll show you. Come on, Mike. It's kind of empty. Oh, empty. You'll never take me alive. Never. He's climbing up on the ledge. It's 15 stories down. I'm coming, Judy. I'm coming. He's going to jump. I'm falling. Falling. You'll never take me. Never. I'm falling, falling. 
doctor. The patient's recovering consciously. Yes, you're right. He's opening his eyes. Oh, man. It drops. Oh. Where am I? Oh, it was a dream. Not for you. Oh, thank heaven. Now, you must be quiet. You've been in a serious accident. Accident? Yes. You were hit by an automobile New Year's morning. Uh, would you mind telling me your name? There weren't any identification papers in your clothing, and we'd like to inform your relatives of what's happened. My name? It's... It's... I can't remember my name. I see. Well, what about your address? Can you remember that? No. No, I can't remember anything. Now, you mustn't get excited. It'll all come back to you. You received a fractured skull from the accident. There was a mountain. Mountain? You, you mean you live near one? I... I don't know. There was a mountain. And the police were chasing me. And I... Jumped off a high building. It... It's all mixed up. You probably dreamed that uh, while you were unconscious. But you're all right now. Just need rest and quiet. Where am I? You're in the Park Hospital, Philadelphia. Philadelphia? What day is it? It's January 5th, 1947. It's 7.26 in the evening. And you don't know my name? No. All we have is your belt buckle with the initials uh, C.A. C.A.? Nurse, will you look after the patient now? I'll be in to see him later tonight. Yes, doctor. Are you comfortable? The initials C.A.? What do you suppose they stand for? Perhaps the C is for Charles. Charles? Charles. I don't know. Well, suppose I call you Charles, just for the time being. I always liked the name Charles. All right. What's your name? I'm Miss Thompson, but you can call me Blanche. And Charles, let me be the first to wish you a happy 1947. traveler again. Have you enjoyed our little trip? Oh, by the way, I want to wish you all a very happy new year. And I do hope you'll be careful about making new acquaintances. And perhaps you'd better keep an eye on the old ones, too. For after all, who can foretell the future? Not even Chris Andrews, or should I say Charles Arnold, knows what's in store for him. But we do, don't we? And uh, speaking of the future, I... Oh, you're getting off here. I'm sorry. But I'm sure we'll meet again. I take this same train every week at this same time. You've just heard The Mysterious Traveler. A series of dramas of the strange and terrifying. In tonight's cast were Maurice Toplin, Stuart Brody, Louise Fitch, Hester Sondergaard, and Mort Lawrence. Original music was played by Doc Whipple. The Mysterious Traveler is written and directed by Bob Arthur and David Cogan. Listen next week over most of these stations to a tale titled... No Grave Can Hold Me. Another tale of The Mysterious Traveler. The Mysterious Traveler has been presented from our New York studios. Carl Caruso speaking. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. This is Chesterton Radio, your home for podcasts of works by G.K. Chesterton, plus drama, comedy, mystery, science fiction, big bands, and much more. The soundtrack to your Chesterton Day at ChestertonRadio.com. There are people in most countries who would like to live in the Republic of the United States or the Dominion of Canada where that good Olga Cole is sold. 
The citizens of our free countries are the envy of many people elsewhere because of the personal freedom which we have enjoyed. Why, then, doesn't every country adopt a form of free government? One answer is that, unfortunately, there are people and parties in many nations who are so greedy for power that they will sacrifice the freedom of their fellow countrymen to obtain power for themselves. History, even recent history, is replete with such instances. That is why the citizens of the Republic of the United States and the Dominion of Canada must be careful to recognize at its very beginning any movement to steal or limit their freedom. That is not always easy. The man who would enslave a free people doesn't begin by saying, now I'm going to be your dictator. Instead, he probably will claim that he is a devoted supporter of personal freedom, but all the while he will support policies that weaken and undermine personal freedom. Such a man will deny any totalitarian aims, but free citizens must not be deceived by such denials. Apparently, it is a cardinal principle of every sincere totalitarian that he is justified in lying, if such lies will advance his plans. In these times, no public figure and no party or organization supporting such a person can be accepted without careful consideration. Every public figure and organization must be carefully scrutinized, and if their real aims are to limit or to destroy our freedom as individuals, they must be opposed. This is Chesterton Radio, the true, good, and beautiful at ChestertonRadio.com. New York, the makers of Clipper Craft Clothes for Men, and 924 leading retail stores from coast to coast, present the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Our stories are based upon the character of Sherlock Holmes, created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Sherlock Holmes is portrayed by John Stanley, Dr. Watson by Alfred Shirley, and the dramatizations are by Edith Meiser. Well, here we are once again on the threshold of Dr. Watson's study. We find Mr. Holmes' genial biographer strutting up and down in front of his fireplace. Evening, Doctor. You look fit. The Christmas festivities don't seem to have got you down. I am fit, Mr. Harris, very fit. Better than that, I am rather well fitted. Well, great Scott, man, where are your eyes? <laughs> why, Dr. Watson, don't tell me Santa Claus brought you a clipper craft suit. Well, why not? Just because I'm a wee bit uh, venerable doesn't mean I'm antique. I still enjoy making a good impression, don't you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, in that suit, it'll be the girls that go... <laughs> when you walk down the street, Doctor. Oh, yes, it's an... Seriously now, Doctor, suppose you tell us what tonight's story is to be about. Well, tonight I thought I'd relate how Holmes and I spent New Year's Eve off the silly isles. The Silly Isles? That sounds appropriate, Doctor. The name of these particular islands is spelled S-C-I-L-L-Y. They are located roughly a hundred miles southwest of Land's End, Mr. Harris. Oh, what in the world were you doing there on New Year's Eve? Trying to prevent a great maritime catastrophe. You remember what happened to the Titanic? You know what happened to the Lusitania? Well, the lives of those on the ocean liner Gigantic were in even greater danger... When Holmes and I went over the side on New Year's Eve in the year 1912... uh, Oh, but good heavens. (laughs) There I go getting ahead of myself again. Suppose I fix us a Tom and Jerry while you tell our listeners how to start the year right in a clippercraft clothes. Fair enough, Dr. Watson. Millions of men like you will start the new year in a smart new clippercraft suit and overcoat. Yes, today more men than ever before wear clippercraft clothes... For we've sold more Clippercraft clothes than ever before in our entire history. There's a reason, of course. The wise old American public, with its eye for value, has pronounced Clippercraft the most remarkable clothing buys they've ever seen. The reason for these amazing values is the sensational Clippercraft plan. Concentrating the buying power of 924 of the nation's leading stores from coast to coast, it accounts for tremendous savings in manufacturing and distribution costs. That's why truly fine Clippercraft suits are only $40 and $45. Why Clippercraft top coats and overcoats are only $40. And sport jackets only $26.50. Clippercraft values are downright amazing. Compare them with clothes selling for many dollars more. (laughs) 
And now, Dr. Watson, to return to the New Year's Eve you and Sherlock Holmes celebrated on the good ship Gigantic. Mm, yes, uh... Oh, here's your Tom and Jerry, Mr. Harris. Thank you, oh, be Doctor. careful. Don't burn yourself. Yes, it was probably the most hectic New Year's Eve I've ever experienced. Nothing is as terrifying to a seafaring man as the thought of fire aboard ship, the panic, the isolation. Oh, but that's neither here nor there. Yes, let me see. It was the last day of the year, 1912. Its inception was sufficiently placid, I must say. A light snow was falling as Holmes and I seated ourselves on either side of a well-filled breakfast table. The flames of our sea coal fire reflected themselves cheerfully in the generous coffee pot. The whole house was filled with the pleasant aroma of the stuffing Mrs. Hudson was preparing for our New Year's goose. Suddenly there came a frantic jangle at the front door bell. No, definitely no. No what, Holmes? Whoever it is that's pulling our front doorbell out by the roots and whatever his problem is, I'm definitely not interested. Yes, Watson, being the world's greatest consulting detective has its disadvantages. People always manage to get into difficulties at the most inopportune moments. Yes, you should try being a doctor, Holmes. No female since Eve has ever decided to become a mother at a convenient time. Oh, come in, confounded. Mr. Holmes? <clears throat> Mr. Sherlock Holmes? <clears throat> Naturally. Whatever your problem is, I warn you, it'll have to wait till after the holidays. But he can't wait, Mr. Holmes. Close to 2,000 lives are at stake. I pray to heaven you'll be able to reach them before it's too late. Reach whom? Where? And what is this disaster you anticipate with such trepidation? The steamship gigantic, Mr. Holmes. She should be somewhere off the Scilly Isles by midnight. We've been reliably informed that an attempt will be made to set fire to her at that time. If successful, it'll be the greatest disaster in all maritime history. Yes, in that case, I suppose I shall have to forego the little celebration I'd planned for this evening. Have to? Well, really, Holmes, you are a cold-blooded fish. Oh, I'm sorry, I don't believe you've met my colleague, Dr. Watson, Mr... Uh... Uh, Pembroke, Reginald Pembroke. How do you do, sir? I'm chairman of the board of Floyd's, the famous insurance company. Oh, then your desire to prevent this uh, disaster isn't entirely humanitarian. Not entirely, but neither is it altogether mercenary. There's more at stake than the lives of the passengers on board the gigantic. If she goes down, the financial stability of the British Empire goes with her. Interesting, eh, Watson? Continue, Mr. Pembroke. You may not be aware, Mr. Holmes, that during this past year, there have been a terrifying number of marine catastrophes. Uh, Holmes knows everything, Mr. Pembroke. I am quite cognizant of the fact that quite a few of the newest and fastest British liners have been destroyed at sea by fire, storm, and uh, accident. Ah, they weren't accidents, Mr. Holmes, I assure you. Quite. The Egyptian star was destroyed by fire in the Persian Gulf. 800 lives lost. The Lord Nelson disappeared in a typhoon in the Indian Ocean. No survivors. The Southern Cross exploded and sank off the coast of Brazil. 1,200 casualties. The Wellington, the Lady Jane Grey, and the El Dorado all caught fire in different parts of the Pacific. Total deaths, over 2,000. But the greatest disaster was last April, when the Titanic ran into an iceberg with a loss of over 1,500 souls. The public's becoming panicky about traveling on British ships. The ships of other nationalities are taking all our trade. Three banks and nearly ten investment concerns where large marine interests have gone to the wall. Even Floyd's is not too secure. But that is not the most serious aspect of the situation. Really? Good Lord, don't tell me there's worse to come. Much worse, Dr. Watson. Those ships disappeared in many parts of the world. They were sunk by diverse methods. One factor, however, was the same in each disaster. And that was? The cargo carried by each ship was gold, English gold. Oh. If it ever became known how much British bullion lies at the bottom of the seven seas, British credit would be badly crippled. As a matter of fact, the Bank of England has been forced to import a large shipment of gold from Canada. And it's on the gigantic. Good Lord, no wonder you're upset. The whole economic structure of the British Empire is at stake, Mr. Holmes. Nothing must happen to the gigantic. What makes you think anything will? A cable was sent shortly after the gigantic left Queenstown. She makes a stop in Ireland on her eastbound voyage, you know. She sailed shortly before dawn this morning. The gangplanks have been drawn in, the last line have been cast off, and the great propellers have begun to churn. Suddenly the dockmaster noticed someone sliding down the ship's side on a rope. Hi, look up there, sir. 
Some fool's climbed over the side. He's coming down on a rope. Go back, you fool. Go back. He'll be killed. He'll never make the dock. He'll fall in the water and be swept under the ship. No, no. He's pushing the rope away from the ship with his feet. He's swinging out. He's going to jump. He made it. Someone up on the bridge has seen him. He's calling to him. The chap's picked himself up. He's shouting back. Happy New Year to you up there. Happy New Year. Good Lord, I know the mantle. It's Smokey Joe, the firebug. If the gigantic don't catch fire between here and Southampton, I'm a Dutchman. Smokey Joe, seems to me we've heard of him before, eh, Watson? Not merely as an expert arsonist, but a dangerous pyromaniac as well. They caught him, I hope, Mr. Pembroke. No, no, Mr. Holmes. Unfortunately, he was too quick for them. He crawled down a ladder and disappeared among the pilings under the docks. So, the gigantic is headed for Southampton with a nice bit of Joe's handiwork aboard. You think it's a firebomb, eh, Holmes? Not necessarily, Watson. There are many ingenious ways of starting a fire, you know. Whoever hired Joe would prefer to have it happen well out to sea, I imagine. Our thought exactly, Mr. Holmes. We've wireless Captain Brooks to make a search, of course, but on a ship the size of the gigantic, it's like looking for a needle in a haystack. You are our one hope, Mr. Holmes. If only you couldn't get on board in time. And how do you suggest I go about that little assignment? The chairman of the Great Western Railway has placed the royal train at your disposal. All other traffic will be cleared off the tracks. Now, you should reach Land's End shortly after lunch. My yacht, the Albatross, will be waiting for you in the harbour at St. Ives. It's a very speedy little craft, and with any luck, you should sight the gigantic around 11 o'clock tonight. Yes, 11 o'clock. But was it Smokey Joe called out? Happy New Year in hell. It won't be New Year till midnight. If we reach the gigantic by 11, we may just possibly be in time. Six bells. It's 11 o'clock. Confound this fog. We've had to reduce our speed to half. Oh, we'll never catch up to the gigantic now, Holmes. Nonsense. She's had to slow down, too. I only hope we don't miss her entirely in this fog. I don't really care. You don't sound very fit, Watson. What's up? Do you have to use that unfortunate expression? (laughs) And tell me you're feeling squeamish. It's this confounded roll. I can stand a good brisk sea, but this... Bobbing about in a teacup. It's Pity I didn't bring the Mother Sills seasick pills. Oh, Mother Sills, bah. There's only one remedy for this sort of thing. What's that? Staying on shore. Jolly way to spend New Year's Eve, this is. <laughs> Who do you suppose is responsible for these confounded sinkings, anyway? Mr. Pembroke seems to feel it's a foreign plot. The Middle East European shipping industries benefit the most, of course. Holmes, did you hear that? By Jove, yes. Sounds like an ocean liner, right enough. Yes, we're signaling her. Scott, there she is, the gigantic looming out of the fog. Looks like a mountain coming at us. Ahoy there! Do you hear the cross? Yes, Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson coming aboard. Let down a ladder. Here's the ladder, Watson. Think you can manage it? I'd climb up the Eiffel Tower on a clothesline if it would get me off this bouncing coffer shell. Quite an impressive array of instruments you have up here on the bridge, Captain Brooks. Yes, Mr. Holmes. On the gigantic, we have the latest of everything. And none of it's any real use in case of fire. I'd sooner face a typhoon or a shipwreck or a mutiny even, Dodd Ratchet, than a fire on board ship. But surely a ship this size should be fairly fireproof. That's what you might think, Dr. Watson. But there are three factors that make a fire on a luxury liner dangerous. First, there's all the confounded ornamental woodwork that's used in a passenger construction. Second, there's the fact that once a fire gets a firm hold, it's fed by drafts that rush through the ventilating system. And third, there is the element of panic. Nothing makes people behave more like wild beasts quicker than the cry of fire. In case of fire, you have, of course, an alarm system. We have the old-fashioned system of bells and also something rather recent. The Gigantic is one of the first ships to install it. You see that glass case over there, gentlemen? Uh, The one with a lot of tubes entering from below. 
Looks rather like a giant honeycomb, eh, Holmes? Each of those tubes leads to a separate compartment of the ship. The instant a fire breaks out anywhere, smoke is immediately drawn up into the glass case. I've stationed a sailor to watch that case. Believe me, gentlemen, the first wisp of smoke. We shall know it. Yes, undoubtedly very helpful, Captain Brooks, in the case of an ordinary conflagration. But I assure you, a fire set by Smokey Joe is not ordinary. He's a master arsonist. Ten seconds after one of his fires breaks out, you're dealing with a raging inferno. Oh, confounded, they tell me the man deserted the ship at Queenstown. That is this morning. Well, that's more than 18 hours ago. If he'd set fire, it, it seems to me that we'd be in flames by this time. Not necessarily. There are many methods by which a fire can be made to break out long after the pyromaniac has left the scene of his crime. You say you found no time bombs, no inflammable acids. No, Mr. Holmes. Ever since I received word that we were in danger, I've had my men searching high and low. They found nothing, absolutely nothing. It's been a systematic search, I promise you. Yes, but you've drawn a blank. That's what comes of using system instead of brains and initiative. Oh? And how do you propose to locate whatever it is we can't find? By using a little logic. Hmm. I shall credit Smokey Joe with having the intelligence to place his fire-starting device in the place where it'll do the most damage. The man's no amateur, Captain. He knows his business. Then I shall investigate that place and remove his handiwork. Holmes, you're bragging again. Not at all, my dear Watson. I think I may promise I shall have discovered the menace inside of half an hour. I only hope Joe's little device doesn't do its nasty job before then. Half an hour. It's now 11.30 exactly. Do you think you can solve this problem by midnight? Yes, Captain. With any luck, I think I can promise you a placid and uneventful new year. Captain Brooks. Yes, Mr. Brown. What seems to be the trouble? The wireless engineer, sir, wishes to report that something's wrong with his apparatus. Both the sending and receiving equipment have suddenly gone out of commission. I don't like that. What does he think is Pardon the matter? Pardon me, Captain. Can you come here a minute? Excuse me a moment, gentlemen. The wheelsman is calling me. What's the trouble, Jerry? It's the compass, sir. It's spinning like a top. I can't figure out what's got into it. Never seen the like except once in some magnetic storm. Great Scott, this is incredible. Now what? It's the engine room calling, Captain. I'll take it. Hello? Yes, Captain Brooks speaking. The blazes, you say. Well, do the best you can. Seems to be the difficulty, Captain. The dynamos are slowing down. They can't figure out why. Good Lord, sir. That's why the lights are getting dim. The blazes with the lights. Without dynamos, we've no forced draft for the furnaces. We'll never keep up enough steam pressure to drive the ship. In no time at all, we'll be drifting helplessly in the Atlantic, in the middle of the reefs that surround the silly isles. Mm, jolly way to spend New Year's Eve, eh, Holmes? It could be worse, you know. How? The ship could be on fire. That's the real menace, to which these other threats are but the prelude, I fancy. Mm, for the love of heaven, what are we to do? Keep calm and use whatever intelligence the Lord has endowed us with. Captain Brooks, I suggest you and as many officers as you can spare join the holiday celebration that's undoubtedly going on in order to keep discipline in case there's any disturbance. Very good, Mr. Holmes. There's a New Year's dance going on in the large ballroom. It's on sea deck. And meanwhile, if you can spare us someone to guide Watson and myself. Oh, of course. Now, Mr. Brown here is our purser. He knows the ship as well as anyone aboard. I'm sure he does. Very well, Mr. Brown. If you'll lead the way, I think Dr. Watson and I would like to go below. And investigate the engines? No, Mr. Brown, even lower than that. What we're looking for is apt to be rather close to the furnaces, I imagine. <laughs> iron stairs that go round and round to make me dizzy. Maybe it's the heat down here. Yes, we're getting close to the furnace room. If you listen, you can hear the men stoking. Grim way to earn a living, eh, Holmes? Stop a minute. Where does that lead, Mr. Brown? That small corridor with a heavy metal door at the far end. Oh, uh, that's the bullion room, sir, where the gold is kept. Very interesting. Suppose we take a look, eh, Watson? Yes, I've always wanted to see those gold bars you hear so much about. I'm afraid that won't be possible, Dr. Watson. Why not? Well, as you can see, the door is locked and sealed. It was done by the port authorities before we left New York. That door won't be opened until the port authorities unseal it when we reach Southampton. You mean that room in there wasn't opened when the captain ordered the ship searched for incendiary material? No, Mr. Holmes. But it's quite impossible for anyone to place a fire bomb or anything of the sort in there. As you can see, the seals are still intact. Quite. These seals are intact. But are they the ones put on in New York? I doubt it. Let's have a look. Yes, interesting. Very interesting. These are not the original seals. Oh, how can you tell, Holmes? They look intact to me. Exactly, they are intact. But here in the crack of the door sill are bits of broken seals. But these seals are not even chipped. By Jove, yes, of course. 
the original seals were hacked off and then replaced after someone had finished picking the lock and robbing the room inside. I doubt if robbery was the motive, Watson. Well, for what other reason would anyone want to break into a room full of gold bullion? It all depends. What lies directly below that room, Mr. Brown? Well, let me see. Well, nothing of any great importance, Mr. Holmes. Just the coal piles. The coal piles? Good Lord. I think we shall have to break the seals again, Mr. Brown. Here, Watson, help me. But the door is locked, Mr. Holmes. Even after the seals have been removed, we shall have to get the key from the captain. No time for that. Hand me my burglar tools, Watson. All right, very well. But, good heavens, you mean you could actually pick a lock with those things? If Holmes ever turned thief, Mr. Brown, even the Bank of England wouldn't be safe. Yes, that should do the trick. Now, if you'll help me draw the bars, Watson. Yes, with pleasure. Well, there you are, Holmes. Now, let's see. Say, it's black in there, isn't it? Is there a light inside, Mr. Brown? No, Mr. Holmes, I'm afraid not. Then we shall have to prop the door open. The light from the corridor will have to do for our investigations. Come on, Watson. Holmes, that smell. Phew. Strong and acrid. Like sulfur, only with more bite. Seems to be coming from this large tin. Suppose I light a match. Oh, this is village. Stop! Don't be alarmed. I know better than to light a match around a tin which is leaking sulfuric acid. I only wanted to know how much you knew about Smokey Joe's incendiary device, Mr. Ludwig Brown, spelled B-R-A-U-N, if I'm not mistaken. So you recognize me? Yes, that dueling scar over your left eye. It's rather a giveaway, don't you know? So you have found how we are going to set fire to the ship by having the acid drip through a hole in the floor under the coal beneath. The first shovelful of that acid-soaked coal that goes in the furnace, and the hold of a ship will be a blazing inferno. Nothing could put out that fire. Don't you mean that's how you were going to start the fire? My dear Mr. Holmes, you do not think we will let a small obstacle like the famous Sherlock Holmes stand in our way. Now listen to me. Don't raise your fist to me or I'll let you have it. Never argue with a Luger pistol, Watson. Well, that's the first sensible remark you've made, Mr. Holmes. I'm sorry to leave, but the stokers should reach the sulfuric acid impregnated coal in about ten minutes, I believe. So I must be going. This room will be a roaring oven once it starts. You'll be rather badly overdone, gentlemen. Goodbye, then. So sorry I cannot say, I'll feed us in. The door. He's bolted it. Even you can't open it now, Holmes. Shut up, Watson, and help me look for the opening. What opening, for heaven's sake? The opening that leads to the tube that ends in the captain's new fire-detecting machine. It should be somewhere near the ceiling. But, Holmes, I can't see a thing in this black hole of Calcutta. You can feel, can't you? a thing, Holmes. The wall on this side of the room, it's as smooth as an egg. Confound it. If we could see for half a minute, it would... Hello, I've got something. Yes? Yes, a small grating here in the upper corner. This must be it. Now, if we can make a smudge of some sort. Watson, bring me a piece of paper. Paper? Where would I find a piece of paper? Then bring me anything I can burn. A bit of cloth, a piece of... Yes, by Jove, rope. Bring me a piece of the rope that's tied around one of the boxes that contain the bullion. Very well, if I can find a box that... Oof. Now what? I found it. Confound it. The, the knots are tied so tight I Blazes can't... with knots. Cut the rope, Watson. Use your pocket knife. Oh, very well. Uh, 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 there you are, Holmes. It's a short length, I'm afraid. I only want enough for a smudge. Nothing like a bit of hempen rope to... Holmes, for heaven's sake, you're not going to set a match to that thing in here. There'll be an explosion. You have to take the chance, Watson. With any luck, the sulfuric acid fumes won't be too concentrated up here near the ceiling. Well, here goes. One, two. Now, if we can persuade the rope to smolder. Yes, there she goes. Certainly makes plenty of smoke, eh, Holmes? The important thing, it's being drawn up through the grating. How long before they come to investigate, do you suppose? It all depends on the mental acumen of the sailor who's watching that fire-detecting machine. Well, let's hope he's brighter than he looks. It may be my imagination, but it seems to me I can... Feel the metal flooring under my feet beginning to get hot. Most things in 1948 will cost you a great deal more than you've paid in other years. That's why it's sensational news to know that you can get Clippercraft suits in 1948. 
for only $40 and $45. Clippercraft top coats and overcoats for only $40 and sport jackets for only $26.50. And isn't it as good a time as any to decide to get the most for your money? You've every right to expect long wear, correct styling, good taste, comfort, and perfect fit. And you get all these to an astounding degree in Clippercraft clothes. And you get them at incredibly modest prices. It's, of course, American production genius applied to the making of fine clothes that does the trick. It's the unique Clippercraft plan, concentrating the buying power of 924 of the nation's leading independent stores from coast to coast. You get the benefit of this plan at your own locally owned store, the store you can trust. Selling expensive clothes at inexpensive low prices at the nation's finest independent stores is the great big idea behind the Clippercraft plan. That's why men who know insist on Clippercraft clothes. So be sure to visit the Clippercraft store in your city. These leading stores in the metropolitan area are proud to add their names to Clippercraft in your suit, top coat, and overcoat. In Manhattan, Saks 34th, Broadway at 34th, John Wanamaker Men's Stores, Broadway at 8th and 67 Liberty Street. In Brooklyn, Abraham and Strauss. In Newark, New Jersey, Boulevard Men's Shop, Kresge, Newark. And in Jamaica, the B&B Clothes Shop, 16408 Jamaica Avenue. Now let's rejoin Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson, locked in the smoke-filled bouillon room of the gigantic. (laughs) Good Lord. (laughs) How long does it take for them (laughs) to get us out of here? That smoke's suffocating. (laughs) Calm yourself, Watson. It can't be more than three minutes since we lit this smudge. Yes, I can hear someone running down the iron staircase. (laughs) I can't hear a blasted thing. (laughs) How do you... Get us out. We're in here. Open the door. <coughs> oh, what a relief. How in thunder did you two get locked in here? <coughs> What's all the smoke? No time for explanations, Captain. Stop them stoking the furnaces. Flood the coal piles with water. They've been soaked with sulfuric acid. Good Lord. <coughs> Ledger, Gates, stop the firing. Stop the pumps in the engine room. Well, that's that, Holmes. What do you suppose has become of that dastardly purser? We let Captain Brooks take care of him, Watson. Unless I'm very much mistaken, Mr. Brown is going to wish he'd never gone to sea. Well, come along, let's go upstairs and join the festivities. I think we rate a bottle of champagne. Well, to blazes with the champagne, I need a double brandy. Eight bells. Let's see, that would be... Uh... Midnight, Watson. Happy New Year, old fellow. Happy New Year, Holmes, and many of them. But uh, don't you think you could manage to have them not quite so hair-raising? And have you getting fat and lethargic? You know, that would be unhealthy, not to say boring. Oh, so now it's for my sake we indulge in all these horrendous escapades, eh? Fine bit of logic, that is. Elementary, my dear Watson. Elementary. But here's the ballroom. Suppose we join the party. Fine. Dr. Watson, that was an exciting way to spend New Year's Eve. It was a bit too exciting, Mr. Harris, if you ask me. Doctor, did they catch the purser? Oh, they did indeed. Mr. Brown and five of his accomplices were thrown in the brig. That was the end of the disasters in the British Maritime Service. When did Holmes first suspect the purser was the villain of the piece? When he came onto the bridge and threw his overcoat on a chair near to the compass, whereupon the compass went berserk. Who was immediately suspected the coat contained a powerful magnet of some sort. And was he right, Doctor? My dear Mr. Harris, was Sherlock Holmes ever wrong? But come, fill your mug and let us wish our radio friends a prosperous, happy and peaceful New Year. Indeed we do, Doctor. And now, Dr. Watson, would you like to give us a hint about next week's story? Next week, I think I'll tell you how Holmes and I trapped a famous jewel thief right in our own rooms in Baker Street by the use of what was then a fabulous new invention, the gramophone. The 
makers of Clipper Craft Clothes and 924 leading stores from coast to coast have brought you another in the new series of broadcasts featuring the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes is produced and directed by Basil Lochran with special music by Albert Berman. If you don't know your Clipper Craft dealer, write Clipper Craft, 200 Fifth Avenue, New York City. Be sure to listen next week to Sherlock Holmes in The Mazarin Stone. If you'd like to attend the Sherlock Holmes broadcasts in New York, see your local Clipper Craft dealer, and he'll tell you how to obtain your tickets. Wishing you a happy and prosperous new year from all of us at Clipper Craft. This is the world's largest network serving more than 450 radio stations and mutual broadcasters. This is Father Bob Warren of the Franciscan Friars of the Atonement. Thank you for listening to this rebroadcast of the Ave Maria Hour radio show. The Friars' popular Ave Maria Hour was first brought to the radio airwaves in 1939, recorded in New York City and on the mountainside grounds at Graymore, a home in Garrison, New York. These timeless classic stories of the Bible and the lives of the saints came to life each week through dramatic reenactment by professional actors and actresses. You know, friends, Christ once said, do not hide your treasure under a bushel. In saying this, he meant share your gifts, share your talents. The Friars of the Atonement feel the message in these broadcasts remains as powerful and timely as when they were originally aired, and we are so happy be able to share them with you today. To learn more about the missions and ministries of the Friars of the Atonement, I invite you to visit our website, www.atonementfriars.org. In the meantime, sit back and enjoy this rebroadcast of the Ave Maria Hour. Today's story, New Year's in a Taxi. 10.30 p.m., New Year's Eve. The city is bustling, almost bursting with anticipation. People laugh and cheer and shout. Happy New Year. Forget the old, it's over. Hope for the new, it's yet to come. For most, it's a time of frantic joy. For others, it's a different story. The weather report said light snow. For Peter Gauzy, one of the vast legion of taxi drivers in the city of New York, this was just another piece of bad news. Everybody wants a taxi on New Year's Eve. And he'd had more than his share already. Funny time for a man to be saying prayers. Not praying, mind you, but repeating old prayers as one might hum a dear tune. And give us the strength to be happy with this new year, though it brings no more than the last. <laughs> I like that one. But the one that meant the most to me was, God, make us worthy of this new year of yours. They used to mean so much to me in the old days. Why don't they anymore? Taxi! Hey, hey, taxi! Ah, back to reality, Pete boy. Taxi. Back to reality. Taxi! All right, all right, all right. What do you think? I'm deaf or something? Boy, oh, didn't think I'd find a taxi cab tonight. Boy, I'm lucky. Yeah, yeah. Uh, happy New Year, fella. Happy New Year. You, brother. Okay, okay. Well, what's the mystery? Uh, mystery? Yeah, where are you going? Oh, yeah. I almost forgot there for a minute. Mister. 
please. Yeah, yeah, I, I got it here someplace. Uh, I, I wrote it down so I wouldn't forget it. Good for you. Oh, oh, here it is. Uh, 18 Grove Street. Grove Street? That's down in Greenwich Village someplace, ain't it? Sure is. Eh, just my luck. Uh, beg pardon? Uh, nothing, nothing. Oh, oh, that was a close one. Uh, any complaints? What? You don't like the way I'm driving? Oh, yeah, everything's fine. So it's down to the village. Don't you like it there? No cabby likes it there. The streets are mixed up like a bowl of cheap spaghetti. Oh. And besides which, another thing, tonight's New Year's Eve. There's one night a cabby feels like he should have stood in bed as this here. Drunks, party boys. Oh, well, well, only once a year. And besides which, still another thing, the weather report says snow. Oh, just light, powder. Ah, uh, enough to make New York streets into Madison Square Garden and me the head star of the ice folly. <laughs> You're right, you should have stayed home tonight. What? What, are you wise or something? Gee, no, no, I, I only meant... Look, I... you mind your business, I'll attend to mine, Okay. Okay. The fair gets on at Broadway in 92nd and wants to go way the heck down to the village, and he's telling me how to run my life. Look, I didn't mean anything. Hey, what? What, are you colorblind or something? Didn't you see that light? But it changed. He had the right of way. Look, you give me a pain, you know that? 92nd to the village, boy! <laughs> I've never been to Greenwich Village. So? You expect me to feel sorry for you? There's lots of places I ain't been. Paris, China. Oh, yeah. No, you see, I'm from out of town. Ha, <laughs> no kidding. Yeah, just visiting a friend for the holidays. And he has this girlfriend who has this friend who lives down in Greenwich Village. I just called her up, made a date. Big deal. Her name's Patty. Patty Parker. You ever heard of her? Oh, sure, sure. I know everybody in this place. No, no. I, I just thought you might have heard of her. I, I mean, she's an actress. An actress? Yeah. Well, well, well. Maybe we ought to go over to the New York Times and tell them to stop the press. I, I just thought you might have heard of her. She was once on television in a small part. And she understudied somebody, big star, in a Broadway show. You know, a play. Oh, you don't mean the Patty Parker, who was once on television and understudied somebody in a Broadway play. Yeah, yeah, that's the one. You know her? Never heard of her. Oh, oh, the way you talked and everything, I thought you meant you just... Show me! Now, look! Bless you. Why? Just something a friend of mine, Father Murray, once taught me. You see, I used to get in all kinds of fights. And with a lot less provocation than you're giving me now. And he told me whenever I'm about to lose my temper, instead of counting ten, just take a few seconds to forgive the person and then say, bless you. It never fails. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. It's funny, ain't it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you got to excuse me, kid. I got out on the wrong side of bed this morning. Maybe your trick would work. It's more than a trick. Well, you know what I mean. <laughs> Boy, I'm sure starting this new year out right. Yeah, will you look at that big lummox? Ha! I mean, bless you. <laughs> well, what do you know? You see? I guess driving people around all night isn't the best way to spend New Year's Eve. Well, where else should I be? Home with my family? Yeah, I guess so. It's where I'd be if I hadn't come to New York. I don't know. I think if I was a mouse and I was standing out in the middle of Times Square at the stroke of midnight tonight, I'd have more peace and quiet than if I was home with Paula. Who's Paula? She's my wife. Oh. I mean, a man's got to make a living, don't he? Huh? Oh, yeah, sure. And to make a living, a man's got to do his job right, right? Yeah. Try to tell that to Paula. Uh, my wife, you know? Yeah, yeah, you told me. I mean, so you get a call and you got to go out on New Year's Eve. I mean, so this is an atom bomb attack? You got to start a fight? No. 
I, I mean, so the mercies are coming over like usual to have a nice little quiet, respectable brawl. I, I, I mean, so what? It's not the Queen of England. I mean, every other night I'm not working, the Murphys come over. In between, we go over to the Murphys. So this is something to blow your top about? Well, New Year's Eve is. I mean, special. so, all right. So I got her a bracelet for Christmas. And I didn't get her that sweater marked down to nine ninety eight. she was hinting about. So, all right, I got important things on my mind, right? Yeah. Yeah, I guess so. So this means I don't love her no more, you know? Oh, a fight, huh? No, uh, something like that. It's got me bugged. I don't know what's been happening to us lately. We used to have such great New Year's Eves. Uh, lots of drinks and hooping it up? No, 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 no. Nothing like that. Paula, she'd bake this here cake. Oh, that sounds exciting. The, ah, but it wasn't just no ordinary cake. She used to bake prayers inside it. Prayers? Yeah. Little New Year's prayers she'd made up herself. They was on little pieces of paper. Funny, I was just remembering some of them before you held me. And it was attached to strings, and as you ate the cake, you pulled them out. <laughs> I, I know it sounds corny, but then when 12 o'clock come around, we'd all toast each other and kiss and wish luck. Oh. And then we'd read the prayers. Kind of make you feel good, you know? Then we'd break it up. The guests would go home, and the family go up to bed. Kind of made you feel good, you know? Sure. But not this year, huh? Ah, she's been grumbling all week. She baked the cake this year, but... Eh, I don't know. Her heart's not in it no oh, more. Oh, gee, that's too bad. Maybe if I knew about that bless you idea... Maybe. Hey, listen. I'm doing just what I want to be doing tonight, driving this here hack. Sure, sure. It's a lot better than sitting around listening to her grumble how I don't like her because I forgot a sweater for Christmas. I mean, the fact that I've been hitting for a power drill and I end up with the same old two shirts and three ties, that must mean she's crazy about me, huh? Well, I don't know. You're darn right. Like, I mean... Hey, this is Sheridan Square. No, shit. Patty said Grove Street was right off Sheridan Square. Now, you make a right-hand turn. There, there, that's the street. Right there, that little one. Okay, okay. Uh, 18 ought to be near. It's a little street. Yeah, it's right there. There it is. Boy, you better calm down. Yeah. Well, it's just that this is the first date I ever had with an actress. Uh, here, keep the change. Oh, thanks. Now, take it easy, kid. You too. And remember what I told you. Yeah, yeah, I'll remember. Keep the change. Fifteen cents. Yeah, I might have known. <laughs> I guess the advice he gave me was better than the big tip, though. Bless you. <laughs> I wonder what Paula and everybody's doing now. Now, oh, will you look at that jerk blocking the street deck? Come on, you... Oh, wait a minute. Bless you! It's stretching a point, but... Bless you. Taxi! Taxi! Okay, okay. I'm glad I found you. I want to go up to East 82nd Street quick. Just as soon as I can get past that car up there. Driver, I'm in a hurry. There's a real creep coming to pick me up for a blind date. I don't know how I got trapped into it. Now, he's due any minute. I've got to get out of here before he comes. Oh, lady, that's not a nice thing to do. What business is it of yours? Hey, Miss Parker! Miss Parker! Is that you, Miss Parker? Oh, no. <laughs> My blessings oh. are Hi. Uh, I'm Henry Patterson. You know, we had that date. Yeah, I, I, I thought you weren't coming. I thought I'd been stood up. Oh, heck no. I'd never do anything like that. Oh, gee, am I late, Miss Parker? Well, kind of. Well, it's lucky I got here when I did. Your roommate told me that you just left, and she pointed you out getting into this cab. Oh, I'll kill her. Huh? Uh, nothing. Nothing at all. Well... I guess we might as well take off for that party. Where to? Oh. Hi. It's you. Oh, boy, did you ever see such luck? Not in a million years, Buster. Not in a million years. And I suppose you want to know where we're going. Sometimes it's a help. Well, I I've got it written down here someplace. Uh, what uh, 25 East 72nd? Right. 
Hey, uh, listen, uh, buddy, I think I ought to tell you... I beg your pardon? <laughs> Nothing. Nothing at all. Boy, I had a great time there. I majored in business administration. So after I got out of college, I got this job. Oh, darn. Uh, I just remembered something. Oh, what is it? Well, we're almost there, and I just remembered I forgot my cigarettes. Heck, I'll get you some. There's lots of stores along here. Would you please? Miss Parker, it would be a pleasure. Uh, there's a store. A uh, driver, stop. I, I want to get Miss Parker some. I know, car. I know, I know. I'll be right back. Okay. Okay, driver, take off. What? You heard me. Ah, oh, miss, you can't do Look, it. I don't have to make any explanations to you. All right, have it your way. Same address? No, that was a phony I gave. It's 124 East 82nd. Driver, what are you stopping for? The light. Can't you see? Oh, darn it, driver. You could have made it. Careless, I guess. I'm beginning to feel like his guardian angel. Listen, there's a guy I'm absolutely crazy about. See, I, I wait and wait for a call for New Year's Eve. But all of a sudden, big stone face. Look, lady, you don't have so to So I tell... say, all right, the heck with him. And I make a date with George there, or whatever the heck his name is. His name is Henry. Two minutes later, the other guy calls. He's going to be at this party, see? The one I'm going to. He says he'll meet me there. Oh, sounds like a nice guy. Well, you got to understand, dear me. He's got problems. He's misunderstood. Poor fellow. Well, I mean, I wouldn't mind if I could show up on the arm of somebody, but, I mean, this square, I'd die of mortification. So what's he supposed to do tonight? You ever think of that? Look, that's his problem. I mean, we all got problems. The light's changed. Yeah, yeah, I see. Hey, hey, wait! Hey, where are you going? Hey! Come on, driver, what are you waiting for? Lady, I can't, not with him standing there. Boy, where are you, where are you going? We, uh, we had to move a little. We were standing in a bus stop. Right, driver? I only know what I read in the papers. Thanks. You got the cigarettes already, honey? Oh, no. Uh, what brand? Huh? Well, you forgot to tell me what brand. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Yeah, scream. Come on, come on. Get in. I got an extra pack I can give no, you. No, no, that's all right. I'll get her some more. Will you get into the car? Okay. Oh, well, thanks. But listen, I... Oh. We're off again. Yeah. Driver, can't we go a little faster? Lady, don't you see the weather? It's snowing, Parker. And I got a wife and kids. I want to get there before the new year. Oh, we've got plenty of time. It's only, uh... There, there you see what I mean, miss? Careless driving. Bless you, lady! That's what? the idea. Say, what is this? I uh, don't worry. We're here. You pay him. I'll run ahead and meet you in the vestibule. And don't tip him. He's been very rude. Boy, what a girl. I never met a girl like that before. I wonder why. Pure luck. What do you mean? Hey, look, uh, you sure you want to go to a party with her? Sure, sure. Uh, here, keep the change. Ooh, you're disobeying orders. Oh, she's high strung. You gotta understand people like that. Yeah, yeah, I guess you do. Where'd she go? That house there. I watched. I'm on your side, buddy. Oh. Happy New Year. Yeah, same to you. I hate leaving you like this. Say, why don't you go home to your family? Sonny, I've been thinking of that. That's a good idea. Uh, it sounds like you always have a great time. You take my advice and go home now. Goodbye. Sorry, I, I didn't see you coming. That's, that's all right. You didn't hurt me. Oh, well, the snow makes everything pretty really, slippery. Really, it's all right. Uh, uh, Happy New Year. Yeah. Uh, taxi! Taxi! No, 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 I'm off duty. Uh, 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 what the heck? Okay, lady, don't run. You break your neck. Uh, I'm glad I found you. You all right, lady? Why well, shouldn't I be all right? I don't know. You look kind of funny. I'm... I'm okay. All right. Hop in. Well, where to, lady? To... Uh, to Times Square, please. Times Square? Tonight? 
What's the trouble? Lady, it's New Year's Eve. Oh, oh, well, but then take me to Grand Central Station. Well, that's a switch. Uh, look, lady, are you sure you feel all right? I feel fine. Okay, okay. <laughs> Sorry it's taken so long, but it's almost midnight, and this whole area is like topsy-turvy. I... Lady, what time is your train leaving? What? What's the matter, lady? Hey! hey what the... What are you doing now? Wait! Wait a minute! Yeah, come on, now give me that thing! Let me go! Oh, Where did you get this razor blade? None of your business. Man, that's all I need. I want to call a cop or something. No, please. <sighs> please don't. I wasn't going to. I tried all the way down here. I tried, but I, I couldn't. I just couldn't. Oh. Thank <laughs> the Lord. Some of the things they teach us as kids stick. <laughs> well, what brought it on, huh? He told me to leave the party. Oh, look, kid, calm down, huh, please? Oh, me didn't want to see me anymore. He must be nuts. Pretty girl like you. Now, come on. You okay now? I sure you are. But it's true now. It's all over. It should have ended a long time ago. What do you mean? Should have gone back home, then. Lady, it's none of my business, but it might have been the best thing. No. I told my family I was going to make good, and I am. Been in this town long? Since September. <laughs> oh, heck, you ain't even started yet. All I wanted to do was call home at midnight. He put up such a fuss. He said I was, I was tied to their apron strings, said... They exerted an unhealthy influence on me. He is nuts. That's so what? We can't all be perfect. Bless him. Huh? Oh, nothing. And he kept drinking and, and getting angrier and angrier, and then he told me to get out. Well, I hope you do, and keep going. I will. And, and thank you, driver. You've been very kind. Oh, I think not now. Oh. Huh? Well, what is it? When I ran out of the party, I left my purse. Important? Everything I own. No, don't tell me. Back downtown again. I'll never get home. But, <laughs> you know, I feel good. Hey, lady, happy new year. Happy new year to you. <laughs> Right back where we started. Oh, I'll get it and then be right down. You can take me back to my apartment. You sure you don't want me to go up to the party with you? No. No, it's all right, really. I prefer to do it myself. I'll be back in a minute. Ew. Ah. <laughs> She's a nice kid, though. Not like that other dame. Why is it the nice kind always get it and the other kind always hand it out? Hmm. Mystery of life, I guess. Well, I hope she don't take too long. I'd like to get back to Paula. That's funny. That kid sort of reminds me of Paula back when I first met her. Ah, uh -huh, gee, Paula. God bless her. First New Year we ever missed being together. I sure do miss that little cake and the prayers. God, I'm just a hothead. Why did I insist on working tonight? Just sore, I guess. That shows you what happens. A whole New Year's Eve gone, and we'll never get it back. Taxi! Taxi! 
No, it couldn't be. Hey, am I glad I found you. You? <laughs> what am I, your private chauffeur or something? Now, look, don't you give me any trouble. Bless you. I'm sorry. Uh, just take me for a drive, a long drive. What's come over you? That girl I was with, you know, uh, Patty Parker, the actress, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, she ditched me. Walked out with somebody else and ditched me. Right as the clock was striking 12. You don't say. You ever heard of anything so awful in your life? Uh, just take me for a drive, a long, long drive. I'm sorry, I can't. I'm booked. What? You can stay in the cab and warm your feet if you want to. But I uh, got somebody coming back in a minute. Must be at the same party you oh, want. Just my luck. At this hour and with this snow, probably won't be another cab in sight. Oh, mister, I'm sorry, but nobody give you a franchise on me. <laughs> oh, here she is now. Oh, thanks, driver. I got out of that place as quickly as I could. Oh. Just uh, warming his feet, lady. Warming your feet? He's an old friend of mine. By now, it seems I've known him all my life. What's your name, friend? Uh, Henry Patterson. Oh, I'd like you to meet... Uh, Anne. Anne James. Hello, Miss James. Well, I'll get out now and see if I can't find another cab. It's going to be pretty tough. Yeah. Uh, look, could I drop you someplace? Oh, sure. Thanks. <laughs> well, it's the eternal question again. Where to? Uh, well, uh... I... I don't know. That's it. That's enough. All over. I'm pushing up the flag. Business is over for tonight. Huh? Well, what am I supposed to do? Just sit here? Well, uh, I'm sorry. Oh, come on. Now, listen. I want to go home. This snow's getting bad. I know you kids got troubles, but this is the first New Year's I ain't been with my wife and kids. And I wouldn't... I... Bless you. <laughs> <laughs> hey, say, I got a great idea. You kids want to go to a party? A real party? Well, where? Well, first, we'll stop at St. Malachi's Church and say a few prayers. It's on the way. Then we'll go over to my place. We got that cake I told you about. And we'll make a toast and read the prayers in the cake on a stroke of 12. Oh, it sounds great. What do you say, Ann? Well, I could certainly use a few prayers. At church, I mean. Oh, so could I. Well, come on, let's go. Hey, I just thought of something. It's past the stroke of 12. Not in Chicago, it ain't. Well, you live in Chicago? No, but they're an hour different from us. We'll have a Chicago New Year's. Oh. Turn on the radio and celebrate it as it rolls through the Windy City. Sound good? It sounds wonderful. Oh, you're, you're a very kind man, sir. And I mean that. No. Oh. I figure you might as well start off this way. It gives you something to go on for the rest of the year. Say, I never did catch your name. Ragazzi. Pete Ragazzi. Well, I sure am pleased to know you, Pete. Pleasure's all mine. Hey, you know, I got an idea that this is going to be the best New Year's ever. But I mean the best. You know, Mr. Ragazzi, I think you're right. The Couple Next Door, written by Peg Lynch and starring Peg Lynch and Alan Bunce. Come on, Betsy, what is your mother doing up there? She's getting dressed, and she looks just beautiful. Well, if she doesn't step on it, there'll be no point in going to the party, I'm telling you. It'll be over before we get there. You look nice, too, Daddy. Oh, oh thank you. Doesn't he have nothing? Oh, I should say, you look just 
handsome. Yeah, well, thanks very much. <laughs> Frankly, I wish I weren't going out. I'd just as soon stay home and get to bed early. Oh, my, no. It's New Year's Eve. I wish I were going to a party. So do I. Well, we'll have fun together, Betsy. I made us some hot chocolate, and we'll... Oh, my goodness. I left the hot chocolate on the stove. Can I stay up until midnight, Daddy? No, oh, no, darling. You're too little yet. You go to bed like a good girl. Can I wear my evening wrap, or is it too cold? No, no, you'll be all right. We'll be in the car. Look, hurry up, will you? Come on. I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming. Oh, Mommy, you look just beautiful. <laughs> Thank you, Betsy. Uh, dress too tight? <laughs> well... Boy, you look like Marilyn Monroe. Well, I could hardly get the zipper up. I must have gained weight. It will certainly be one of my New Year's resolutions, go on a diet. Well, let's go. Where's Aunt Effie? She's in the kitchen. <laughs> Honestly, I feel kind of guilty leaving her alone on New Year's Eve. I know. Maybe we shouldn't go. Look, she insisted that we accept the invitation. I now. know, but she's made all these little remarks about how she wishes she were going out on a party. And frankly, I think Myra should have asked her. She knew Aunt Effie was here. I think I should call Myra now and say something. Oh, no. Look, we're all ready to go by the time Aunt Effie got dressed anyhow. I don't see how you can do that if, My- if Myra didn't ask her to begin with. No, and, uh... no, I suppose not. Uh... Well, good night, Betsy. Have a good time. Oh, we will, darling. Give Mommy a kiss. Oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> hey, look out there, Betsy. Don't bust <gasps> Mommy's hair now. She's an hour. Mommy doesn't mind, does she? No, as long as I'm getting such a nice hug and kiss, huh? Mm. Oh, gracious. <laughs> I love you. Oh, I love you too, honey. Yeah, oh. And if you there, yeah, now look, Betsy can stay up a bit longer tonight, but what's the matter? One of the dogs seems to be sick. Our dog? No, Ronnie? No, one of Eleanor's, the little one, Tippy. Oh, for Pete's sake. Oh, well, we better look at him, dear, before we go. Come on. Uh... <laughs> If you have a cold, bronchitis, or the chicken pox, you naturally get to work at once to do something about curing the disease. If the symptoms of some physical illness appear, you try to prevent the illness from getting worse. But far too many of us look upon one of the most serious and most prevalent of illnesses, mental or emotional disturbances, as some sort of a stigma. We're afraid to admit when mental illness occurs in our family and often wait until too late to do something about it. But the rigors of modern living can bring on tensions in any of us. And these tensions can help develop into very serious mental disorders if something isn't done to alleviate them. A great deal of wonderful work is being accomplished in the prevention, treatment, and cure of mental illness. If we treat it just as another form of disease, call in the right people to deal with it, support our local mental health organizations, and accept those who've been cured of mental disorders as we would anyone cured of a physical illness... We'll all be helping to combat and reduce a serious threat to the security and well-being of our nation. Tippy? Tippy? Tippy, what's what's the matter, little fellow, huh? I don't think there's anything wrong with that dog. Well, he is certainly not acting normal. You know what a lively little thing he is generally, mm-hmm. and just to lie there like this so listlessly. Well, I came out the kitchen here, you know, I remembered a hot chocolate on the stove, uh-huh. and I suddenly looked down, and there was Tippy underneath the table. I called to him, and you know how he always jumps up. Uh-huh. Well, he just kept lying there. Yes. Tippy, Tippy, want a cookie? Tippy, want a cookie? Goodness, he generally just leaps up when Betsy says that. Well, no, maybe he's had too many cookies. I shouldn't think they'd be good for him anyway. Oh, no, they're dog cookies, dog biscuits. Uh-huh. You want a biscuit? Huh, Tippy? Do you? Oh, honey, there is something wrong with him. Shall I warm up some milk? Well, no, no, I'll do it, Aunt Effie. Oh, no, no, dear, you're all dressed up. You don't want to spill on that lovely dress. Uh, honestly, what do you suppose is the matter with him? Maybe he's got a virus. Look, it's 8 o'clock at night. I think he's just sleepy. Get a dog biscuit out of the box, Betsy, and offer it to him. You know, we were due with the Pemberton's at 8 o'clock. Do you want to just walk off and leave a sick dog? Well, for Pete's sake, he probably just ate something that doesn't agree with him. Lots of times, Brownie acts that way. Next day, he's fine. Here, Tippy. Here, want a dog biscuit? Tippy? Hmm? Oh, no, he doesn't. He doesn't want it. Look at that. Now, that is not like him at all. Boy, last week, we sat up half the night playing nursemaid to Eleanor's goldfish. And... Tropical fish. Well, all right. Tropical goldfish. Fish, anyway. Whatever they are. Well, two of them died, and ones we replaced them with aren't exactly the same, and Eleanor's going to be upset about that. I certainly don't want anything to happen to one of her dogs while she's away. Well, I don't either, but... 
Well, you know, I still think it's a lot of nerve to dump all your pets on somebody to take care of. And the Bightoners were only going to be gone a week, you know. Yeah. They've been gone two weeks already, having themselves a fine time in Florida while we worry about their hey, fish Chippy. and their dogs and their parakeets. Hey, Chippy, little chip. Well, the oh. parakeets are all right, thank goodness. There. I think this milk is warm enough. It shouldn't be too warm. Here, Chippy, you want some milk? Oh, generally, he just loves oh. milk. Well, honey, when a dog doesn't feel well, he's got sense enough not to eat. Then you admit he doesn't feel well. Now, look, you two go on to your party, and I'll keep an eye on him. Yeah, sure, come on, and after you're oh, watching, let's go. Well, I don't feel right going to a party, dear, and just leaving him. I oh. just don't. Well, there isn't anything we can do for him. Well, I think we had better call a vet. Call a vet on New Year's Eve? Well, the dog doesn't know it's New Year's Eve. What? He didn't pick this time not to feel well. Besides, now that I think back, it seems to me he hasn't been quite as lively as usual the past two or three days. But I just didn't pay any attention. He didn't eat his beer yesterday. Mm. He didn't? Well, it was gone. Brownie ate it. Well, Brownie. for Pete's sake, maybe our dog's been gobbling up Tippy's food and Tippy's just weak from hunger. Did Brownie push him away? No, Tippy just looked at his food and walked away. And so Brownie ate it. Well, I'll call Myra and tell her that we're going to be late. And then we'll call a vet. Now, where did I put Elner's list of instructions? She wrote down which doctor their dogs have. Oh! You call Myra while I look up the vet. There he is. A car just drove up. There's a doctor, Mommy. Mm. Oh, oh. Oh. Honestly, what's his name again? Uh, Dr. Uh, Gibbons. Gibbons. Honestly, we don't know anything about him. What do we have to know about him? He's a vet. Only one we could get hold of. He's nice enough to leave a party. I know, but, I mean, we don't know anything about him. Is he any good? I mean, he doesn't know Tippy or anything. Well, I just hope he hasn't been partying too much already, so he knows what he's doing. <laughs> Look, for peace sakes, we got a sick dog, and he's a vet. After two hours, we were lucky to get anybody. What do you want to do, charter a plane and fly Tippy out to the Mayo Clinic? <laughs> well, when you have the responsibility of somebody else's dog, you feel you ought to get the best. Yeah, well, we're trying. Hey, I'll get it, I'll get it. Oh, oh, well, Dr. Gibbons? That's right. Well, come in, come in, come Doctor. In. Say, it was very nice of you to come over. Oh, this is my wife, uh, Mrs. Piper, and, and my aunt, Miss Sorensen. How do you do? My daughter, Betsy. Uh, how, do you, how do you do, Dr. Gibbons? May come I take in. your coat? Uh, thank you. Well, young lady, you got a sick doggy, huh? It's not mine. You know, you might say he's a house guest. Oh? Oh, I see. Some friends of ours went to Florida and left their two dogs with us, and it's Tippy, the little one that's sick. He hasn't been eating, and he's just lying out there sort of listless. Uh-huh, I see. Well, let's have a look at him. He's out here in the kitchen. I'm afraid you'll have to sort of crawl under the table to get at him. We we didn't like to move him. He whimpered when we tried. Uh-huh. There he is. Uh-huh. I came out to the kitchen earlier. I'd left some hot chocolate on the stove. Betsy and I were going to celebrate New Year's Eve together and have hot chocolate. <laughs> and my nephew and his wife here were going to a party at the Pembertons, some neighbors of theirs when they lived in their old house. You see, they just moved into this new house, which we think is just beautiful. Yeah, there be, uh, the doctor really isn't interested in all that. About... <laughs> well, I was just trying to tell him how I noticed Tippy was sick. Is he going to die? No, no, we'll hope not. Hope not? How long did you say his owners have been gone? Two weeks so far. Uh-huh. Well, I suspect there's only one thing wrong with Tippy. He's homesick. Homesick? Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Well, what did I tell you? Homesick. I just said there's nothing wrong with him. He's just homesick all the time. <laughs> oh, oh, boy, I tell you, we were so worried. Mm. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Dr. Gibbons, for coming over. I'm sorry it was sort of a wild goose chase. All right, honey, come on. Get, get your evening wrap. Let's get going. Boy, we were due at a party ourselves ages ago. Oh, oh, well, no. now, now, just a moment, Mr. Piper. It's not a trivial thing for a dog to be homesick. Well, no, no, I suppose not really, but... No, uh, not at all. And frankly, I don't want to dismiss this lightly without confirming my diagnosis. Where does Tippy live? Oh, well, well, uh, the uh, the Beitners live on Juniper Street, but I don't know when they'll be back. I suggest you drive him over there. See if he perks up once he's back home. Once he knows his home is still there. Well, we have the keys to their house. We can even get in. Yeah, well, that's probably not a bad idea. We'll do that tomorrow. Tomorrow? I suggest, Mr. Piper, you do it tonight. T tonight? This is New Year's Eve. We're supposed to be at a party. You, you mean you mean dr drive him over there now? Well, if the it... doctor was nice enough to leave a party to come and see Tippy, it seems to me the least we can do, dear, is to take his advice. Well, yes, my goodness, if you have any love for animals. Look, I love animals as much as the next guy, but if he's just homesick for Pete's sake... Have I, you I... ever been homesick, Mr. Piper? 
Well, I suppose when I was a kid, I... That empty, lonesome feeling that you've been deserted? That you'll never see your home again? That nobody loves you? Oh, oh the dear. poor little thing. My poor Tippy. Oh, Mommy, the poor little dog. Oh, look, 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 I... Why is the dog man's best friend? Because he, too, experiences the same desolation of the human heart. Hmm. Who but a dog, Mr. Piper, will love you, though the whole world be against you? Look, yes. I love dogs. Hmm. Let that be established. I guess the... All right, all right, all right. Let's get him in the car. Come on, drive him over. You have the number where I'll be. Yes. Call me and let me know what happens. Yes. Yes, yes. Well, could you call Dr. Gibbons to the phone, please? It's Mrs. Piper. He's expecting me to call. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Oh, listen to him. So happy to be in his own home, racing around upstairs there, barking. He's so happy now. He's a lot happier than I am. This is, without doubt, the nuttiest way to spend a New Year's Eve, lugging a dog over to this freezing cold house to, so he can chase around barking. We'll probably get pneumonia. Well, we'll leave as soon as I talk to Dr. Gibbons. Oh, he loves dogs, doesn't he? Yeah, he loves to collect a little extra money, charging me ten bucks to tell me Eleanor's dog is homesick. Shh, be quiet, be quiet. Hello? Dr. Gibbons, we finally got over here to the Beitners and we had misplaced their house keys. But as soon as we got here, Tippy went wild with happiness. <laughs> yes, oh, he's barking at there. Uh-huh. You do what? Tippy? Tippy? Uh -huh. Come on down, boy. Come on, come on, come on. Oh. we got to get back now. Come on. Oh. Come on, boy. Come Turn on, on the radio. Turn on the radio. Dr. Gibbons says it's almost midnight. Uh, oh, for Pete's sake, midnight? Yes. Uh, we, yes, but I'll ask him, Dr. Gibbons. He wonders if we could stay overnight here. What do you think? Stay over, stay overnight. Well, I could go back home and get our toothbrushes and night things. Stay overnight? Why? Well, he says dogs have died of homesickness. Well, and he says if Tippy is so happy now that rather than tear him away again so soon, it would be better, you know, if he spent a night in his own house. But you know, with people with us. I, you got it. Turn the radio up, but, darling. Well, what do you say? I can think of a lot of things to say, but I'm only going to say one of them. Happy New Year, sweetheart. Happy New Year. <laughs> Happy New Year, dear. Turn up the thermos. Yes. From city dweller to farmer, Americans know that they are part of the world and close to it. And the more they can find out about it, the better. That's why the broadcasts of Edward R. Murrow and Lowell Thomas are so popular. Each of these internationally known newsmen has a wide background in the history, the politics, the economics on which current events are built. Whether you're interested in high-level affairs of state abroad, economic developments here at home, or the latest advances of science, you'll find them presented clearly and understandably by Murrow and Thomas. If you're not already addicted to the news as CBS Radio presents it nightly, start this week to follow the broadcasts of Edward R. Murrow and Lowell Thomas. They're both heard Mondays through Fridays on most of these same stations. The Couple Next Door is written by Peg Lynch and stars Peg Lynch and Alan Bunce with Margaret Hamilton, Francie Myers, and John C. Becker and is produced by Walter Hart. The Anchor Hawking Glass Corporation brings you Crime Photographer. Ah, uh, Happy New Year, Casey. Happy New Year, Ethelbert. Same to you, Marvin. Say, you know, this 1948 is going to be a great year. Why so? Well, don't you know? It's leap year. And just what can leap year mean to you? Why, I'm surprised at you, Ethelbert. Don't you know that that means an extra Thursday? So what? So what? That extra Thursday gives me an extra chance to say that Anchor Hawking is the most famous name in class. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Tony Marvin. Every week at this time, the Anchor Hawking Glass Corporation of Lancaster, Ohio, and its more than 10,000 employees bring you another adventure of Casey, crime photographer, ace cameraman who covers the crime news of a great city. Written by Alonzo Dean Cole, our adventure for tonight, 
Hot New Year's Party. Half past nine on the morning of New Year's Day. And to some people, that hour on that day can be very bleak and dismal. Ethelbert, the uh, head bartender of the Blue Note Cafe, is obviously not one of those unfortunates, for we find him in the morning. Oh, what a beautiful thing. Hi, Walter. Yeah, Ethelbert. Uh, bring up two more bottles of aspirin. They're going to be our best sellers today. Okay. Oh, what a beautiful... Well, look who's here. Happy New Year, Casey. <laughs> and the uh, same to you, Miss Williams. Hmm. What's the matter with you two? Ask Walter to bring us a couple of cups of coffee, pal. Strong and black. Oh, oh. And slip me an aspirin tablet. Make that a double order. Oh, oh. Hey, Walter, draw two. Some of that. What's Tom and Chittison doing here? Practicing at this hour in the morning? He couldn't get home on account of the snow. He slept here all night. Oh. Here's some special headache medicine for you to stay out all night. We haven't been stay out all night. I know. Like good, sensible folks, you left the party early, just before daylight. And then you got all of... An hour's sleep before you had to come to work on an 8 a.m. shift. He's a wise guy, Annie. Yeah. You should have been like me. I wasn't on duty last night, but did I spend my leisure time in idle revelry? I did not. At 12 o'clock, my sister Edna and me wish one another a happy new year over a glass of good, healthful milk. Mm. Then I retired and enjoyed a fine, refreshing sleep. So, on this beautiful morning, you find me full of vim, vigor, and vitamins. Have another aspirin on the house. Shall I kill this guy quickly and... Listen, vim, vigor, and vitamins. The reason Miss Williams and I feel beat up is that ever since a few minutes after we reported for work this morning, we've been inhaling smoke. Smoke? Smoke. There was another warehouse fire this morning near Chatham Circle. That's the only New Year's party we've attended, and it was a red-hot one, too. Bad fire, huh? Yeah, plenty bad. Oh, here's Walter with our coffee. Oh, thanks, Walter. Happy New Year. <laughs> Boys, it's welcome, too. Thanks, Walter. Okay. Your papers kind of hinted that them warehouse fires lately have been arson jobs, Miss Williams. Oh, well, we're morally certain of it, Ethelbert. And that Jake Schultz is the man behind them. He and his mob make a deal with the owners of them places to split the fire insurance, huh? That's right. That's the racket. Hmm. Skinny Jake Schultz is a pretty smart cookie, I hear. Neither the cops or the fire inspectors has ever got anything on him. Yeah, well, if he's buying the torch job we just covered, he isn't so smart. And this one lets somebody in for a hot seat wrap. What do you mean? Well, the fire was set at night and there was a human being in the building, an old watchman. Hmm. That means arson in the first degree. The watchman got out all right, but a fireman was killed by falling timbers. And when death is caused through commission of first degree arson, it becomes first degree murder. And a reliable witness says that he saw three men run out of the warehouse a few minutes before the fire was discovered. He's uh, given the police a first-class description of them. Was one of them Schultz? No, of course not. Jake doesn't do any firebug stuff himself. If one of those three guys is caught and sings, uh, it's just going to be too bad for his boss, man. Annie, how about some more coffee? Mm-mm, no, we don't have time, Casey. No, We've right. got to get out to Barstow College. Well, there's no hurry about that. Yes, we don't... there is. City desk wants the dope on Professor Wendell right away. Mm. Well, who's Professor Wendell and what, what's he doing? Oh, he's a teacher at Barstow College. He... Went for a walk last night, and he hasn't come back. Uh, another professor who shares an apartment with Wendell's just reported his disappearance to the Missing Persons Bureau. Well, he thinks the guy has met with foul play? That's right. Yeah. Well, if we must, we must, Danny. Come on, let's get started at Professor Gerber's place. But this Professor Gerber's the one who reported the mysterious vanishing of this Professor Wendell. Huh? That's right. After we waste our time with him, Wendell will undoubtedly show up with a perfectly good reason for staying out all night. Well, I'm perfectly willing to waste time on such cases today. Well, I'd like to start the new year safely and sanely. Me too, Annie, me too. To establish a precedent for 1948, no jams and no trouble, nothing but peace, sweetness, and light. <laughs> Instead of just a hope, why don't you two make that a new year's resolution? Well, that's a good idea, pal. Oh, excellent. We here highly resolve... That for the coming year... And starting now... No jams... No trouble... Nothing but peace, sweetness, and light. (laughs) 
Professor Wendell and I have shared this apartment for over five years, Miss Williams, ever since he lost his wife. I know him, and I'm certain he wouldn't stay out all night without notifying me if he was able to do so. Mm-hmm. Oh, when did you see him last, uh, Professor Gerber? He attended a New Year's party at the Teachers Club, a, a most decorous affair, I assure you. Shortly after toasting the arrival of the New Year with a glass of sherry, he left saying he was going to take a bus to Chatham Circle. Chatham Circle? He liked to wander around there. That's a tough neighborhood. I know it, Mr. Casey. And I have repeatedly warned Professor Wendell to keep out of such neighborhoods, especially after dark. But to him, they were most interesting because of the criminal element he found there. He was interested in the uh, criminal element? Very much so. Frankly, instead of the brilliant authority on ancient civilizations which Professor Wendell has been for many years, I am certain that he would rather have been a, a, a private detective. Hmm. And now it's a Sherlock Holmes. Huh? He more particularly admired a fictional character called Dr. Thorndike. Uh, Casey, if he was snooping around Chatham Circle early this morning, he may have seen something he wasn't supposed to see. Yeah, that... that warehouse fire was started early this morning, Annie. A warehouse fire? Look, will you give us a description of your friend, Professor Gerber? Uh, Clarence Wendell is a small man, about five feet three, I should say, yeah. and he weighed not more than 130 pounds. He had light blue eyes, thin gray hair, and wears gold rimmed spectacles. Last night he wore a dark blue overcoat, black uh, and uh, Casey. Hey, Professor, did you give that description to the cops when you reported him missing? Oh, of course. I gave them a photograph of Clarence. And it didn't mean anything to them? Mean anything? Well, it exactly fits a witness description of one of three men who ran out of the Chatham Circle warehouse early this morning, of just before it caught on fire. I, I don't understand. Well, the missing persons bureau men who talked to Professor Gerber wouldn't necessarily know about that arson business, Annie. Oh, no, that's right. It's being handled by the uh, homicide squad. Will you please explain? Well, there's more important things to do first, Professor. If you don't mind, where's your phone? I want to call Captain Logan of Homicide and get him to check with missing persons right away. That's all you're going to do, Casey. Just phone. Remember our New Year's resolution? Casey, I got hold of that warehouse witness right after you phoned me. When he looked at the photograph missing persons had of Professor Wendell, he identified it immediately. Wendell was the little guy you saw coming out of the warehouse looking, right? Yeah, uh, between the two other men. Uh-huh. He hasn't been able to identify the others from pictures in our criminal file. And if the witness saw Wendell between the other guys? Yeah. Now he recalls they both had a grip on the little man's arms. Well, when Professor Wendell was playing detective last night, he accidentally stumbled onto the arsonist while they were setting the fire. And they kidnapped him to keep him quiet. That's the way it looks, Miss Williams. Which doesn't help us find Wendell or the firebugs. Well, like the uh, fire inspectors, you think that Jake Schultz mob is behind sure, him? Sure, but suspicion and proof are very different things. We haven't a single lead to work on. Professor Wendell's a definite lead. He's a definite complication. Huh? If two of Schultz's torches put the snatch on him this morning because he caught him setting a fire, they probably bumped him off by now. Hmm. Uh, Logan, I don't think Professor Wendell has been bumped off. Why? Casey, the gang won't dare let him live if he saw what we think he did. Oh, they're getting the works eventually, Annie. But Jake Schultz is going to do a whole lot of thinking before he okays a murder that would hit the front pages and stay there. Logan Jake's in the fire business, but he does his best to avoid strong heat. Yeah. I'll have Skinny Jake and his mob brought in. We'll force information out of them. Ah, you won't force anything out of Jake or his mob. That's been tried before. Do you know of anything else we can try? I can try something. You? Yeah. What? I think I'll have to keep to myself. There can't be any cops in the picture, Logan. Meaning you know some crook who might be persuaded to spill? Meaning you ask no questions and I answer none, now or later. Okay, Help me find Professor Wendell alive, and you can write your own ticket. boy, Logan. Thank you. I'll get started right away. Now, stick around to your office here, and I'll phone you after I make my contact. I'll be near the phone. So long. Oh, I'm going with you. See you later, Captain. Okay, Miss Williams. And carry your luckiest horseshoe, Casey. Yeah, I guess I'll need it, pal. Oh, what are you going to do, Casey? Annie, I'm going to leave you as soon as we've reached the street door. Not unless you tell me what this is all about. Look, kid, I can't tell anybody. Well, then I'll trail you. But well, if you do, you may wreck the one chance of finding Professor Wendell alive. Okay. Well, j- just tell me one thing, off the record. Where are you going? Completely off the record, Annie. To Nick Morrow's tavern. Well, the Schultz mob hangs out at Nick Morrow's. Jake Schultz owns the place. Yeah? Casey, you'll be sticking your neck out down there. Quite a few of the mob know you. Schultz knows you. I'll be okay, Annie. Well, Maybe. Resolutions are so easily broken, Casey, we should only have hoped for a safe and sane 1948. Today, 
a lot of you probably met jadeite dinnerware for the first time because jadeite is the perfect solution to the problem raised by an unusually large number of guests. Jadeite cups and saucers, jadeite dessert plates and salad plates, jadeite dinner plates, soup plates, vegetable bowls and platters are as lovely as Chinese porcelain. They're as heat-proof as the Fire King oven glass you use for baking, yet they're so inexpensive that you can buy all the extra pieces you need for entertaining without making a dent in your budget. For example, jadeite cups and saucers cost only 15 cents for the two pieces, and you can buy a complete 35-piece dinner service for six for less than $5. Now, you'll find jadeite dinnerware at chain stores, hardware stores, department stores, and all other stores selling chinaware and glass. Ask for jadeite by name. Now, it's spelled J-A-D-E-I-T-E. Jadeite, newest triumph for banker hawking. The most famous name in glass. Well, Rick Monahan ain't in the back room, Casey. He ain't been in a joint at all today. Uh, well, I'll stick around, Nick. You'll probably be in later. Give me a beer, will you? Okay. You bar to a big New Year's business last night, Nick? I can't complain. Uh, you still running with the cops, Casey? Why, Nick, I don't know what you mean. I'm a newspaper guy. Sure, sure, I know. Here's your beer. Thanks, Nick. What do you want to see Red Monahan about? If it's any of your business, Nick, I want to thank him for the Christmas card he sent me. You've been waiting here over an hour for me, Casey? That's okay, Red. It's okay. Oh, it ain't okay. You're one guy I wouldn't keep waiting for no reason. Well, look, let's sit out here. Yeah? Over the corner table there, we can talk privately. Yeah, okay. Uh, hey, Nick. We're going to sit down and bring me and my pal Casey a drink. Okay, Red. Come on, Casey. Yeah, it's good to see you. Can't take a load off your feet. Thanks. Now, what's on your mind? I'm going to ask a favor of you, Red. A favor? Yeah. I owe you a debt, fella. One I can't ever pay. My only kid would be dead if it wasn't for you. You'll never forget how you pulled her out of the river when she was drowning. Uh, here's your drinks. Oh, thanks, Nick. That's all, Nick. Thanks. Now, tell me, what, uh, what can I do for you, Casey? Right, I'll give it to you quick and straight, Red. I want Professor Weldon. I don't know what you're talking about. I think you do. I know how close you are to Schultz. Nick, I... Look, I give him a word. That the cops don't know and won't know that I'm talking to you. All I want is that little professor and I want him alive. I ain't got the slightest idea what you're driving at, pal. I swear I ain't. Say you owe me a debt, Red. Under ordinary circumstances, that's a debt that only a heel would try to collect. But under these circumstances, I ask Wendell's life in exchange for your kids. I can't give it to you. Because he's been killed? No, he ain't been killed. I tell you, I don't know anything about him. You can't lie to me, Red. Look. You're a crook, but you're not a murderer. If you don't tell me where to find Professor Wendell, you'll be committing murder right now, just as surely as though you held a gun to the guy's head. Well, you ain't even seen that guy, Casey. I won't see him. You know what I, I mean. Keep I, your nose clean, fella. I ain't no squeal. I don't rat. You're ratting on a debt. You owe me a life. Okay, Casey, you win. Uh, I'm coming clean with you. But I had no part in anything that happened this morning. Where is the Professor? He's being kept in an old house out in Bristol Road. Well, Schultz makes up his mind when and how to bump him off. Where on Bristol Road? East of Old Turnpike. Third farmhouse on the right-hand right. side. Third farmhouse on the right, yeah. Yeah, now get out of here, Casey. It's curtains for me if the mob finds out that I Nobody told Nobody will ever find it out from me, Red. Thanks a million and so on. So, I... What's the matter? Schultz. Skinny Jake. Just came out of the back room with two guys at the mob. Yeah. Hello, Red. Hi, Jake. Hi, Murray. That's Trick, Sam. Yeah. Hi. Casey, I haven't seen you for a long time. Well, I haven't been around your way, Schultz. Nick phoned me a while ago that you were waiting here for our pal Red. Knowing how he feels about you on account of his kid, I decided to come over. You, uh, come in the back way? Uh-huh. I've been sitting in the back room, listening for the wall. Listening? You heard? Yeah, plenty. Walk into that back room, both of you. Keep your hands in sight. Get going. 
Okay. Yeah. Now, we've got a car in the alley, and you two dopes are getting into it. Oh. What are you going to do to this, Jake? You can guess, can't you, Red? Yeah. And I ain't going to take it. Watch my ghost for me, too, Red. Don't shoot, guys. It might bring the cops. In this case, he's getting my gas. No, he isn't. You got him with your black cat. Yeah, Casey's on the picture. Now, Red, you got right under control, Jake. What's happening anyway? I'm doing just that. Now, they're both out cold. Yeah, but not cold enough. You and Murray put him in the car, Sam, and we'll all go for a ride. There's a good spot, Sam. Stop the car. Okay, boss. Now, Red, this is the end of the ride for you and Casey. Hey, they can't hear you, Jake. Huh? When you socked them back in Nick's joint, you've done an A1 job. They're still out, eh? And how? All right, pull him out of the car and roll him into the ditch here. Yeah, give me a hand, Sam. Hey, boy. Come on. Come on. Got it? Yeah, got it. Pull him back. Yeah. All right. Now, get back in the driver's seat, Sam. You, Murray, give him each a slug through the head. Me? Yes, you heard me. Hey, you're afraid of killing, ain't you, Jake? Oh, I'm not afraid of it. I've just been smart enough to keep myself and you guys clear of it. Now we... Well, we've got no choice. But you want someone else to do it. I'll do it if you haven't got the guts. Get back in the car. Yeah, that suits me fine. Hey, why are you getting in too? I'll shoot from here. Sam, be ready to step on the gas when I do. This isn't a private road. I'll be ready. I got the bus in gear and my foot on the clutch. Let them guys in the ditch have it, Jake. All right, I, I'm letting them have it. Hey, a car's coming, boss. Huh? Come behind us. Yeah, I see it. Get away, Sam. I can't see you. We've got one guy, Jake. I can't do any more shooting now. Get away from that car behind us, Sam. Get away. Well, you certainly had that lucky horseshoe with you, Casey. He found Red Monahan lying beside you in the ditch with a bullet to his chest. And you, <laughs> you only had a, an egg-sized lump on the back of your head. Oh, Casey didn't get off so easy, Captain Logan. He was unconscious for almost two hours after he was brought to this hospital. Well, the doc hey. says he's all right now, Miss Williams. Yeah, it's all right, honey. I'm okay. Don't worry. Oh, Casey, I'm... I've been so worried. Oh, forget it, kid. They, uh, they killed poor Red. No. Oh, he's going to pull through. Slug didn't get him in a vital spot. Oh, I'm glad of that. I'm glad. Now, Red's more than a half-right guy, much more. Of course, you want to know what happened. Oh, <laughs> take it easy, pal. You were delirious for a while after they brought you here, and you did a lot of talking. You kept saying that Red Monahan had told you that Professor Wendell was being held prisoner in a house on Bristol Road. East of Old Turnpike, third farmhouse on the right. Wait a minute, I said all that when I was out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> over and over. Well, then you went to Bristol Road and found the professor. And my guys went there, pal, but too late. Schultz and the men with him evidently knew they hadn't killed you, Casey. They yeah, lost no time in taking Professor Wendell away. We found the house empty. Haven't any idea where they've taken him. Well, you found a possible lead in that Bristol Road farmhouse, Captain. Go ahead and show Casey. Lead? Why, that thing's no lead, Miss Williams. It merely proves that Professor Wendell was in the house. What'd you find, Logan? He found a belt. A belt? Mm -hmm. With Professor Wendell's initials on the buckle. Now, take a look, pal. Miss Williams insists that these cuts in the edges of the belt mean something. Well, they're, they're fresh cuts, Casey. See? Yeah. Uh, when we found the belt in a room where Wendell was probably held prisoner, we figured that those cuts might be some sort of a tip-off about where he'd been taken from there. And it hasn't worked out that way. Mm, they're funny cuts, aren't they? Some straight, some slanting, and irregularly spaced. Uh, yeah, Wendell knew that an ordinary written message wouldn't help him. The men guarding him would have found it and destroyed it. Well, I'm sure these cuts are a message in, in code. Our cipher expert at headquarters didn't recognize it as any code. Well, your chief cipher experts were taking New Year's Day off, Captain. The men on duty are apprentices. Yeah. Do, um, do the cuts mean anything to you, Casey? Hmm. No, not a thing. Yeah, it makes it unanimous. They're Greek as far as all of us are concerned. Uh, Greek? Hmm? Greek? Hey, Annie, hmm? wait a minute. Professor Gerbel uh, told us that... That Wendell was an authority on ancient civilizations. H have you shown this belt to, to Gerber or whatever his name is, Logan? No, but I phoned him. All right, we're going to show it to him right now. Casey! Yeah. Casey, you can't get out of bed. I'm out. Beat it, Annie. Come on, let me get dressed. I want to hear what Professor Gerber says when he sees this cut-up belt. All right, I'm going. I'm going. <laughs> You're uh, right, Mr. 
Casey, that belt conveys a message. It does, Professor Kevin? Yes, in the oldest secret code that history records. The ancient Spartans used it to convey secret military information. It is called Sitily. Professor Wendell hoped you'd bring this to me, Captain Logan. Ah, he did, eh? He must have. He knew I'd be able to read a Sitily message. Oh, why are you wrapping that belt around your arm? So that I may be able to decipher its markings, Miss Williams. You see, to write a Sitily message, the ancients wrapped a strip of papyrus, long and narrow, like this belt, around a staff of predetermined circumference. Spirally, with the edge of each spiral joining that of another. Then on the joining edges, they wrote the secret information they wished to impart. When the strip was unwound from the staff, nothing but apparently idle markings were visible on its edges. Uh, now, the belt is completely wound about my arm. See? Its message is plain. Now, not to me. All I see is that the edges of the cuts meet. But the cuts form letters, Captain. Greek letters. Yeah, Greek, Logan. Anne knows she's been to college. Uh, well, what do they say? In rough translation, they are taking me to Diana's house. Diana's house? Diana was the Roman name for the Greek goddess Artemis. Say, I'm not a shark on the classics, but I get it. So do I, Logan. Well, I don't. Neither do I. Professor Gerber, Annie. The name of Skinny Jake Schultz's best gal friend is Diana. And to get away from the classics entirely, it's Diana McGillicuddy. I never thought Schultz would take Wendell to such an obvious hideout, Casey. Neither did I, Logan, which means Schultz has been smarter than we are. Well, all right, let's go. All set, Captain Logan. We have the joint surrounded. The men are ready to break in from all sides, Sergeant? As soon as they hear your whistle, sir. I'll hear that as soon as I get to the front door. Now, you stay there, Casey. Oh, no. I got a little personal matter to settle with skinny Jake Schultz. I got a hunch he's in Diana's house. You should still be in the hospital, you say? All right, but I'm not. Okay, blow your whistle. Yeah, I haven't got time to argue with you. <laughs> it's a day, guys. Hey, hey, stop. They're coming in from all sides. Take them up. That means you, Schultz. Oh, no, you're not going to take me. You're wrong, Jake. Oh, Casey. I owe them a K.O., Logan. And I owe these other two mugs something, too. No, no. no. We, we've given up. Yeah, lay off, Casey. Let me go, Logan. Right, let me go. Cut it. This is a police job. You can take the pictures, but you can't make them. Well, all right, Logan. But I want good shots. With Professor Wendell in them. Where is Wendell, you mugs? He ain't been hurt. He's down in the cellar. Yeah. Sergeant, bring him up. I'll get my camera set. You, you can't take pictures of the professor for the newspaper. Hey, not for decent newspapers. Why not, you mugs? Oh, I'm on account of... Because, uh, some way, uh... The professor lost the belt that kept his pants up. Yeah, and and then suddenly he lost his pants. We'll join the crowd of the Blue Note in just a moment. You know, tonight we're nearing the end of the holiday season, and to those of you who are exhausted, here's a suggestion. A good hot cup of coffee which you can prepare in an instant, without fuss, without work, and without waiting even a minute. Now, I'm talking about soluble coffee, the amazing scientific discovery which makes really delicious coffee available at a moment's notice. Now, all you need is a cup, a spoon, and a glass jar. The sanitary, convenient anchor glass jar in which most of the better packers of soluble coffee bring you their products. The anchor glass jar opens quickly and simply. There's no trouble in measuring, no waste from spilling, and even more important, glass jars protect the flavor and freshness of soluble coffee against moisture long after they're open. You'll be delighted by the delicious soluble coffees now on the market, particularly those that come to you in convenient anchor glass containers sealed with anchor caps, both products of anchor hawking. The most famous name in glass. pictures you took of Professor Wendell after he was rescued was very different, Casey. It's the first time I ever saw pictures of a college professor wrapped in a blanket. He looked just like an Indian. <laughs> <laughs> professor Wendell didn't like to have him taken that way, Ethelbert, even though Casey was responsible for his rescue. He was uh, kind of burned up. Yeah, he wasn't as burned up as Jake Schultz and his hired firebugs are going to be. No, they're facing murder and kidnapping charges. And with plenty of evidence to back them up. 
As the result of Casey busting some nice New Year's resolutions, Miss Williams. Hmm. Yeah. The safe and sane 1948. You started well. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you. Let's enlarge the idea. And no kidding. You got something there, I hope. All right, all together. Happy, Happy New, New Year, Year to, to everyone. To everyone. <laughs> Starring Scott Scottsworth as Casey is brought to you each Thursday by the Anchor Hawking Glass Corporation, makers of Fire King Oven Glass, Anchor Glass Container, Anchor Caps and Closures, all products of Anchor Hawking, the most famous name in glass. Suspense. And the producer of radio's outstanding theater of thrills, the master of mystery and adventure, William N. Robeson. Tampering with time has been an ambition of man since he first realized how inexorably he is time's slave. At this time of the year, although we have even less time on our hands, time is much in our minds. We make a magic ritual of New Year's Eve when we suppose we can flush away all our past impurities and begin a fresh at that magic hour of midnight on the 31st of December. But suppose we couldn't. Suppose the 31st of December were not the end. Listen. Listen, then, as Mr. Frank Lovejoy stars in the 32nd of December. And now, the 32nd of December, starring Mr. Frank Lovejoy, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. As far as I was concerned, when I got up the morning of December 31st, it could stay 1958 forever. The only trouble is time doesn't work that way. Time is a downhill ride in a car with no brakes. You can't stop it even if your life depends on it. And mine did. Joe, your breakfast is getting cold. I'm coming, I'm coming. All I have time for is a cup of coffee anyway. Uh, what is this, milk? Don't we ever have anything but milk to put in the coffee? You know we can't afford cream these days. We can hardly afford to eat. Molly, you'll be wearing mink yet. Just give me a little more time. Yeah, you've been saying that ever since you got married. Well, sooner or later, Molly, I'm going to make it. By the way, honey, uh, let me have your ring. Why? Well, you said the diamond's loose. I'll drop it to the jewelers on my way to the office. Oh, we can't afford to get it fixed now. Molly, that's an expensive ring. We can't afford not to take care of it. Joe, have you been gambling again? Oh, now, Molly, I told you, I'm all through with that. You told me the same thing just before you pawned your watch. And the cufflinks I gave you on our first anniversary. I'm not going to pawn your engagement ring. Now, let me have it. I'll pick it up on my way home tonight. Well, all right, but, Joe... What? Remember, it's very precious, at least to me. Sure. Sure, I've been gambling again. I was in the hole back. The boys wanted to pay off by midnight, and this time they weren't going to take no for an answer. If I couldn't raise the dough on Molly's ring, I didn't know what I'd do. The pawn shop was like any other pawn shop. Dirty and gloomy, full of junk, with clocks ticking all over the place. One thing caught my eye as soon as I came in. In the front case, a watch. Curiously ornate, obviously very old. It sort of glowed in the case. I couldn't take my eyes off it. You like to look at the watch? Oh, uh, no. (laughs) No, it's very interesting, but... uh, How much can I get on this ring? On this, I can lend you $150. $150? 
Uh, the guy I won it off claimed it was worth more than a thousand. One hundred fifty. I can probably get five hundred for it easy. Then you would be foolish to accept my offer. That's the best you can do. One hundred fifty. I'll take it. I will get the money. While I waited, I felt my eyes drawn to the antique watch again. I picked it up. It felt warm in my hand, almost as if it were alive. Its face was covered with all sorts of dials and figures. The date of the month, phase of the moon, even the signs of the zodiac. Some of the dials I couldn't read at all. They were inscribed with strange characters like hieroglyphics or ancient Sanskrit. Suddenly, I felt I had to have that watch. One hundred, twenty, forty, forty-five, one hundred fifty. Can you tell me what all these dials mean? I can tell you only that this watch controls many kinds of time. The fellow who pawned it claimed it could make time pass as slowly or as rapidly as he desired. <laughs> That's a pretty good trick. Mm -hmm. But only a trick. Time is different for each of us, is it not? What do you mean? To a man sitting on a hot stove, one second lasts forever. But to a man making love, forever is only a second. <laughs> yeah, I, I see what you mean. How much are you asking for the watch? One hundred fifty dollars. Excuse me. Hello. Yes, one moment, please. Is your name Joe Adcock? Yeah, why? Yes, Mr. Adcock is here. Who is it? Who is calling? Hello. Hello? Hmm. That is odd. Nobody knew I was coming here. Who was it? He did not identify himself. He just said I would not believe him. Then he hung up. <laughs> it's funny. Say, uh, now what about the guy who pawned this watch? Any chance of him wanting it back? No, Mr. Adcock. He will not return for it. He has no further use for the watch. <laughs> okay. Well, then I'll take it. I don't know why, but I, I've got to have it. I had no business buying the watch. It was a crazy thing to do. I hadn't walked more than a few steps from the pawn shop when I learned just how crazy. Hold it, Adcock. Well, who are you? Just one of the boys. What do you want? A little talk. Private. In the alley here. But I don't have... In the alley. Ah, my arm. You got the grand, Adcock? I got until midnight to get it. Yeah, that's right. The boss just wants me to make sure you don't forget... Like last time. Oh, I, I won't forget, I promise. I'll be waiting for you at midnight, right here by the pawn shop. Oh, and one more thing. So what is it? This. Oh. That's just to make sure you don't forget. If you don't show up with the dough, there ain't going to be no New Year for you. You understand? Yes, I, I understand. Good. See you at midnight. I had to get back the 150. Maybe I could make a fast killing at the track with it or, or, or something. I had to get it back. Oh, back so soon, Mr. Adcock? Yes, yes, I, uh, I made a mistake. Hmm. We all make mistakes. That is life. Look, I've got to have that money back. Here's your watch. My watch, Mr. Adcock? This is your watch. You bought it. But, but I don't want it. I want the money. A deal is a deal. But you don't understand. Uh, I... It is you who do not understand, Mr. Adcock. To sell the watch, you must find a buyer. I am not buying. But look, you've got to help me. Well, will you take the watch in pawn? Of course. That is my business. Well, how much can I get for it? Five dollars. Five dollars? Just a few minutes ago, I paid a hundred and fifty for it. It is unfortunate that I do not value it so highly now. Five dollars? No, thanks. <laughs> Five dollars wouldn't help me. I had to have money, big money. My only chance now was to try to borrow it. 
I know you've had an account here for years, Mr. Adcock, and of course we like to do what we can for our regular customers, but unless you have some collateral... Well, what kind of collateral? Oh, stocks, bonds, real estate. Uh, if I had that kind of stuff, I wouldn't need the loan. Five hundred? Joe, you're crazy. A hey, bartender, another beer. All right, all right, Harry. Make it a C note, anything. Yeah, well, what about the C note you borrowed last August? Oh, I'll pay you back. Honest. Yeah, I heard that last August. Oh, Harry, how long have you known me? Mm, ten years, I guess. All right, ten years. Doesn't that count for anything? Not for a C note, it don't. Oh, but Harry... Oh! Not a dime. Not a lousy dime. Only one thing left to do. Shop. Molly, uh, I want you to come home right now. Joe, aren't you at work? No, I'm home. Well, what's the matter? Are you sick? I'm all right. Just come home and hurry. Joe, what's wrong? We've got to get out of town. Fast. It took only a few minutes to throw everything Molly and I owned in the suitcases. I kept looking at the watch... Wondering when Molly was going At to show up. At the time signal, the correct time will be 2.30. 2.30? What's keeping her? Well, at least the watch is on time. I wonder when I ought to wind it. <laughs> Might as well do it right now. If I can figure out which one of these knobs to use. I'll try this one. What the devil? Where did the sun go? It was shining a minute ago. Now it's snowing. Last year, I did get the wrong knob. I moved it back to the 28th, so now I've got... Hey, wait a minute. The 28th was Sunday, the day we had the big snowstorm. Could the watch have... Ah, it's impossible. I set it back to the 31st, and I... What the... Now the sun is shining. Did the watch change the day, or am I losing my mind? Maybe I could set it again, test it. Let me see. I, uh, I was in that pawn shop just before 1 o'clock. I set the hour hand back to 12.45. There, now we'll see. Hello? Is this the 3rd Avenue pawn shop? Yes. Is, uh, is Joe Adcock there? One moment, please. Is your name Joe Adcock? No, I. Yes, Mr. Adcock is here. Who is it? Who is calling? You wouldn't believe me if I told you. I could hardly believe it myself. But there was no question about it. The watch did control time. Once I'd grasped that fact, I began to realize its implications. For the first time in my life, I could have all the time I needed, all the time I wanted. Joe! Joe! Oh, Joe, what's wrong? Not a thing, Molly, not a thing. But you said we had to leave town. Oh, did I? Well, that's all over now. Joe, what are you talking about? I'll probably lose my job No, because... no, don't get excited. I... Well, I might as well tell you the whole story. I lied to you about the gambling, Molly. I'm $1,000 in debt. I've got to pay off by midnight, but... You I... pawned my ring, didn't you? But now, don't worry. I'll get it back. You lied to me. I said I'll get it you back. You have no right to pawn it. It's mine. I want my ring, All though. right, I'll get it. Now, right now. I haven't got time now. I've got to get back to the bank before it closes. Get my ring, you promise. Will you quit nagging me about your blasted ring? Let me get back to the bank. We'll have enough money to buy you a dozen rings. Joe, what are you going to do? I'm going to rob the bank. What else? Watch figured out right. Robbing the bank would be as easy as taking pennies from a blind man. It was two minutes to three when I walked into the bank and headed for the vault. Oh, hello, Mr. Adcock. Back again, I see. Yeah, yeah, I've got to get into my safety deposit box. Certainly, go right ahead. Good. Nobody else in here. Now... I just turned the watch back to Sunday, the 28th. 
It worked. <laughs> I'm locked in the vault and it's Sunday. Now, let's see where they keep the ready cash. There it is. Stacks of it and all mine. Well, that's plenty for now. Enough to pay the mob and more. <laughs> There's always more where this comes from. Now, reset the watch to December 31st. Perfect. The perfect crime. All I have to do is get out of here without letting them see the money. Mr. Adcock. Yes? A happy and prosperous New Year to you, sir. Oh, thanks. Thanks a lot. Molly! Hey, Molly! Molly, it worked. We're rich. Have you been drinking? No, not a drop. Here, look at this. What? Go on. Take them up. They're real. Sure. These are thousand dollar bills. Where did you get them? I robbed the bank. Oh, come on, Joe. I always told you I'd make it big someday. Well, today is the day. Now you go out and buy yourself a dress. We're going to celebrate New Year's Eve in style. Happy New Year. Yeah, yeah, come on. Let, let's get out of this crowd. It's almost midnight. I thought we were going to celebrate. You were going to take me to a nightclub. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But first, I, I got to meet a guy at midnight. Come on. Ooh. A guy. I got to pay off that gambling debt. Well, where are you meeting him? It's just a block away in front of the pawn shop. The pawn shop? My ring. Joe, you forgot my ring. Oh, for Pete's sake. I'll get your lousy ring back. Just give me a little time. Oh, a little time. That's the story of your life, isn't it, Joe? Just give me a little time. Well, all right, I'll give you all the time you want, all the rest of your life. I'm through with you, Joe. I just can't take it anymore. Molly, don't leave me. Molly, come back. Happy New Year. Whoa. What happened? Molly just disappeared. The street is deserted. Molly! Hey, where is everybody? I wonder if this crazy watch had anything to do with... The 32nd? It should have clicked over to January 1st. Oh, no wonder everybody disappeared. There isn't any 32nd of December. I'll just... I'll just reset it. It's stuck. It won't budge. Oh, it's got to move. It's just... Oh, no. It can't be broken. I can't stay in the 32nd of December forever. I've got to fix it. I've got to get the back off. I've got to get it to works. I... There. But there's nothing inside. It's the 32nd of December. And it will... Always be the 32nd of December. Suspense. In which Frank Lovejoy starred in William N. Robeson's production of the 32nd of December... Written by Morris Lee Green and William Walker. Supporting Frank Lovejoy on the 32nd of December were Joan Banks, Barney Phillips, Sam Pierce, and Norm Alden. Listen. Listen again next week when we return with another tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Tonight, Thrill with Gunsmoke on the CBS Radio Network.
One Man's Family, brought to you by the makers of Chase and Sanborn Coffee and Fleischmann's Yeast. One Man's Family is dedicated to the mothers and fathers of the younger generation and to their bewildering offspring. Today we present Chapter 14, Book 64, entitled New Year's Eve with the Barber Clan. Well, it's New Year's Eve in the Barber family home out in Seacliff on the edge of San Francisco Bay. Therefore, naturally, it would be New Year's Eve out on the jungle edge of Accra on the African Gold Coast. And that's where Paul is and Nicolette Moore. Not quite prisoners, but certainly undercover while Paul is recovering from head and back injuries received when their hotel cottage was dynamited. A gruff, non-communicative individual has seen that they were fed, given medical attention, and kept out of sight for two weeks now. The rooms they occupy are low, dark, and seem to be part of a larger structure, all of which is included in a walled compound of high, sharp-pointed bamboo stakes. Paul is on his feet for the first time since his injury. You see? You walk as well as you ever did. Yeah, I walk, and that's about all. But that is proof you have no serious damage anywhere. You are a very fortunate fellow, Paul Barber. Well, I made it from the bed to the chair, anyway. And tomorrow you'll make it from the bed to the compound, and presently you... Nicolette. Yes? There's been no word from outside, from Kirby, the American consul. How is it possible? No one supposedly knows where we are. You don't even know that the Christmas message got through to the family, do you? No, Paul. All I could do was give the message to Richardson, and he said he would do his best. Richardson? Who and what is Richardson, anyway? He feeds us, he gives us medical attention, he gives us refuge and shelter. He also guards us. Nicolette, are you sure we're not Richardson's prisoners? All I know is that he has treated us with consideration. He has said that when you are fit to travel, he will point our faces in the right direction. I heard him. Right direction for what? To complete our mission, I should think. Find Patricia Baldwin. The United States government puts me on the trail of Patricia Baldwin. What do I do? Get myself blown up in Accra, Africa. Laid up for two whole weeks. Martin Whitehead died oh. with a knife in his throat. The little Englishman died also with a bullet in him. You are still alive. That's not the point. Patricia Baldwin is still at large. For all I know, disposed of once and for all. Because I wasn't fast enough on my feet or smart enough. You think it will save the situation to sit here on New Year's Eve and bemoan fate? You think that will help? Nicolette, did I dream it or did I hear Richardson say he didn't know why the United States wanted Patricia Baldwin so badly? Unless for the dubious pleasure of executing her? Yes, he said that. Doesn't make sense. Patricia Baldwin was a Red Cross nurse. She was kidnapped here in Accra by agents in some sort of international intrigue. Do we know that? Well, she was either kidnapped or she left the ship of her own free will. Is that so impossible? Well, that would indicate that she was guilty of something. That she was running away and the United States government is after her. Well? Well, from what we know, Patricia Baldwin, do you see her as a traitress? A young, eager American girl who dedicated her life to Red Cross nursing? Yes, I know, but Europe is so full of poison today. The moral standards have fallen to an ugly level. Patricia Baldwin was young, unsophisticated. Are you trying to tell me that the girl was inoculated with some of this European rottenness? I am only saying that stranger, more wicked things than that have happened, are happening right today. Hmm. I don't like it. Does it make any difference to us? We have a job of finding the girl and turning her over to the government. Does it matter whether we are turning her in as an innocent girl or a scheming woman? Mm. The chase has lost some of its zest. Oh, my idealistic American friend. Don't you Americans ever stop dreaming of utopia? Of valiant, pure-hearted knights and beautiful chaste maidens? The world simply can't be any better than the rotten, selfish, miserable, diseased minds who live in it, can it? Did you think it could? I suppose I should have known better, but I believe, because I wanted to believe, that the honest and the earnest and the true would be a force against evil so great and so unyielding that goodness and happiness and peace would sometime flood the earth. Perhaps sometime it will. Hmm. But not in our lifetime. No. Not in the lifetime of my brother's children or my sister's children. What about you? Did you purposely have no children of your own because you envisioned what lay ahead? No. No, you did not see ahead? No, it was simply the girl who I wanted to give me those children 
died in that first world holocaust. The first world war? Yeah. I had never heard. I was an American flyer in France. She was an American army nurse. We met in a frontline hospital. We were married by an old French priest in a little church whose roof had been blown off by a German field piece. Two weeks later, an epidemic swept through the hospital like a fire in a grass field. She was gone before you hardly knew her. Ah, what kind of talk is this for New Year's Eve? That is hard. Very hard. But at least you did not have to watch the one you loved stood up against a wall before a firing squad. Nicolette. Nicolette. That too is finished. Oh, visitors. Richardson, come in. Queer. I'll go and see. Oh, what is it? What is it? Just a minute, Paul. I'll be right back in. What's that about? <sighs> New Year's Eve, 47. Hmm. 1917. 30 years ago. 30? Hmm. And in those years, I've seen with my own eyes the whole continent explode. The civilization crumbling around the edges. I've seen... Here, give me a piece of paper. A pencil. Oh. This is the voice of Europe. And his voice was the voice of Europe. And his words came and said... Today, right now, before New Year's, you get improved Chase and Sanborn coffee. This new blend is the most satisfying coffee you ever tasted, so taste it. Taste it now. You'll hear it being praised to the skies. One man said that first swallow is like getting money from home. Or you may hear experienced shoppers say, the new Chase and Sanborn is the richest, most flavorful coffee money can buy today. What they're all really saying is, taste it. That's the only way you'll ever know how delicious this new blend is. The possibilities of finer coffees are only now fully realized. It's a new coffee experience, an inspired new combination of richer, more flavorful coffees. And the flavor is fully protected at its best and freshest. The new Chase and Sanborn, with all its added flavor, is quickly vacuum-packed as soon as it's roasted. No other container in the world can give you so much coffee goodness. So, taste it. Ask for improved Chase and Sanborn, the new coffee sensation. <laughs> While Paul sat in the jungle hideout, writing feverishly and waiting Nicolette Moore's return, back in Seacliff, San Francisco, it's also New Year's Eve. Over at Jack and Betty's house, just across the hedge, those two are holding special open house for the younger generation. Joan and Penny and Skippy are there from the Nicholas Lacey household, Hank, Pinky, and Margaret from the Daniel Murray menage, and then the special adolescent friends of the neighborhood. That's what's going on across the hedge, while at the family home, all the adults are present. Yes, even the cousins are dying. <laughs> I, I think it was New Year's Eve of 90... 97, Henry. Huh? You are on my father's farm, the New Year's of 97. I was at Norm, Alaska at 97. <laughs> well, there, Fanny and I were out in the cow pasture, with no gate in sight anywhere. Well, maybe it was 98. And how you do hate cows, uh, Well, I said to your mother, I'll do the brave thing. I'll walk behind you and protect you from the rear. Oh, <laughs> that was 98, all right. <laughs> Coldest 98 in the memory of man. Well, that was the manly thing to do, Dad. Always protect the lady from the rear. <laughs> but what about the danger from ahead? Huh? She's got eyes to see what lies ahead. It's the rear that's open to animals. <laughs> uh, that's the coldest 98 in the memory of man. Well, fortunately, I'm not afraid of cows myself. Uh, I'm not afraid of cows. Well, not exactly afraid. It's, it's just that cows and I are not compatible. <laughs> not many cows in Alaska. Huh? Not many cows in Alaska. Too cold. Oh, so there are thousands of cattle in Alaska. Too cold. They freeze. <laughs> But go on with your bucolic New Year's Eve saga of 97, Father Paul. <laughs> We'd simply gone for a walk on Fanny's home farm, and here we were, completely surrounded by a five-foot barbed wire fence, 
in a cow pasture. <laughs> the first time I ever saw Henry unnerved. Oh, just on my toes, alert to danger. <laughs> but at that moment, there wasn't even a cow in sight. Cow's pretty solid. Well, that's Alaska for you. Not a cow in sight, and yet you burst into a sweat. Sweat <laughs> freezes? Yeah, only the palms of my hands. Palms of your hands freezes? <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about, Cousin Josiah? <laughs> Alaska. But Dad and Mom are talking about an experience with cows. Cows freeze solid. <laughs> <laughs> Not cows in Alaska, Cousin Josiah. Mm. Hardly any cows in Alaska. Too cold. Oh. Stuff and nonsense. Hardly a cow in Alaska. <laughs> You'd be surprised, Cousin Jediah. Nicky and I took a trip up there one time, and we saw oodles of cattle. Let's see, uh, you're Claudia uh, Margaret. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I still want to hear the end of Dad and Mom's adventure with the cows. Forget it. Oh, hey, Dad. Forget no. it. It isn't worthwhile trying to compete against a certain windbag I could mention. Well, lots of wind in Alaska. <laughs> lots of wind. There's lots of wind a good deal closer to Alaska. <laughs> now, Henry, don't get grumpy. Yeah. Yes, don't get grumpy, Hank. Huh? Nice man like you should never get grumpy. No, become you. Is that so? Mighty feel well improved by a case of the grumps. <laughs> Brother Barber, not to change the subject, but... I don't know when I've seen a more beautiful buffet table. Mm, thank you, Nicholas. Sumptuous fair, rare viands. Oh, nonsense, Nicholas. Just a good, healthy snack for around midnight. I insist. Rare and juicy delicacies. A gourmet's delight and a gourmand's excellence. Oh, <laughs> Nicky, you're wonderful. Claudia Margaret, what's the man talking about? Hey, just plain Claudia, cousin Jediah. <laughs> Dangerous using big words like that. Oh, really? I know the man wants to got a big word caught in his windpipe. Oh, uh, little. Got a big word caught in his windpipe. Uh, larynx or epiglottis? <laughs> well, laughing matter, the poor fellow choked to death. <laughs> Didn't they call a doctor? What good's a doctor? <laughs> well, if I had anything caught in my throat, I'd want a physician. What good's a physician? <laughs> oh, no. What good's a surgeon? <laughs> I see your point, cousin Jediah. The only person who could extract a big word caught in your throat... Would be a lexicographer, naturally. Naturally, but what was that again, Nicholas? <laughs> lexicographer. Lexicographer. <laughs> Coldest 48 in Alaska in the memory of man. Uh, oh, there you are, Dan. Where have you been? I'm not getting a smell of this New Year's Eve. I'm getting one last look at 1947, huh? Yeah, that's right. Don't father 47 is turning over a beautiful night, the young 48. 48 for coldest hey, year. Hey, wait a minute. You're speaking to me, Clipper? 98, not 48. <laughs> coldest year in Alaska in the memory of man. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell me on the subject of Alaska again, Cousin Jediah. Coldest cousin year. Cousin Jediah, I've got a question. Gladly, gladly. Let's you and me go out and get one last sniff of the old year before it's too late. Gladly, gladly. Okay, come on. You mean get up out of this chair? <laughs> oh, sure, you don't expect to feel the cold air on your cheek and look up at the glitter of stars from in front of the fire, do you? You know, Fanny, you should have a rocking chair in this room. <laughs> you think so? A rocking chair does something for a person. Well, are you coming with me or aren't you? Gladly, gladly. Well, I'm on my feet. Come on. Thank you. You should ought to have Fanny put in a rocking chair. <laughs> oh, you're an old lord. You had no intention of going out and making a last wish on the stars for 47. <laughs> Nicky, come on, you come. Brother, with pleasure. What are you folks in a little while? Just working up an appetite with the father. Fanny, Claudia Margaret's a young girl. <laughs> What's that? Claudia Margaret's a young girl. <laughs> Dangerous to let a young girl out of your sight in the garden on a cold night. <laughs> <laughs> Dangerous. <laughs> well, it doesn't well much. <laughs> Cousin Jediah on women's clothes. First thing, she gets cold. Shivers. <laughs> Man puts his arm around her. Huh? What are you talking about? Man puts his arm around her, warms her up a little. <laughs> <laughs> One thing leads to another, and the next thing you know, she's married. Claudia is already married. Next thing you know, you've lost a daughter. Didn't you hear me say that, Claudia? Next you... thing you know, you're a grandfather. I already am. Ten times over. <laughs> Where are you going, Cousin Jediah? Dangerous out in the garden on a cold night. Claudia Margaret's a young girl. Don't you realize... Let him go, Father Barber. <laughs> That's wonderful. Going out to protect Claudia from her husband. Sometimes he doesn't show enough sense to pound sand in her at all. Oh, he's intelligent enough. It's just that he doesn't listen. Yeah, he's so absorbed in his own thoughts, he never hears what anyone else said. Unless he's not supposed to hear. Oh, have you had that experience? I'm afraid we have. Your father was talking to Judge Hunter on the phone about some minor change in his will... 
And Jediah didn't miss the word. <laughs> well, well, rid of him for a moment. Do we have to spend the precious minutes talking about him? Oh, well, uh, while I was outside, I could see and hear across the heads of Jack and Betty's. Is that place bouncing? Mm, what's the younger generation up to? Oh, some of everything. I could see Margaret and some of the smaller fry in the kitchen pulling taffy. Oh, so Betty finally decided on a taffy pull. Uh-huh. The front of the house, the door suddenly popped open, and out came a young lady full tilt with pinky hard on her heels. Oh, Dan, not a rough house. Oh, I don't think so. I lost him in the shadow of the hedge, but I think it was more like an excuse for getting out from under Jack and Betty's eyes for a quick smooth. Hmm. Oh. Hey, if, if only Cousin Jediah realized what was going on next door. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know whether I'm amused or not. I'm a typical mother. Oh, relax, Hazel. Lasted only for a count of ten, and then they dashed back into the house. Sure, pretending all the time it was a chase, and Pinky never caught up with his delicious prey. Uh, <laughs> it's been going on since Adam and Eve. <laughs> <laughs> well, Henry, when did you all of a sudden become so sad? Huh? <laughs> boy chase girl. Girl slow down so boy will be sure to catch up. Girl pretends struggle at being caught. Girl pretends helpless surrender. But girl responsible for whole sad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. Such cynicism on New Year's Eve. Speaking of New Year's Eve, I wonder what Paul's doing tonight. I wonder. He's in some far off place in the world, I believe. Uh, we have no real reason to think so. Oh, I think we have, Father Barber. What do you mean, uh, Daniel? Well, last week's cablegram indicated he was across an ocean. Also, the fact that it was strictly censored indicates it's from out of the country. Yes, yes, I suppose so. Did I tell you that I received a letter from Teddy and a New Year's card from Beth Holly? Beth Holly? For goodness sake. How long has it been since we heard from her? Well, she said three years in her card. Oh, longer than that. Beth Holly. Where is she? Down in Hollywood. Doing very well in some capacity with one of the picture studios. Oh, an actress? Well, she didn't say. Would you say I had a letter from Teddy? Yes, it was really to Henry. Huh. I was wondering if you were going to take all the credit. <laughs> <laughs> all right, my dear. You tell what she said. Does that she wish you were back in the United States and that it wasn't going to be much of a Christmas or New Year's in Germany? Oh, she said much more than that. Yeah, oh, she said it wasn't going to be much of a holiday season in any of the European countries. Well, aren't you going to tell about her being made ward superintendent in the hospital? Yeah, yeah. And that one of the young nurses, a Patricia somebody, had an emergency appendectomy and was sent home, and she disappeared on the way home. Well, just gossip. We, we didn't know the girl. A uh, Patricia... Baldwin, that was it. You, um, you mean an American nurse just vanished on her way home from Germany? Well, Teddy didn't seem to know any details. But how wonderful for her to have been made a superintendent. Mm, glad we got all those packages off before Christmas. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, what's happened to Cody and Nikki? <laughs> Family, do you know what just happened to Nikki and me out in the car? Uh, cousin Jediah. <laughs> He caught me with my arm around Claude. He kicked me away and he shook his fingers under my nose. He said, young fella, just what I expected. Claudia Marbert's a virtuous young girl. And if she's cold, let her come in the house and back up to the fire. <laughs> yes, yes, one of these days, somebody's going to have to invite him to keep his nose out of other people's ears. <laughs> well, did you finally get over the idea that you were Claudia's husband and father of her children? Well, we, we told him, sir, but he was so busy telling us about how arms are the waste led to one thing and another, and in the end we'd end up not only parents, but grandparents. <laughs> oh, here he comes now. Yeah, I caught him just like I thought I would. I caught him in the very end. <laughs> Josiah, listen to me. Gladly, gladly. Claudia and Nicholas are married. They are man and wife. No. Man <laughs> and wife. No. <laughs> Cousin Jessica, what's that telegram in your hand? The what? This telegram. Oh, it's not. It, it's a cablegram. Mm, a New Year's message from Paul. Found it on the doorstep. Let's see. It's to the whole family. Dear mother and dad and family, the world doesn't know nor care that a new year is being born here where I am. I know you're all gathered as usual, and my spirit's with you. Love to you all. From your brother and son, if it ever gets through the censors, Paul Barber. For it is unto you that we turn. Blessed be America forever and ever. And may her freedom become our freedom in the days to come. Paul, something is going to happen tonight. Oh, you are writing a letter? No, not a letter. What do you mean something's going to happen? Wait. Dear, 
I think we are being put on the trail of Patricia Baldwin. That's great. First day out of bed. Yes, I do not know exactly. You will have to be transported for a day or two, naturally. I don't know exactly what is happening. But Richardson said to come back here, and I think he said, be prepared. <laughs> Sounds like a boy scout got loose in our midst. <laughs> here, what is that paper you have written if it is not a letter? Look at it if you like. I was just sitting here thinking. But Paul... This is poetry. Is it? But yes, of course. Please, I may read it. Why not? Yes. And his voice was an European voice. And his words came saying, How is our glory become dim? How is glory and honor and tradition changed? The stones and the mortar of our very homes are poured out into every street. The precious sons of Europe, comparable to goodness and truth, how were they esteemed as our today and our tomorrow? The work of the hands of the Creator. How are they broken and ground beneath the heel? And woe are the daughters of Europe, once so fair to look upon. Woe are they for now their skin cleaveth to their bones. It is withered. They are become like unto a stick. They that did feed delicately are desolate in the streets. They that were brought up in scarlet embrace bitterness and filth. They that be slain with the sword are better than they that be slain with hunger. For the sins of their leaders and their politicians and the iniquities of their traitors have shed the blood of the just in the midst of all Europe. Remember, O oh America, what has come unto us. Consider and behold our reproach. Our inheritance is turned to strangers our houses to aliens. We are orphans and fatherless. Our mothers are as widows. Our great men have sinned and are not. And we have borne their iniquities. Violence rules over us. There is none that doth deliver us out of its hands. We get our bread with the peril of our lives. Because there is too little for too many. The women of Europe are despoiled. And the maidens in the cities of all our fallen countries. The young men have fallen low in dishonor and in shame. And the children are trampled beneath the wheels of despair. Our elders have ceased their praying. And our youth. They are hoping. The joy of their hearts is ceased. Their dancing is turned into mourning. For this our heart is faint. For these things our eyes are dim. You, O oh America, remainest as ever. Thy freedom from generation to generation. Wherefore dost thou forget us forever and forsake us so long a time? Turn thou unto us, O America, and we shall be saved. Renew our days as of old. Yea, for it is unto you that we turn. Blessed be America forever and ever. And may her freedom become our freedom in the days to come. Blessed be America forever and ever. Well? You sat here and wrote this in those few minutes I left you. With the help of lamentations, of course. Oh, I do not know it. I was sitting here a long way from home thinking of America and things that reminded me of home. 
I knew quite a lot about lamentations and the psalms, among others, at one time. I don't know from where you got your inspiration, but you have made Europe talk from the heart with these lines. You read them from the heart. I'd forgotten what a good platform speaker you were before you got there. There. That is it. That's what? I will see. Oh, you came quickly. Who is it, Nicolette? The secret airplane to where? In Istanbul? Paul, he says a secret airplane to Istanbul is ready. Is Patricia Baldwin in the capital of Turkey? They promise to point our faces in the right direction. Istanbul points toward Europe. Yeah, and a certain iron curtain. This week, Clifford produces a book of horoscopes. This is old Dr. Barber's Prognostications Almanac, 1948 edition. Here, here. Uh, I must say, it looks like a big year for the Sagittarius people, with Scorpio and Leo coming in for a big chunk of good fortune, too. Wonderful. When is this slather of riches due to be formed? No, <laughs> but start tonight. Certainly no later than tomorrow. Well, what about Pisces? Pisces, Pisces. Here it is, Pisces. You are going to receive the surprise of your life. When you taste the new Chase and Sanborn coffee, <laughs> it's so greatly improved that it's the most satisfying coffee you ever tasted. Well, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. Wonderful. Yeah, I say that's the most accurate horoscope I've ever heard. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, now let's take Taurus, Cancer, and Gemini. Um, you are from Missouri. You have to be shown. You invented the phrase, the proof of the pudding. Big pardon, the proof of the flavor in this new blend is the tasting thereof. So taste Chase and Sanborn now. <laughs> like Capricornus and Aquarius people excluded from this new coffee experience? Oh, not by a long shot. Why, Capricornus tells Aquarius, the new Chase and Sanborn is the richest, most flavorful coffee money can buy. Hey, hey, oh, Libra and Irish people say, taste it, taste it now. I do, I think I shall. Will you join me, Pisces, Leo, Gemini? Yes, sir. Yes. <laughs> There's a big new flavor thrill for everybody in the new improved Chase and Sanborn. It's coffee 1948 here right now. Taste it. You get more flavor from finer coffees at its best and freshest in the vacuum pack. It's something new in your coffee cup, so don't miss out. Ask your grocer for Chase and Sanborn, the amazing new coffee sensation. You've just heard Chapter 14, Book 64 of One Man's Family, written and produced under the direction of Carlton E. Morse for the makers of Chase and Sanborn Coffee and Fleischmann's Yeast. The opening chapter of Book 65, entitled The Dying Fires of Europe, will come to you next week at this same hour. What's new on the bed plate for 1948? Well, we all like a change. Sweet rolls today, Parker House rolls tomorrow, coffee ring for breakfast, delicious dessert bread for dinner. If you bake at home, use Fleischmann's yeast for an almost endless variety of good things, and every bite delicious. Fleischmann's yeast is nature's own little wonder worker. It transforms dough into food, brings it to life, gives it tempting, tasty, appetite appeal. Yes, Fleischmann's yeast glorifies all the other ingredients, brings out their flavor, gives you home baking results you can always be proud of. Use Fleischmann's yeast as your right-hand helper in the daily task of pleasing the family. Get that sincerest of all compliments, the call for another roll, another bun, all around the table. You can depend upon Fleischmann's every time for fast, sure-rising action, for lightness, even texture, and delicious flavor in everything you bake. Always ask your grocer for Fleischmann's yeast, the favorite for 80 years. One Man's Family comes to you from California. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. It's 
raining again. Pretty near New Year's, and it's raining again. Back east, it's probably snowing different places. Or maybe the moon's out, shining on the snow, and people are saying, why, it's so bright out you can read a newspaper. And they can't read a newspaper by moonlight, only the headlines. Maybe if you take your newspaper out in the yard and stand in the moonlight, you might find a headline with my name in it. It's been there before. Well, anyway, so there's moonlight. Here, there's rain. Like it was that other New Year's Eve. That's what the rain makes me think of. As if I ever thought of anything else. Listen to the rain. I was sitting in my office in the writer's court out there after we'd been on the picture for two or three months. Writing it, that is. They'd been shooting for about three weeks, but I was still on the picture because we had a producer that couldn't make up his mind, and the director was one of those guys, uh, sort of road company Hitchcock, you know. He makes the picture up as he goes along. Only there has to be a writer filed away someplace where he can find him when he runs out of ideas, which is not more than 11 times a day. So I'm dying. I go on the set and I find actors there I never heard of, speaking lines I never wrote in scenes I couldn't figure out. Then the director would get me in a corner and put the arm on me. This thing doesn't seem to quite gel, old man. You know? And me and my little typewriter go to work to unscrew things while the overtime and the gin rummy games go right on. <laughs> Great life, that. Well, so I'm sitting in my office and the rain is on the roof and the gas heater is frying my ankles while the draft from the window is giving my neck the deep freeze. Mary Lou, my secretary, comes in from her little cubbyhole next to mine. When do I get to do my Christmas shopping, Mr. Randall? You don't get to do your Christmas shopping, Mary Lou. Yes, I know. I didn't. What? Christmas was two days ago, Mr. Ramsey. Was it? Well, Merry Christmas. Are we ever going to finish this picture, for heaven's sake? Well, I'll tell you, Angel. Mr. Doty, the great director, is getting $3,500 a week. I know it. And, my dear... Mr. Doty has not got $3,500 a week for a long, long time, see? Uh -huh. So, Mr. Doty, the great director, is going to make $3,500 a week just as long as he possibly can, and characters like us can, you know what. That man. I have a different word for him, sweetheart. But as I was saying, if we leave it to Mr. Doty, this here picture ain't never going to be finished. A hundred years from now, somebody will come upstairs here and they'll find an old, old man with a long white beard speeding out the 59th revision of scene 456 and in the next room a little apple-cheeked old lady. Oh, cut it out. Yeah. Oh, when are they going to finish it? No kidding. New Year's Eve. Well, maybe there'll be champagne and stuff on the set. Yeah, no doubt. For the expensive actors and the producers and the fine, upstanding director. For you and me, a nice bottle of 60-cent claret imported from right over there on Ventura Boulevard. You're so funny. Mm, on the contrary. Well, I'm getting awful sick of this, Mr. Ramsey. We've had to work every single night for the last four weeks. Do you realize that? You kidding? Do I realize? Go get me some coffee, will you, kid? I gotta stay awake for Mr. Doty. Coffee? I bet you and I could be elected president of Brazil all the coffee we've put away. Answer the phone. It's Doty. Well, we've got to be dignified. Oh, Lord. Mr. Ramsey's office. Who's calling, please? Oh, yes, Mr. Doty. He's here. I'm always here. Ramsey. Yes, Mr. Doty. What seems to be the trouble? I see. Yes, I see, but Mr. Doty, I... Well, well, that'll mean rewriting practically all the... Well, yes, I know, I mean... But what do you gain that way? What? Two monsters? Well, what's two monsters got that one monster hasn't? Oh, yeah, sure, but who scares who? Uh, whom, I mean. But, Mr. Doty, I saw a picture once with two monsters in it, and it was silly. What? Oh, you directed it. Uh, well, uh, well, well, I'll be right over. Skip the coffee, Mary Lou. Two monsters. Two. Count them two. 
And I'll lay you six, two, and even that by the time I get to the stage, you'll be hollering for three. Take your raincoat. It's raining pitchforks. Maybe one of them will stab me. I better tell you about this monster stuff. Uh, this was a horror picture, you see. Kind of the poor man's Frankenstein. Yeah, they couldn't get Karloff, naturally, and they couldn't use the Frankenstein monster makeup because Jack Pierce over at Universal invented that. I guess Universal owned it. So they had me dream up a monster. And boy, did I dream one up. There's an old book. It's called... No, I guess I won't tell you what it's called. Well, you don't want to take those old books too seriously. So I kind of swiped this monster out of the book. Well, you'll never see the picture, I suppose, so maybe I'd better tell you a little about him. No, I guess I won't either. He was... He was the most horrible monster I ever saw. No kidding. And what the makeup department did with my sketch and my description. Oh, boy. Just one thing I'll tell you about him, and you can figure out the rest for yourself. He didn't have any face. You take it from there. But don't kid yourself. He was a thing. They got Ollie Tharp to play the goon. Nice fella, quiet, always grinning, modest. Good actor. Last guy in the world you'd expect to play a monster. Oh, yeah, sure. Karloff did the Frankenstein thing, and he's the mildest-mannered guy in the world. I remember him on the Son of Frankenstein set years ago in his monster suit all gray and green, showing pictures of his new baby to people. <laughs> I had to laugh. Well, I, I guess monsters are human sometimes, huh? Yeah, maybe humans are... Yeah. Well, all right. I spend three hours listening to Mr. Doty run off at the mouth with the whole company having the screaming memes over all this nonsense. It's five minutes to twelve when he finally decides to quit and everybody goes home. They're all burned at Doty, but you know, they'll wake up in the morning, remember the overtime, and they'll feel better. Me? Writers don't get overtime. So I get back to the writer's court and the light's burning in the window and Mary Lou is snoring away with her face in a stack of carbon paper. She wakes up and asks me a question. How many monsters now? We got four now. Let's see. Including me. So the next morning it's not raining anymore. The sun is shining bright. And you can see snow on top of the mountains, and it's a very nice day. And monsters are pretty hazy in my mind as I pick up my copy of the reporter and head for the rickety stairway to my palatial office. I'll tell you how much good the sunshine did me. I was whistling as I climbed up the stairs and opened the door. You might as well turn off the whistle. Mr. Doty's looking for you. And now what? He says it's very important. Yeah, two more monsters. Your coffee's on your desk. Steaming cold, no doubt. I just brought it up. Give me 15 cents. Well, now, it's your turn to buy this morning. I bought yesterday. All right, all right. Hello, no, he isn't here yet. Ah, go ahead. Mr. Ramsey's office. Yes, Mr. Doty. Morning, Mr. Doty. How are you? Oh? No kidding. Why, that's fun. What? Oh, of course. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, sure. What's up? Why, sure, Mr. Doty. Yes, sir, I'll be right over. What? He has to finish the picture definitely by 12 midnight, December 31st. Oh, that's what you said last night. Well, I was kidding. You know how it goes in the story. I forgot. Well, I mean the way it was originally. You know, this this monster only has power the last hour of the year. Oh, yes. Remember, it was a New Year's party, the whole picture. It's been so long ago, I forgot how we started. Well, don't you remember our big payoff scene? She thinks the monster is her wicked uncle. Who thinks? You know, the babe with the teeth. The groom girl with a blue dress. Oh, yes. Remember, she, she thinks the monster is her uncle and she tries to rip his mask off and it ain't a mask? Something like that. And the that. house is on fire and he grabs her and runs inside the house and our hero busts in after her and rescues her... 
some way I never had a chance to figure out. But how would he do it without his glasses? He'd fall over the stoop. What stoop? There's hundreds of them in pictures. Drink your coffee and go see Mr. Doty. Maybe he's changed his mind. I can't change his mind. The front office put the big fat arm on him, or else. <laughs> Whoopie, baby, three days and we can sit down and rest. Away from this place. You can say that again. Tell him I ain't here. Well, sir, that sunshine looked better than ever to me. But when the big door of the stage swung shut behind me, the sunshine sure disappeared. Well, Mr. Doty was an unhappy man. Well, three more days and there wouldn't be any more of those $3,500 is. And he didn't like it a little bit. And guess who he took it out on? This is the worst story I ever had to work with. It positively smells bad. I didn't say it's your story, Mr. Doty. All I got left is a monster, and you probably turn out to be Santa Claus or somebody. Did you listen to me when I told you how to do it? I didn't say. I listened to you, Mr. Doty, and now look what we got. Now I have to give up my beautiful idea of having three monsters instead of one. Because then we'd have had to reshoot practically the whole picture, and you'd have made another million bucks. I didn't say that either. So, if you think you could possibly dredge up your original script, I think I can possibly make it into an acceptable B picture. Although that's a task even for a director like me. Mr. Doty doesn't realize what an unconscious humorist he is. That guy could make a B picture out of the signing of the Declaration of Independence, even if he had the original cast. So get to work. Get to work and do something. Have I got to do everything around here? Get a move on you. Oh, I got a move on me. Even if you think I dislike that guy up to now. What? You got to be the last two days. You've got to get some sleep somehow. You've been on your feet for almost two days, Mr. Ramsey. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, where were we? Scene 168. Long shot interior match and night. From the top of the stairway, I see up here, fingers sink in the shadows. We sense, rather than see, the twisted evil form of the monster as he peers over the balustrade. From the foreground right, the butler peers and stops slowly up the stairway. As he reaches the fourth or fifth step, the camera starts to move in to follow him. We cram up the stairs and the camera holds on the last three steps as the butler reaches the top. Cut to... Hey, wake up! Oh, oh, oh. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Where were we? Ramsey, you've got to get some sleep. Lie down for ten minutes. Yeah, I'd sure like to. Mr. Ramsey's off. I'm not here. Yes, Mr. Doty. All right. All right, all right. Hello? Yes? Sure. I'll be right over. Oh, Mr. Ramsey, I was... You know what, Mary Lou? Well, put on your coat. It's raining again. You know what? What? I wish I was a monster. You know, I was a tired little fellow. I didn't have any Thanksgiving. I ate a bent ham sandwich in my office that day because Mr. Doty had to have three new scenes Friday morning. He called me at the office to see how I was doing. He just finished his Thanksgiving dinner. I didn't have any Christmas. I locked the door of my office and baked my brains out on a whole new sequence Mr. Doty had thought up. All around me, people were drinking whiskey and chasing each other through the corridors and up and down the stairs. I didn't have any Sundays, and I didn't have any evenings. I, my friend, damn near lost my mind. All the time, Mr. Doty. Wow. That's no wonder that by New Year's Eve I was ready to hire a man with a cleaver to extirpate the guy. But I didn't. Nope, I sure didn't. At nine o'clock he called me over to the set again. Could I rewrite some dialogue? <laughs> well, I crossed him up on that one. I threw out the hash he'd made of my original dialogue and substituted what I'd originally written. It played okay. After seven different takes, all exactly alike. I went back to my office in the rain. Mr. Ramsey's office. Yes, Mr. Doty. 
Yes, Mr. Doty. I'll tell him. Mr. Ramsey. I heard you. He needs you right away again. Okay, okay. You poor thing. Only another couple hours. Hope I can take it. Take your raincoat. It's raining cats and dogs. You're telling me. That time it was a little piece of action he couldn't get through his ivory head. I explained it in words of one syllable, carefully avoiding the four-letter ones. He thanked me, old boy. And I went out into the rain again. Rain. What rain in California can do to you? I heard of a fellow that jumped into the Los Angeles River once after a week of rain. Ordinarily, he'd break his ankle, but he drowned. You know, it just comes down steadily. Well, I know I could probably be a lot more graphic than that, but that's all there is to rain in California. It comes down steadily. Ice cold. Steadily. Yeah. Of course, it always stops about the time you've decided to start out on foot for the east. The sun shines and poinsettias bloom and the hills are green. Oh, man, that's wonderful. I guess they have the rain like hitting yourself on the head with a hammer. It feels so good when you stop. Yeah, that's a bum gag, but I was a pretty beat-up character. Three more times that New Year's Eve in the rain. The guy getting meaner and meaner each time. Well, at least it was going to be over pretty soon. It was ten minutes to eleven when I came into the office and Mary Lou took my coat from me. You've just got to get a little sleep, Ramsey. Now, you sit down at your desk and put your head down and catch 40 winks. Oh, thanks, Mary Lou. Oh, if I had to see that man just one more time tonight, I would be responsible. I'm not kidding. I know. You go to sleep. The kid, you're as all in as I am. Well, at least I don't have to face him. He's got to stop at midnight. As soon as he's through, should you and me go someplace and have a New Year's drink? I, I don't know whether I could keep awake. Well, let's try, huh? Okay. <laughs> Anybody ever tell you you're a nice gal? Couple of people. <laughs> I could marry a gal like you. Don't kid people, Ramsey. I'm not. See how you feel when you wake up. I think I love you. I wish you meant that, Ramsey. I do. Kiss her from your night. Ramsey, you're sweet. Kiss me your night. Oh. Uh, go to sleep. So I went to sleep. So I went to sleep. And I dreamed. Even when I was asleep, I couldn't get that guy Doty off my mind. I dreamed I was on the set. I dreamed they were shooting the last scene, the one where the monster comes closer and closer to the camera till that head of his without any face fills the whole screen. You know how it is in dreams. You're here. And then all of a sudden you're there, and you're one guy, and then you're another, and it's all mixed up. Yeah. I could see the set, and I could hear Doty call out. What? Run. Exit. Then I could see this faceless monster coming out of the shadows. Slowly slowly right up to the camera where George Robinson was standing, as tired as everybody else. Then I thought to myself, if the audience had any idea that little old milk toast Ali Tharp was inside that monster rig, they'd bust. Then in the dream, I saw Doty jumping up and down in one of those silly rages of his, and he yelled, Come on! Come on! Get back there and fly over! You've got about as much minutes as... as, as much minutes as... started all over again. My dream got kind of mixed up all right there, and, and I sort of seemed to be following the monster, because I could see Doty's face right in front of me as the monster moved in. When Doty yelled, cut again, the monster and I didn't stop. 
I just sort of seemed to follow him right on, farther and farther. I saw the monster's big, hairy hands grab Dodie. And Dodie screamed. And the monster's hands were fumbling at Dodie's neck. Dodie was fighting, and I saw Dodie bite the monster's hand. It was so real, I could almost feel it. And then everything got black in my dream, and there were a lot of a lot of bells ringing, and well, that's what woke me up. So I raised my head, and of course, there I was in my office. And I pulled myself up, out of it a little, and then I knew what the bells were. They were bells ringing in the new year. The rain was hammering on the roof, and it was tomorrow. So I got up and hollered for Mary Lou. Mary Lou! Hey, Happy New Year, Mary Lou! And she didn't answer. I stepped through the door into her little office. And she was lying on the floor behind her desk. And the look on her face was something I never want to see again. It was a look of the most awful horror anybody could imagine. The kind of look you'd expect to see on the face of someone who'd been literally frightened to death by a monster who had no face at all. So I stood there. After a few seconds, I heard people yelling outside, and I heard somebody yell that Holly Thorpe had killed Dodie. Somebody else said, no, Holly Thorpe was dead, too, with a broken neck in his dressing room. And my hand hurt. When I raised my hand to look at it, right across the thick of my palm were teeth marks. Deep, bloody teeth marks where Dodie had bit me when I strangled him. So you see, that's why I say never take any of those old books too seriously. Remember I said I wished I was a monster? Remember what the book said? The monster only possessed his murderous power for one hour, the last hour of the year. New Year's Eve again. And it's raining. You got anybody you want murdered? You'll have listened to Quiet, Please, which is written and directed by Willis Cooper. The man who spoke to you was Ernest Chappell. And Muriel Kirkland was Mary Lou. Pat O'Malley was Doty. Music for Quiet, Please is composed and played by Albert Berman. Now, for a word about next week's Quiet, Please, here is our writer-director, my good friend, Willis Cooper. I have a story for you next week about a man who was haunted. It's called The Little Visitor. And so, until next week at this time... I am quietly yours, Ernest Chappell. Quiet, please, comes to you from New York. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Suspense. In these last hours of my life, I wonder, how will I be remembered? I think of what Engels said when Karl Marx died. With his death, mankind is shorter by a head. I wonder what will be said of me. It is through his books that Marx is remembered, while I, I have been a man of action, not of words. So will I be forgotten, or worse still, Will I be remembered only in the writings of bourgeois journalists who already have distorted my motives and minimized my importance in the revolutionary movement? Especially in regard to the action I undertook in St. Basil's Cathedral on the eve of the new year. It is only Olga Karolska they write about, vastly exaggerating the role she played. Olga Karolska. Why, she was a political ignoramus, a victim of every bourgeois superstition. She was nothing, a zero, a puppet controlled by me. Olga believed that she was in love with me. I encouraged her in that illusion. 
She might prove valuable to me since she worked as a servant in the household of Prince Ogares. On Sundays, when she was allowed a few hours for herself, she invariably came to spend the time with me in uh, my room near the university. Boris. Boris, it's nearly dark. Oh, you're leaving? Make sure the door is latched. There is a draft up those stairs. Is that all you have to say? No goodbye. Nothing. You're like a stone. I would prefer steel. Sometimes I think I should stop coming here to see you. Perhaps you should. Boris. If I didn't come, what would you do? Well, I would read the newspapers from Geneva a day earlier. What if it was because I loved someone else? You think I would be jealous? You take me for granted. Just as Prince Ogilvy took his wife for granted. Now, have they quarreled again? Has she locked him out of her room again? Worse, she's left him this time. I thought she was only spending a few days at court. Oh, it would be more than a few days. She's madly in love with the Tsar, and he was her. On Wednesday, she sent for her clothes and jewels and sent a letter to Prince Ogareff. If only you could have seen his face when he read it. <laughs> his valuable property stole by the Tsar. Oh, what a dilemma. He can't even complain to the police. No, Boris. He loves his wife. Just as he loves his horses and his serfs. And oh, you just... wouldn't say that if you saw how he looked. Or if you heard him. Calling on God to bring her back to him. Threatening to kill the Tsar. When did he do that? He was pacing up and down, muttering to himself. I overheard him. He really meant it. I'm sure of that. What makes you think so? Well, yesterday when I was just in his study, he said some strange things to me. He talked about the Tsar's father. About how he'd been assassinated. He said he thought the terrorists who killed him were very brave men. I didn't answer, though. He seemed to expect me to. I was afraid he'd heard that my uncle was one of the terrorists. Of course. He was trying to make contact with our organization through you. Why didn't you speak up? I was afraid. And besides, what good would it do? That's not up to you. Now listen. This week, the first moment you are alone with the prince, tell him about your uncle. And tell him you know someone he might like to meet. Who? A nihilist. And a member of the executive committee. Me. No, oh, boy could be dangerous for you. Possibly, but uh, without danger, the game grows cold. You understand? I want you to bring him here. No, no, I won't. Oh, what were you saying a few moments ago, Olga? That you should stop coming here to see me? You know I didn't mean it. Maybe you did. Because you aren't going to come here anymore, Olga, <laughs> unless you bring Prince Ogarev with you next Sunday. <laughs> During the week, I began to devise a plan. A simple, daring plan which would mean glory for me and an end of tyranny in Russia. On Sunday, I waited impatiently. It was mid-afternoon before they arrived. Boris, this is Prince Olga. How do you do? How do you do? Come in, Excellency. Olga, I think the Prince would prefer to talk to me privately. Yes, I suppose so. May I come back a little later, Boris? If you like. Uh, come in, Excellency. Thank you. Olga said that you wanted to meet me. And to meet you, Prince Ogarev, a man has only to express the wish to one of your servants. Come now, you are here because you wanted to meet me. I assure you, I've never heard your name until... There is no need to waste time. You are here because you and I desire the same end. End? We both want to kill the Tsar. Oh, no, no. You don't want to kill the Tsar? Then we have nothing to talk about. Oh, no. I do want to kill him. Excellent. Maybe we can join forces. But first, I would uh, like to understand you better. For instance, why do you want to kill the Tsar? For the same reason as you. For Russia. For the Russian people. To free them from his tyranny. Ah, yes. And uh, you have great love for the Russian people, of course. And uh, you have thought about this? You have a plan? Uh, no, not really. You see, I thought so that, that you... I uh, maybe have more experience. Yes. yes. That's true enough. But still, you must have considered where and when, if not how, and by whom. I only know it won't be easy. He's always a heavy guard. Yes, our beloved Tsar, our little father... 
who fears his people so much he never lets them see him because of what happened to his father. He has a terror of assassination. And well, he should. Now, since you have come here without a plan, let me tell you mine. A plan to kill not only the Tsar, but his entire court. The scream of the aristocracy with one blow. How? In St. Basil's Cathedral, on the eve of the New Year. Oh, no. The cathedral is cleared for the midnight mass. No common people are allowed inside, only members of the court. I am told that the Tsar waits until the last moment and then enters the cathedral secretly through a private passage. I tell you, it's not possible. With 60 pounds of melanite strategically placed at three central pillars, we can bring down the cathedral dome. Not a soul will escape. But uh, you don't seem to approve. I hadn't thought of killing so many. A few hundred aristocrats? Do they matter? Think of what you will be doing for the millions of Russian people whom you say you love. You think I don't? I doubt if you can, since you are not one of them. But actually, that's not important. Revolutions aren't born out of love, but out of hate. And you think I don't hate? Perhaps you do. I am told that your wife is an exceptionally beautiful woman. Then you knew So wife. that's your revolution, Prince Zogorov, set off by jealousy? Haven't you ever lost someone you love? I have never loved and never will. Because I know that to love is to surrender. To hate is to continue the battle. Well, now, do we understand each other? Yes. Yes, we do. Then sit down. We have many things to discuss. It was then two weeks before the eve of the new year. Prince Agarev and I met several times again to complete our plans in my room on the street, in the library of the university. Then I'll have to get a melanite? Yes, they won't question an aristocrat. But if they should ask me... Say you need it for, for work on your estate in the country to blast out stumps or to widen the channel of the stream television. Ah, the explosive caps. I won't need you for anything else, Prince Ogarov, until uh, the final night. And then? You and I will meet once more for the last time. Besides the prince, I needed two other confederates, a man and a woman. Naturally, I had already decided on Olga Korolska. And the following Sunday, I told her my plan. No, no, Boris. Uh, you, uh, you aren't willing to take the risk? Willing or not, you know, I do whatever you say. But I beg you not the cathedral. May it won't be nearly as dangerous as you think. I wouldn't care if it were the opera house or the palace, but... If we destroy the cathedral... You're afraid of the wrath of God? Well, I'll take full responsibility and you will be absolved of all guilt. No, I'm afraid for you. For your soul, not mine. My soul? What is a soul? Olga Karolska, you come from a revolutionary family, yet you allow yourself to be drugged by this uh, opiate of religion? We don't know for sure. If there is a God... If there is, my soul will be damned. But after this life in Russia, hell can't be any worse. Now I needed to find the right man. Someone passive like Olga. Someone in awe of me. A man who preferred to follow rather than to leave. A man such as Sergius Lem. Sergius was colorless and pliable like a blob of wax ready to be molded into any shape. He worked at the university as a tutor, and like all scholars in our enlightened society, he was ragged and half-starved. I looked him up, bought him a meal, and, and then while he was still warm with gratitude, I unfolded my plan. And I am to pretend I'm a merchant from Riga? Yes. Now listen carefully. While I tell you again, step by step, I will bring you the clothes, not too elegant, not too shabby and some second-hand suitcases. Then you will go to the house just opposite the cathedral and rent the apartment. The front apartment facing the square? Yes, yes. You will say that you have just come from Riga on business. And that my wife will join me in a few days. Yes, yes. Olga will be there in a week from today. The following night, I will come with the final instruction. (laughs) 
When I went to the apartment Sergius had rented, it was three days before the new year. Olga and Sergius were waiting with all the equipment. The tubes of melanite, the wire, the metal hooks, the drill, the explosive caps, the electric key. Olga, playing the part of a merchant's wife, was wearing a new dress and cloak. Do I look all right, Boris? Take off those flowers. No real lady would wear them. Oh. Now? Yes, you'll do. Now listen carefully. The cathedral is nearly empty tonight. In a few minutes, mass will begin. Olga, you will yes. take the wire. Wind it under your cloak, around your waist. Sergius, yes. you and I, we will take each ten tubes of melanite. Uh, both of you will go directly to the chapel at the right of the main altar. Mm. There is a curtained uh, alcove where you can hide. What about you? I will have to come back here for the rest of the explosive. Then I will join you in the alcove. When everyone is left, we will make our preparation. It will take us about an hour. And then we come back here? Uh, no, no, the cathedral will be locked up. We'll have to stay there until morning. Olga, why, why are you shivering? Are you cold? I didn't know we'd have to stay there all night. Uh, does it matter? I intend to sleep. But if you like, you can spend the night praying uh, for our success. No one paid any attention to us as we crossed the snow-covered square. There was no wind, and the air was filled with a raw, freezing mist. I think there's going to be another storm. Yes. It will be snowing by morning. Just as I hoped. They've begun the mass. Yes. Now remember, go directly to the chapel and pay no attention to me. Oh, boy. Quickly, go in quickly. Olga, don't stand there staring. It's black. Go on. I'm going. Oh, Boris, cross yourself. I beg you, cross yourself. Who will go on in? Dear Heavenly Father, have mercy on us. For what we mean to do, have mercy on him. Have mercy on him. noticed into the darkened chapel to the right of the main altar, while I went the opposite way to an icon on the east wall. There I hit the drill and the tubes of melanite in a recess behind the icon, then knelt for a few moments, pretending to pray. I laughed to myself, thinking how Olga had prayed to God for mercy. If God did exist, he would show us no mercy, for we were Russians. And all of Russia is under a curse. When I came back to the cathedral with the rest of the melanite, I too went to the chapel. Olga and Sergius were in the alcove behind the altar where the priest prepared the uh, Eucharist. And I crowded in beside them. How much longer? Don't you hear? I can't tell. I haven't gone to church for years. I haven't since my mother died. Shh. It's nearly over. I'm afraid. Be quiet. We'll put ten of the tubes under the seat next to that front pillar. That's where the czar will sit. Then ten more opposite. 
and the last ten uh, near that pillar in the middle. Is that what the hooks are for? To fasten the tubes under the seat? That's right. That's your job. Huh? Olga, start unwinding the wire. Sergius, fasten the hooks. Yeah. I will connect the explosive caps. When the melanite was all in place, with the explosive caps connected, we ran a wire under a row of seats, fastening it so that it could not be seen. At the end of the seat, a tapestry covered the wall. We ran the wire behind the tapestry up to a small window. Then I lifted surges up to push the window open. Away. That's enough. Do you have the wire? Uh, yes. Good. Do you see that uh, drain pipe outside? Yes. Can you reach it with the auger? I, I think so, yes. Drill a hole uh, in the pipe. Uh, then feed the wire into it enough to reach the ground. When our work was done, we went back to the alcove and sat huddled together on the floor. After a time, I slept. I had no dream. Everything worked in our favor. In the morning, when we left the cathedral, it was snowing hard. We stayed in the apartment all day. That night... I watched from the window until the square was almost deserted. Then I went out, alone, to finish our work. Snow was still falling heavily, a soft, silent curtain of whiteness that blotted out my footprints and hid me from any passerby. I went to the drain pipe, reached up, and found the wire and pulled it out. I fastened the end to another coil of wire, which I unrolled across the square methodically stamping it down into the snow. I then brought the end of the coil through the window of the apartment. Is it done? It's done. Tomorrow, just after midnight, Russia will be in our hands. Until then? You and Olga stay here. I'll be back tomorrow evening after a final meeting with Prince Ogareth. Come in, Prince Ogareth. Well? The Tsar will attend the midnight mass with his ministers and the court. You are quite sure? Quite sure. Just now when I came through the square, they were already putting up the ropes to keep back the crowd. Yes, they will jam the square just to stare at a building where they know the Tsar is kneeling to pray. Well, we are going to show them how his prayers are going to be answered. Yes. What's wrong with you? This is filthy work. Revolutions aren't made with rose water? No, I suppose not. At least my wife has gone to spend the new year at our estate in the country. Good. Then you won't be distracted from the last thing you have to do. Now, we'll have no way of knowing when the Tsar enters the cathedral, since he won't face the crowd in the square. So Sergius Lem will wait outside below the steps. When the Tsar arrives and the mass has begun, come out and tell Sergius. He will bring the word to me. At 11 that night, Sergius left the apartment and made his way to the rope barrier below the cathedral steps. Olga and I waited together in the apartment. There was only one light. A single kerosene lamp standing near the gleaming electric key. Olga walked up and down, a shadow leaping on the wall. I stood at the window, looking out. They are lighting the bonfires. Bonfires? All around the square. I saw them piling up the wood this afternoon. What a crowd. They can scarcely get the sleighs through. Boris... Are you sure there's no other way? To do what? To free the people. If I knew of another way, I would still choose this one. I was afraid you'd say that. The thought of power has already changed you. In destroying this tyrant, you will become one yourself. I am not a czar. I'm the son of a peasant. 
one of the people. Not after tonight. If you do this, it will set you apart from everyone. Olga, if you're trying to say you want to leave... No, no, I'll stay as long as you need me. Look at them milling like cattle. Yes, cattle. Boris, do you love me? You have never said it. What? I keep thinking, if I knew there was love between you and me, I wouldn't mind so much. Women always talking about love. And you can't say it. Do I have to? Don't you know? Listen, the mass has started. But where, where is Prince Ogaret? Maybe the Tsar isn't there yet. They wouldn't have started without him. He may have decided not to come. Ah, there. There is the prince now, coming down the steps. The fool? Can't he see Sergius? He's not looking for Sergius. He's coming here. The fool? I want him not to. Someone will see him. Well, I don't have to wait for him. I know the Tsar must be there. Well, if you don't know, something may have gone wrong. Wait for Prince Ogre. A few more moments can't make any difference. He's halfway here. Running like a madman? Doesn't he know that people are staring? Boris, something must have happened. Quickly, go let him in. Get him inside. Your Excellency, this way. Well? My wife is in the cathedral. The Tsar. What about the Tsar? Yes, he's there. She came with him. Then she lied about going to the country? Yes, to save my feelings. She didn't want to hurt me. But she did. And so history has been changed. No, don't touch the key. Boris, no. You can't. You can't do it now. Because of your wife, you precipitate a revolution. Now, because of her, you want to bring it to a halt? I've killed the Tsar myself. I'll go back to the cathedral and kill him openly. Even if you could, it is not enough. Boris, be merciful. Are they merciful? Ivan the Terrible, Peter, the trumpet Catherine, for centuries they have strangled the people. Not all of them. Not my wife. You want me to turn back now to save one woman? I love her. Can the people eat your love? Will it put clothes on their backs? Think if it was your wife. I have no wife. If it was someone you love. I told you once, Prince Ogareff, I can't afford the luxury of love. Boris, if I were in the cathedral, what would you do? I would press the key. Oh, you wouldn't. There's no one I wouldn't sacrifice to destroy the tyrant who strangles the people. <laughs> Olga, come back here. She's going to tell the police. No, she will only walk about in the snow, wringing her hands for a while, and then she will be coming, crawling back here because she's weak, like you. Her will has been destroyed by love. So now... No! Nothing happened. You pushed the key, and nothing happened. Gordy. What have you done? What have you done? I broke the wire. You will never find it in the snow. You broke the... No, put down the gun. She was right. I did it for your sake, Boris. To save you from committing murder. To save your soul. You are sick, Boris. You are without love. With all my heart, I love and pity you. Pity? Nietzsche once said, the fundamental fault of the female character is that it has no sense of justice. It was true of Olga Karolska when she put what she called love above everything else. It was a glorious plan. It failed because of her. And now, they are coming for me. Boris Kriabin? Yes. I'm ready. Come with me. Olga said she did it for me, to save me from murder. Didn't she know that she forced me to murder her? And she said she pitied me. What did she mean? Why should she pity me? No, I'm not ready to die yet. I can't die before I know what she meant. Halt! 
Now. Olga. Don't let them kill me. Not yet. Tell them there is so much I don't know. So much I have to learn. Tell them. Ready? Olga! Em! Olga! Fire! Olga. Suspense. Listen again next week when we bring you another tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Gunsmoke, brought to you by Chesterfield. Chesterfield packs more pleasure because it's more perfectly packed thanks to Accuray. They satisfy the most. Around Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gunsmoke, starring William Conrad. The transcribed story of the violence that moved west with young America. And the story of a man who moved with it. I'm that man, Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. The first man they look for and the last they want to meet. It's a chancy job, and it makes a man watchful and a little lonely. Chester and I were about 30 miles from Dodge when we ran into the Buffalo Hunters camp. We'd been holed up for two days in a deserted sod hut, taking cover from one of the worst blizzards in years. But it was over now, and a warm, dry Chinook blew out of the west, down off the Rockies and across the prairie into Kansas. It was Chester who saw the camp first, a pile of buffalo hides half covered by snow, and the skeleton of a wagon, its canvas torn and shredded by the blizzard. The camp was silent as we rode up. We got on. They ain't nary a soul here, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, maybe the men got caught out on the prairie when the blizzard hit and couldn't get back. It sure does look that way. I don't know how that team is still alive with nothing but that wagon for protection. They don't look none too lively. Uh, you sure can't blame them. Get your hands up. What? Both of you. What? You better do what the old man says, Chester. He was hiding in the wagon. Come over here. Closer. This your camp, mister? Of course it's my camp. Now you two drop them guns. Now we got our hands up. Is not enough? You do what I say. I ain't taking no chances. I ain't going to get left here again. Left? You're going to hitch up that team, and you're going to take me into Dodge. You ain't running off like Jed Larner. Who's Jed Larner? He's my skinner. Oh, why did he leave you? Well, he seen that blizzard coming, and he didn't want to take any chances, so he rode off. He's probably been in Dodge all the time, warm and cozy. Oh, why didn't you go with him? I twisted my leg and my foot so I can't ride a horse, that's why. Larner figured driving a wagon be too slow. You mean he left you here to freeze? Yeah, and I'll kill him when I find him. 
And I'll kill you if you don't drive me to Dodge. Now, here, he's a U.S. Marshal, mister. He ain't going to leave you out here. Uh, Marshal? Yeah, that's right. Now, why don't you put down that rifle and tell us who you are? Well, all right. My name's Ira Puckett, Marshal. I'm usually up north following the Republican herd, but I come south this year. I'm getting old, and I thought it'd be warmer down here. You sure made a mistake about that, didn't you? You'll get me into Dodge, won't you? Sure, of course we will. Foot I trust it. I don't feel nothing in it. Must be froze. Huh? Well, it could be. I'll kill Jed Lorner for this. You forget about that, Pocket. I'm not taking you back to Dodge just so you can hang. I'll forget it. Till I find him. People everywhere are finding that Chesterfield packs more pleasure. Yes, Chesterfield packs more pleasure because it's more perfectly packed. For the more perfectly packed your cigarette, the more taste and mildness are released for you. And Chesterfield, made with Accuray, is more perfectly packed than any cigarette could ever be before. Firm and pleasing to the lips, mild yet deeply satisfying to the taste. And Accuray Chesterfield has an open, easy draw that unlocks all the pleasure of fine tobaccos. So remember, Chesterfield packs more pleasure. Buy Chesterfield. Mild, yet they satisfy the most. Is he, Doc? Oh, he'll be all right, Matt. In time. Well, then his foot wasn't so bad after all, huh? He didn't have much foot left when I got through him. Oh. But he'll be able to walk with a cane. But his buffalo hunting days are over. How does he know that? Mm hmm. I told him. Ira Puckett's a proud man, Matt. A little too proud. Oh, what do you mean? Well, what he hated most about this Jed Larner leaving him on the prairie wasn't the fact that he might have died, but that he was helpless. A man like Puckett can't stand being helpless. Yeah, I see. So now, all crippled up, he, he's a better man, Matt. Well, he'll get over it, Doc. A man can get used to most anything in time. <laughs> I've got my doubts about Puckett, though. Well, you know that ornery old goat? He won't even admit how old he is. Oh, how old would you guess, Doc? Oh, he's past 70 anyway. Uh, he's in the back there if you want to see him. All right. I'll come with you. Well, hello, Puckett. Marshal. How you feeling? Doc tell you what he done to me? Uh, yeah. He ruined my foot. Oh, I... Oh, I saved your life, Puckett. I ain't sure I'm grateful, Doc. Uh, you're gonna be all right, Puckett. You're gonna be able to get around. Yeah, like old woman. What am I gonna do for a living? I ain't one of you city people. I live off the country. I always have. I'm a man, not a dude. You'll get used to town life. And you'll find men here, too. <laughs> what kind of men? Walking around all slickered up, parting the hair in the middle, bowing to the ladies. Ain't one of them could do half the things I've done. Why, well, I was living with Comanches when most of them was sniveling in their mother's aprons. Yeah, I know. But you'll find something to do. I'll help you. You will, eh? Well, sure. Then help me find Jed Larner. Bring him in here so that I can kill him with my bare hands. What does Larner look like, Bucket? You know, he's tall, black hair, got a big scar running across one eye and halfway down his right cheek. All right, I'll try to find him. And if I do, I'll run him out of town before you get to him. <laughs> so, can't even trust you, can I? Not when you want to murder a man. I told you I didn't bring you in so you could hang. <laughs> The next few weeks, I kept a sharp eye out for Chet Larner, but he must have headed for some other part of the country. Anyway, he never showed up in Dodge. Well, time passed, 
and Ira Puckett was able to get around a little. First with the help of crutches, and then finally with a cane. But it was obvious his hunting days were over. And that alone seemed to shame him. Then one night his pride really got a blow. I was at the Long Branch having a beer with Kitty when it happened. Oh, this is a great way to start the new year, Matt. Uh, what do you mean, Kitty? Well, all last year I was hoping maybe I'd be in San Francisco by now. Oh? Well, you never told me. <laughs> what would you have done about it? <laughs> oh, nothing, I guess. Hmm. Uh, why San Francisco? No blizzards, no dust, no cowboys. Uh-huh. Yeah, but they got fog. Yeah. And all those sailors and miners aren't any gentler than these cowboys, you know. Well, I know. But imagine going to dinner in a carriage, eating off a tablecloth, dancing on a hardwood floor. <laughs> You're spoiled, Kitty. Well, now, how could I got spoiled? Here? In Dodge City? <laughs> I'll save your money. You'll get to California someday. Yeah, sure. If I walk. Well, a lot of people have gone that way. Who do you think I am? Sacagawea? <laughs> ah, there was a woman. Yeah. You know, I always... What's the matter, Matt? That man at the bar, he just turned around. Which man? The one with a scar down his cheek. I'll be back, Kitty. Good evening, Marshal. Evening. What are you staring at me for? Your name Jed Larner? And if it is? How long you been in town, Larner? About an hour. Something wrong, Marshal? You remember the big blizzard we had? Hmm. Who don't? We all do, I guess. Especially Ira Puckett. What? He didn't die, Larner. Well, that's fine. I went back looking for him. I wondered where he got to. Yeah, sure you did. Well, it's true. Pockets here in Dodge, Larner. He is? If he finds you, he'll kill you. But he isn't going to find you because you're leaving right now. And don't show up around here again. Now, wait, Marshal. I you can't can... arrest you. I can't put you in jail. But I tell you what I can do. What? Suppose I just let everybody here know that you're the man who ran off and left Ira Puckett to die. No. You know something? They'd tear you apart, Larner. They'd set you on fire. Don't say nothing, Marshal. Don't tell him. I'll leave. I'll leave right now. Well, you got rid of him in a hurry. I saved him from being shot and Ira Puckett from hanging for it. Kitty. Oh, that was Jed Larner. Uh-huh. He's the one that ought to hang. Yeah, he didn't mean to kill the old man, Kitty. What's the difference? Well, legally, there's some. Enough to give Ira his foot back? <laughs> You're sure hard to argue with, Kitty. Why? Because I think straight? <laughs> Let's uh, talk about San Francisco, huh? I've changed my mind. I think I'll go to New York. No? Marshal Dillon. Ira Puckett, man. Yeah. He looks awful mad. That's Good thing he isn't armed. Now he can always find a gun, Kitty. You, you done it, Marshal. It was you, wasn't it? You saw Judd Larner. Huh? Jumped on his horse and rode out of town before I could stop him. And I had to stand there and watch. I didn't even have a rock to throw at him. Why'd you do it, Marshal? To save you from hanging, huh? Well, I'd rather hang and live this way. I wasn't born to become my helpless old man. The least you could have done was let me fight my own battle like I always did out on the plane. You took my manhood away from me, Marshal. You're living in town now, Ira, among people. Why don't you get used to it? All right. All right. All right, I will. I'll live like you town people. Fine. Then why don't you start by getting yourself a job? I'm going to. I sure am. And it's going to pay me a lot of money, too. What do you mean by that? You find out, Marshal. When it's too late. This 
is Jack Webb. I suppose most of you have made your New Year's resolutions. I guess with most of us, that implies some kind of a change. Well, beginning with this brand new year, we've made a few changes in our Dragnet television show. I like to think the most important is what we call the Dragnet New Look. In our brand new series, we'll show for the very first time the new Los Angeles Police Administration building, the first of its kind in the world. But the biggest change of all is our new television time, one half hour earlier. Now, speaking of a change, here's a great suggestion for 1956. Change to milder, better-tasting Chesterfields. My cigarette. Make it yours. I think this little jingle of ours sums up our case for Chesterfield very nicely. Put a smile in your smoke and just give them a try. Light up a Chesterfield. They satisfy. Nice morning, ain't it, Mr. Dillon? Yeah, thanks to that wind we had last night. Well, it kept me awake. Uh, all night, Chester? Well, no, sir, I wouldn't say that. About 15 minutes. Hey, look over there by the bank, Mr. Dillon. Ain't that Ira Puckett? Uh, yeah. That's the first time he's had his team and wagon out. Where you reckon he's going? Right now, he's gone into the bank. Well, what's he carrying that shotgun for? He can't do no hunting in the bank. Yes, he can, Chester. Come on. Mr. Dillon, you don't mean to say old Puckett's going to hold that bank up. He said last night he's going to start living like town people and get a job and make a lot of money. This could be his idea of how to do it. You sure couldn't have no other reason to carry that shotgun in there. You going in after him, Mr. Dillon? Yeah. Well, he's got a shotgun. I know. Look, Chester, take his team and wagon off somewhere, huh? Lead him around back of the bank, huh? Out of sight. Maybe we can handle this without a shooter. All right, sir. Hurry it up, Chester. He's coming out. I'm all gone, Mr. Dillon. Marshal. Come on out, Puckett. I'm not stopping you. You better not try it. I can shoot with one hand, Marshal. Yeah, sure. Don't you try to follow me, Nick. Hey, wait a minute. Wait. Where's my wagon? Where's my team? You're in a bad fix, Puckett. Somebody stole them. I can't get away without my team. No, you can't, Puckett. So you might as well give up. You've done it. You're behind this, Marshal. You gonna shoot me? Well, why shouldn't I? Because you're in enough trouble already. And shooting me won't help a bit. You're trapped, Puckett, and there isn't a thing you can do about it. Now, you use your head... Uh, all right. Here. Here's the money. Now, you bring my outfit back. I ain't going to jail, Marshal. It's like I said, Puckett. Shooting me isn't going to help you. And I'm not going to do a thing about your outfit. You think you outsmarted me, don't you? Give it up, Puckett. You're licked. Yeah, well, I... No. Oh. oh, I can't shoot you, Marshal. Here. Here, take the gun. Good. I'm nothing but a helpless old fool. Can't even rob a bank proper. I'm not sure you really wanted to, Puckett. What? All you wanted was to prove something about that manhood you think has been taken away from you. But you sure picked a foolish way to do it. Yeah, I guess it did. My goodness, I thought he wouldn't never give up, Mr. Dillon. He didn't have much choice, Chester. I went in the back way and told the people in the bank to keep out of the way. You want me to take him to jail? Oh, no, no. No, no, I, I can't stand jail. Please, Marshal. Lock him up, Chester. I'll return this money and have a talk with Mr. Botkin. I'll be over later. I thought I told you to lock him up, Chester. Well, I started to, Mr. Dillon, but I just couldn't stand the look on him when I got him in the cell. I... I... Ira, 
You know, it seems to me everybody treats you pretty well. Yeah, everybody but Jed Larner. That's true. But Chester and I brought you in. Doc saved your life. I kept you from hanging, and if I hadn't outsmarted you at the bank, you'd probably be lying dead somewhere now. You know, it seems to me everybody's gone to a lot of trouble for an old man full of a lot of foolish pride. What do you think? I, I've been thinking, Marshal. Sitting here thinking. You know what? You're right. But it's too late now. No, it isn't, I don't. What? I explained everything to Mr. Bodkin at the bank, and he's willing to drop any charges against you. But on one condition. What's that? Well, to be honest with you, it was my idea, but Mr. Bodkin agreed. You get a job here and quit being so doggone ornery. Otherwise, you're going to go to jail. Oh, what could I do with this crippled foot? Well, seeing you're so handy with a shotgun, I think Jim Buck might hire you to ride messenger on the stage. You think so? Well, he told me he would. You, you, you went and saw him? And it doesn't take any walking, Ira. So, uh, how about it, huh? The Jack Benny Program. L-S-M-F-T. 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 Of course. That's it. Right you are. Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. American. Quality of product is essential to continuing success. And Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. So round, so firm, so fully packed. So free and easy on the draw. Yes, Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. And speaking of tobacco, here's what Mr. John William Hill, Jr., independent tobacco buyer of Winston-Salem, North Carolina, said. I've seen Lucky Strike buy ripe, naturally mild tobacco. And I know that when this tobacco goes into a cigarette, it means real smoking enjoyment. So when it comes to buying a cigarette for myself, I naturally add these things together and choose Lucky's. Quote, I've seen Lucky Strike buy ripe, naturally mild tobacco, unquote. Yes, Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. So smoke that smoke of fine tobacco, Lucky Strike. Lucky Strike program, starring Jack Benny with Barry Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Larry Stevens, and yours truly, Don Wilson. Well, ladies and gentlemen, as you all know, the contest ended at midnight December 24th. However, there were so many people that couldn't stand Jack Benny. <laughs> it will take a couple of weeks to finish reading all the letters, and the winners will be announced shortly afterwards. So let's go out to Jack's house in Beverly Hills, where we find Jack, Mary, and Rochester busily sorting the latest entries. Gosh, the way this mail has been pouring in the last few days. Yeah, there sure is a lot of it, boss. Yes, sir. <laughs> Quiet, Polly. Daddy's working. <laughs> hmm. Look at this mail. It's absolutely amazing how many people can't stand me. <laughs> yeah, and Jack, look at this pile of letters over here. 48,000 of them are all from St. Joe. Now, wait a minute, Mary. There must be some mistake. They love me in St. Joe. <laughs> you remember when I was there last year, they put up a statue of me in the public park. Well, they're sending it back. There's a hunk of granite in each envelope. <laughs> Oh, Mary, you're just making that up. No, I'm not. Here's a note in one of the letters. What does it say? Uh, we're sending back all of Mr. Benny's statue except the ears. We're keeping those for bird baths. <laughs> Let me see that note. It doesn't say that at all. Gee, it does at that. <laughs> what am I going to do with all these pieces of my statue? Well, why don't you glue them together and set it out on your front lawn? No, no, I'd look silly out on the lawn without any ears. <laughs> well, maybe a couple of snails will crawl up and go to sleep in the right places. <laughs> no, no, you can't depend on it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Christmas. Well, come on, let's try... Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas. <laughs> Polly, Polly, Christmas is over. Now I gotta teach her to say Happy New Year. Polly, now listen, Polly. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Merry Christmas. No, 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 it's Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Merry Christmas. No, no, Polly, now listen, listen, Polly. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Come on now, Polly, say it. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Atta girl. Isn't it wonderful how you can train a Mary? It sure is. And now, Polly, a very happy New Year. Merry Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> Smart parrot. Well, she's just a little nervous since I told her that the carrier pigeon she's engaged to is coming back from overseas. <laughs> He'd be here now, but he couldn't get a train out of San Francisco. <laughs> he may have to fly. <laughs> now, let's see. We got to finish sorting the... Rochester, why did you tear up that letter? This one was a mistake, boss. It said, I can't stand Rochester. <laughs> Who signed that? The gas man. <laughs> well, we haven't heard from him in about five years. <laughs> Mary, what are you laughing at? Get this letter. I can't stand Jack Benny because he plays the violin. Signed, a dead cat. <laughs> That's probably from somebody. <laughs> Probably from somebody who doesn't like me. Mm, could be. Certainly, huh? Oh, boss, boss, you won't believe it. What is it, Rochester? Here's a letter from the Big Three. The Big Three? Well, what does it say? We couldn't stand Jack Benny before the contest. <laughs> Sign Anaheim, Azusa, and Cucamonga. <laughs> oh, they just think they're smart because they're on the way to Palm Springs. <laughs> Anyway, uh, there's the phone. I'll get it. No, no, Rochester, you stay with the mail. I'll have Nottingham answer it. Nottingham? Jack, have you still got that English butler around here? I thought you only hired him for last week to impress the Coleman's. Well, we're so busy with the mail, I kept him on to help out. Uh, Nottingham, answer the door. <laughs> Isn't he classy? He even puts on his coat to answer the phone. <laughs> <laughs> Nottingham, who was that? <laughs> All right, Mary, now we'll have... Uh, Jack, what did Nottingham say? He said my lawyer was on the phone. I thought he said the grocer. No, no, Mary. Grocer is grofful. <laughs> he used to confuse me at first, too. You know. Hiya, Jackson. Hello, Livy. Happy New Year. Uh, happy New Year, Phil. Glad you came over. Say, Phil, did you have a nice Christmas? Well, Liv, I got a lot of presents. And look at this. Here's what the boys in my band gave me. What is it? Well, it's one of them new fountain pens, and it's guaranteed to write two years without having to refill it. Well, what good is it to you? You can't write. A lot of things can happen in two years, Bob. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. And while I'm thinking of it, Jackson, I want to thank you for the present you gave me. Well... What was it, Phil? A pair of black and pink lounging pajamas with a bare midriff. And they're a little snug, but I wore them all day. Phil, yeah, those were for Alice. <laughs> a bare midriff. Well, surely Alice must have known those pajamas were for her. Yeah, but I look so cute at them, she just hated to tell me. <laughs> oh, brother. Say, Libby, what did Jackson give you for Christmas? I gave her a fur muff. There it is over on the chair there. It's sable. It's rabbit. It is not, it's sable. Rabbit. I wore it at the farmer's market yesterday, and it snapped at a head of lettuce. <laughs> Well, a lot of sables are vegetarians, too. <laughs> Believe me, Phil, uh, the muff I gave Mary is sable. It's rabbit. It's, would I pay $19 for rabbit? <laughs> would I? You wouldn't pay $19 for $20. <laughs> I would, too. <laughs> Oh, 
<laughs> now, Bill, as long as you're here, stick around and help us read some contest letters. Jackson, you know better than that. <laughs> All right, then open the envelopes. At least you've got muscle. <laughs> Come on, open the Gosh, I never saw so many contest letters. It'll take two weeks before at least before we can finish reading them. Hey, Jackson, listen to this letter. Bill, stop showing off. We know you can't read. This one's got pictures on it. <laughs> oh. Now, the first six words must be, I can't stand Jack Benny because. Yeah. And then there's a picture of your face and the body of a jackass. There is? Yeah. You know, Jackson, if you didn't need to shave that jackass, it'd look pretty good. <laughs> Oh, yeah? Oh, boss, boss. What is it, Rochester? Nottingham would like to see you. Well, have him come in here. He can't at the moment. He's indisposed. He's standing in the kitchen in his shorts and socks. My goodness, what happened? Well, after lunch, we decided to idle away a few minutes in a game of chance. <laughs> Rochester, you didn't gamble with Nottingham. Uh-huh. I won everything but his English accent. <laughs> what? I'd have got that, but he wouldn't open his mouth. <laughs> I think that's awful. Imagine leaving him standing there in his BVDs. I got an IOU on those. <laughs> well, I want you to go in there and give Nottingham his clothes back. Okay, okay. Imagine anybody doing Hiya, it. Hiya, Rochester. Hello, Miss Wilson. Hey, Don. Hello, everybody. Happy, Happy New, New Year. Year. Happy, Happy New Year. Year. No. Happy New Year. Merry Christmas. <laughs> no, no, Polly. <laughs> Polly, it's Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Happy. That's it. Happy. Happy. Happy what? Happy what? <laughs> I wish that terrier pigeon would get here. Don, uh, how did you happen to be around this neighborhood? Well, I just wanted to drop in and thank everybody for their Christmas gift. Hey, Donzie, what did Jackson give you? Well, Jack didn't give me anything for Christmas because he gave me a birthday present and he thought my birthday was too close to Christmas. Uh, when is your birthday, Don? The 23rd of August. <laughs> What did Jack give you for your birthday? A rabbit's foot. <laughs> no wonder my muff limped. <laughs> Never mind. And as long as we're on the subject of presents, what about that gift you kids all chipped in and bought me? Well, we thought it was a good idea, Jackson. Something you could use. Hmm, something I could use. A fluorescent toupee so people can see me at night. <laughs> When I sing Rise and Shine, I'm not kidding. <laughs> Some gift. Merry Christmas. Polly, it's Happy New Year. Happy New Year. I'm going to train that bird if I have to Jack, get... Jack, not with a whip and a chair. <laughs> well, I'll talk to him when we're alone. Say, Jack, I'm kind of thirsty. May I have a glass of water? A glass of water? Sure, sure, Don. Go right out in the kitchen. Okay, thanks. Oh, kiss me once and kiss me twice and LSMFT. <laughs> It's such a great, great smoke, so round, so firm, so fully packed, so easy on the draw. It's such a great, great smoke. <laughs> Lucky's have tobacco that is milder. It's wonderful the way I make this rhyme. Boo, 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 boo. Hey, kids, listen to Don. So smoke it once and smoke it twice and smoke it once again. You'll have a grand, grand time. It means we're lucky. Grand, grand time. Don, Don, that was wonderful. I didn't know you could sing like that. Hello, everybody. Hello, Hello Mary. Mary. Hello, oh, kid. When'd you get here? Well, I came in right in between smoke it once and smoke it twice. <laughs> well, I'm glad you came over. You can help us with the mail. Well, I have to run along. I just dropped by to wish you a happy new year. Oh, same to you, kid. By the way, Larry, I got a lot of compliments on your song last week. Well, thank you. I've got another one I'm working on for next week. You have? Well, come on. Let's hear it. Yeah, yeah sing it, Larry. Come on. Okay. Smoke it once and smoke it twice. <laughs> Holly, Larry's going to sing now. <laughs> But 
Then what else could I do? Yes, there were one or two I used to date with, but they always knew I used them to wait with. I'm glad. was swell, Larry. I'm glad you picked that one. Now, kids, let's try and get the rest of this contest mail finished so we can try... Nottingham, answer the door. Hello, 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 Bradley's the name, Steve Bradley. I'm Mr. Bennett's press agent, and I'm here to see him. Hello, guys, hello, John. Mr. Bennett's bringing you on. Huh? What'd he say? Hello, hello, guys, hello, John. Mr. Bennett's bringing you on. Well, thanks, and a happy new year to you, too. <laughs> yeah, how's the writing to see Benny? Oh, it's you, Steve. Well, hello, hello, hello. Long time no see. Happy new year, everybody. Happy, happy new, new year, year, Steve. Happy, happy new year. year. Well, Benny, guess you know why I'm here. The contest is over. Yes, yes, I know. Yeah, all we have to do now is finish reading the letters, pick the winners, and then award the $10,000 in prizes. 10000 Steve? Look, Steve, wouldn't it be more sporting to forget about anything so commercial as money and keep the whole thing on an amateur basis. Wouldn't it? Huh? Wouldn't it? Benny, are you crazy? You can't do a thing like that. Well, I don't see why we... Look, let me put it here this way. Which do you value more, $10,000 or your reputation? Hmm. Uh, better put it to him another way. <laughs> Oh, well, all right. Add up, boy, Benny. Now just hand me over that $10,000 and I'll buy the victory bonds for the prizes. But, Steve, we don't know the winners yet. We still got mail to read. Yeah, I know, I know, but you don't want anything to hold us up. I gotta go out now and buy those bonds and have them ready. Okay, okay. I'll have to go down to my vault and get the money. <laughs> but, uh, before I go, I want you all to repeat the oath after me. <laughs> I promise not to reveal that Jack Benny has a secret vault hidden in his home. I promise not to reveal that Jack Benny has a secret vault hidden in his home. And if I should tell anyone, either consciously or unconsciously... And if I should tell anyone, either consciously or unconsciously... May I lose my umbrella during the rainy season. May I lose my umbrella during the rainy season. Now, everybody bow their heads while I... <laughs> While I go down in the ball. My pants on the barbed wire. <laughs> now I better be careful about those landmines. Oh, who goes there? <laughs> <laughs> 
Friend or foe? Friend. What's the password? Greenberg's on third. <laughs> oh, it's you, Mr. Benny. That's right, Ed. Uh, and here's a little present for you. A present for me? Yes, Ed. Uh, last week was Christmas. Oh, did you have a nice New Year's? Uh, no, no, Ed. You see, it isn't New Year's yet. You see, New Year's comes after Christmas, you see. Oh, well, I've been away from it so long, I kind of forgot. <laughs> oh, yes. You know, Ed, this, this year, things are going to be a lot better. They're make, uh, starting to make automobiles again. Automobiles? Yes. Yeah, they're like buggies, you see, with motors in them. You know, you drive them down the street. Well, uh, won't they frighten the buffalo? <laughs> No, no, no. You see, buffalo are extinct. There are very few of them around anymore. Well, I got to get into my vault now. Shall I turn my back? No, 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 Ed. You're, you're bonded. <laughs> now, let's see. The combination is right to 45. Left to 160. Back to 15. Then left to 110. There. the factories are reconverting. Now I'll be able to buy a louder burglar alarm. <laughs> Mr. Benny, how much money are you putting in? I'm not putting anything in, Ed. I'm taking some out. My, this is thrilling. <laughs> well, well, so long, Ed. Happy New Year. Same to you. Whoopee. <laughs> Goodbye. All right. All right, Steve. Here's the money for the prizes. Uh, thanks, Benny. See you next week. Happy New Year, everybody. Happy, Happy New, New Year, Year, Steve. Happy New Year. Well, kids, that's that. Just think, another year almost gone. Boy, how they roll around. Imagine it'll soon be 1946. I wonder what the new year will bring. I wonder what new things will come out. Science is certainly wonderful. Heliocopters, jet propulsion, atomic energy. It's amazing. I wonder what they'll... Hmm, it's kind of late. I wonder who that can be. Oh, hello. Hello, you're Jack Benny, aren't you? Why, why yes, yes, little boy, who are you? I'm the New Year. The New Year? But all the other little New Year's have always come on January 1st. You're early. Maybe he's trying to pick up a couple of tickets for the Rose Bowl game. <laughs> Don't be silly, Phil. Maybe there's something wrong with our calendar. No, no, I came early because 1946 looks like it's going to be a good year. And I'm raring to go. Got a lot of work to do. Automobiles, prefabricated houses, vacuum cleaners, fluorescent toupees. <laughs> Oh, oh, yes. How about nylon stockings? There'll be plenty of those. Oh, good. I was lucky to get this pair I'm wearing. They make my legs look so nice. See? <laughs> <laughs> well. Hey, this kid's really ahead of time. <laughs> well, look, uh, Sonny, uh, how about radio in 1946? That is, uh, what I mean is television. Uh, what, uh, what are my chances in television? Would you really like to know? Yes. Sit down, Mr. Benny. Thank you, thank you. Well, all right, kid, I can take it. I mean, tell me, what are my chances in television? Well, first of all, tell me, how old are you, Mr. Benny? Sit down, kid. <laughs> Quiet. What, uh, what did you say, Sonny? I said, how old are you? <laughs> Uh, 37. Uh, 37? That's a joke, son. <laughs> it is not. 
Now, what were you going to say about... Oh, the... Jack, look out the window. There's an old man coming up the wall. Yeah, and he looks like Father Time. Father Time? What is this, anyway? <laughs> no! Hey, you're not Father Time, are you? Father Time? I don't know what you're talking about, bub. I'm looking for my grandson. I was told to come in here. Oh, you mean... He that... was supposed to be in a New Year's play. The kids are giving at the schoolhouse. But they run away. Oh. oh. Oh, so that's it. Are you, Grandpa? Oh, oh, so there you are, you little shaver. Come on back to the schoolhouse. The people are waiting for the new year. And come on, let's get going. It's all in my ear. Yeah, take it easy on the little fella. I just told you, Bubby's my grandson. He's in a school play. He ain't the real new year. <laughs> Well, he sure fooled me. <laughs> so, he's, so he's going to be in the school play, huh? But isn't he a little old to be wearing those diapers? He just got out of the army and he can't buy any clothes. <laughs> oh, fine. Well, take him along, then. Goodbye, Grandpa. So long, Sonny. So long. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Happy New Year, Sonny. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. What a cute kid. See, I remember, I remember when I was his age. I was in a little New Year's play at school, too. You know, I was so good. Well, uh, so long, Jackson. I got to beat it. Yeah, me too. Happy New Year, Mr. Benny. Uh, Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Anyway, Mary, I was so good in this school play that I held the audience spellbound. In fact, just recently, they made a picture of it, you know? <laughs> I'll never forget how cute. <laughs> I'll never forget how cute I was in that play. In fact, you know, that's what gave me the idea that someday I'd be... Well, I gotta go. Happy New Year, Jack. Happy New Year, Mary. <laughs> anyway, I'll never forget it. Yeah, I walked out on the stage wearing a little pair of wings, and across my chest was a banner saying, Happy New Year, 18... I mean, 1912. <laughs> And when I spoke my first line... Boss, boss, who are you talking to? Huh? Oh, oh, they've all gone. Sit down, Rochester. Yeah, Rochester, I walked out on the stage and I looked so cute with my long curls and blue eyes and dimpled cheeks. And when I got all through, there was so much applause that the teacher came right over and kissed me. She said, Jackie, you're the best New Year's Eve we ever had. Ladies and gentlemen, while history will point to 1945 as the year of victory, 1946 will be the start of a new era, an era in which people the world over must live together in peace and mutual respect. We want a lot more than just battles in this war. We want a realization that all men everywhere want to live out their lives in peace and freedom. While there are many different points of view of how this peace should be secured, the important thing is that all mankind wants it, and it will be accomplished. There's no place for hate, greed, suspicion, and prejudice in a world that has the atomic bomb. The old era is dead, and 1946 is the beginning of the new one. The era of Wendell Wilkie's One World. Happy New Year, everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, you all know the contest is over, but on account of the vast amount of letters that still have to be read, we will announce the winners as soon as possible. Now, Jack will be back in just a minute, but first, here's my good friend, F.E. Boone. At 49, American. Remember this, in a cigarette, it's the tobacco that counts. And Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. That's right. L-S-M-F-T. Yes, Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. The finer, the lighter, the naturally milder Lucky Strike tobacco. This fine Lucky Strike tobacco means real deep down smoking enjoyment for you. Sure thing. L-S-M-F-T. So smoke that smoke of fine tobacco, Lucky Strike. So round, so firm, so fully packed. 
So free and easy on the draw. The famous tobacco auctioneers heard on tonight's programmer, Mr. F.E. Boone of Lexington, Kentucky. At 49, automated at 49, American. And Mr. L.A. Speed Riggs of Goldsboro, North Carolina. Basil Risedale speaking for Lucky Strike. L.S.M.F.T. 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 In a cigarette, it's the tobacco that counts. And Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. So smoke that smoke of fine tobacco, Lucky Strike. Happy New Year to everybody all over the world from all of us. This is the National Broadcasting Company. The Jack Benny Program, presented by Lucky Strike. Smoke a Lucky to feel your level best. Smoke a Lucky to feel your level best. Your level best. That's how you'll feel when you light up a Lucky. Because Lucky's fine tobacco picks you up when you're low, calms you down when you're tempted. Put you on the right level to feel and do your level best. It's important to you as a smoker to know that fine tobacco can do this for you. And as you know, LSMFT, LSMFT, Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. No wonder more independent tobacco experts, auctioneers, buyers, and warehousemen smoke Lucky Strike regularly than the next two leading brands combined. It's good to know that fine tobacco picks you up when you're low, calms you down when you're tense. By putting you on the right level to feel and do your level best. That's the lucky level, so smoke a lucky to feel your level best. Yes, the next time you buy cigarettes, remember, Lucky's fine tobacco puts you on the right level, the lucky level, to feel your level best and do your level best. Smoke a lucky to feel your level best. Get on the lucky level where it's fun to be alive. Get a carton of Lucky's and get started today. <laughs> Benny, with very little Rochester, Dennis A. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we bring you our master of ceremonies, who today... Wait a minute, Don. Wait a minute. Just a minute. Today, I'd like to have the honor of introducing you. Me? Yes, Don. Now, give me the microphone. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to bring you the man who was selected by Fame Magazine as America's outstanding radio announcer for 1948, and here he is, Don Wilson. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you very much, Jack. I really didn't expect you to introduce me like that. Well, why shouldn't I, Don? You deserve it. According to Fame Magazine, the radio critics and columnists selected you because... You have poise, warmth, perfect enunciation, and a voice with an ingratiating quality that not only invites confidence, but has great dignity. And they're right. Jack, you'll never know how much I appreciate your saying that on the air. Why? I have an uncle in Duluth who thinks I'm nothing but a big, fat slob. Well, Don, I don't care what your uncle thinks. I go by Fame Magazine. They chose you the number one announcer for 1948. And to show you my appreciation, I'm going to double your salary. Oh, Jack. No, no, Don. No, no. You deserve it. Next week, your check will be exactly double. Well, God, Jack, thanks. And I hope you make good use of the extra money because the following week, you'll be back to your original salary. <laughs> what? You're only giving me a raise for one week? Certainly, you were chosen the best announcer for 1948. Now, the following week will start the new year, and who knows who they'll choose in 49. <laughs> you know, when they take that poll next year, your uncle may be right. <laughs> Believe me. <laughs> oh, that's very funny, Jack. It really is. No matter what situation arises, you always seem to think of something funny to say. What? <laughs> for the best announcement. Well, no, I, I really mean that, Jack. I really mean that, you know, and it, it's very funny. It really is. You, you always say funny things, and it's no wonder in the very same issue of Fame magazine, you were selected as the nation's number one comedian. I was? Yeah. Really? 
certainly, Jack. It was a wonderful article about you. It was right in the middle of the magazine on page, uh, page, uh... 29. <laughs> That's, that's what it was. Oh, then you read it. Well, Don, I must confess that I just glanced through it, but do me a favor, will you? What is it, Jack? Although Fame Magazine was very kind in bestowing this honor upon me, I wish you wouldn't mention it. Why? Look, Don, every member of the cast will come in and start congratulating me and making such a big thing out of it. I'll, you know, I'll, I'll be terribly embarrassed. Well, Jack, now I can understand why the article paid such a glowing tribute to your modesty. It did? Yes. On page, uh, page... Uh, 32. <laughs> it was right opposite the ad for Vigoro. <laughs> anyway, Don, promise me you won't mention the article in front of the members of... Oh, hello, Mary. Oh, hello, Jack. Hello, Don. Hello, Mary. Mary, why are you so out of breath? Well, I rode down here on the bus and I got off at the wrong place. Uh-huh. Then I remember we don't broadcast from there till next week, and I had to run all the way back here. <laughs> oh, oh, yes, yes. Mary, why did you come to the studio on a bus? Well, I was going to drive down, but I didn't want to use Jack's Christmas present so soon. His Christmas present? Mary, did Jack give you a car? No, a gallon of gas. <laughs> Mary, that wasn't gas in that can. There was a gallon of perfume. Well, thanks very much, Jack, and I wish you'd send me some more. Oh, did you like it? I think it's wonderful. I put some on my dress and three more dropped dead. Good, good. Say, Mary, what did you receive from home? Did you get a nice present from your sister, Babe? Well, no, Jack. Babe couldn't send me anything this year. She lost her job. Oh. Isn't she modeling anymore? Uh, no, that harness shop closed up. <laughs> oh. oh, well, that's a shame. Yeah. I sent her a peekaboo blanket for Christmas. <laughs> she would have looked nice on her, too. Yeah. Anyway, Mary, uh... Come in. Is Jack Benny here? Yes, yes, I'm Jack Benny. Well, where's the stuff? <laughs> stuff? What stuff? I'm from Beacon's Van and Storage Company. I understand you're moving. Well, not till next week. I'll, I'll see you later. Oh, no, you don't. I'm going to sit down and wait. Well, you don't have to wait. Well, are you sure you're going to move? Yes, what are you so worried about? Well, last November we had five trucks waiting in front of the White House, and you know what happened to that job. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. We carried that piano in and out 19 times. <laughs> well, don't worry about this one. I'll carry my own violin. Goodbye. <laughs> I'll oh, say, Jack, that was a pretty clever remark you just made about carrying your old violin. It was funny, wasn't it, Barry? Yeah. By the way, Jack, did you see that article in Fame Magazine? Oh, forget it, Mary. <laughs> but, Jack, a person should be proud to have Fame Magazine write such nice things about him. Mary, please, not in front of all these people. It's, it's embarrassing. Oh, why couldn't I talk about it? I think it was a wonderful tribute to Don. I know, Mary, but... <laughs> oh, Oh, Don. Yes, they selected him as the number one announcer in radio. I know, I know. Mary, I hope you won't think I'm boasting, but I'm very proud of that article. Especially where they commented on my resonant voice. Resonant voice, resonant voice. <laughs> what a ham. And, uh, Mary, there was another paragraph that said that my voice not only invites confidence, but has great dignity. That was on page, uh, page, uh, what page was that, Jack? Who remembers pages? <laughs> Stop this silly talk and get on with the show. Jack, what are you so mad about? Mary, I'm not mad. It just so happens... Oh, hello, Mr. Benny. Oh, hello, Dennis. It just so happens that Merry I... Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, Dennis. Uh, it just so happens that Happy I... Happy New Year. Happy New Year. It just so happens Can I go that... home now? <laughs> Certainly. Mary, it just so... Dennis, come back here. <laughs> you just arrived. Why do you want to go home? Oh, my aunt is visiting us for the holidays. My mother wants me to entertain her. Oh, your aunt, eh? Your mother's sister? No. <laughs> oh, then she's your father's sister. No. But Dennis, she's your aunt. Whose sister is she? Her brother. <laughs> well, for heaven's sake, who's her brother? Oh, I don't know. Since I got two shows, we picked up a lot of relatives. <laughs> I, I know what you mean, kid. Yeah, the house is full of them. I got an uncle in the back bedroom, and I can't understand him at all. Why? He says he's from Duluth, and he hates Don Wilson. 
Well, then, Dennis, shake hands with Don Wilson. You must be blood relatives. Then why has he got all the blood? I don't know! I want to thank you for the Christmas gift you sent me. Oh, did you like it? Yes, but, Dennis, there was only one silk stocking in the package. One of them must have got lost. Oh, no, I've got the other one at home. Wait a minute, Dennis. Only one silk stocking? Why didn't you give Mary both of them? Well, my mother said if you send too much to a girl, she'll think you're serious. <laughs> the sound effect didn't cost so much, I'd have a gunshot right here. <laughs> Go ahead, kid. Let's hear your song. Okay. sung by Dennis Day, and very good, Dennis. In fact, I don't think anybody could have sung it as well. Oh, yeah? <laughs> what do you mean, oh, yeah? Oh, don't try to flatter me. The other day, I saw you go into a music store and buy one of Frank Sinatra's records. So what? I've seen you walk into a store and buy records by Bing Crosby. Well, he has four kids to support. <laughs> oh, yes, four boys. What are their names again? The Gary, Lindsay, Durston, and Osborne. Stop, will you? Oh, Jack, that reminds me. Are you still going with Mr. Osborne's secretary, little old Daisy Dickinson? Yes, Mary. As a matter of fact, she's coming over to my house for dinner tonight. Really? When she makes the reservation? <laughs> she didn't have to. I'm inviting her. She wants to leave a little something under the plate. That's up to her. <laughs> anyway, I've invited her to dinner. Well, I hope you take that sign down in your dining room. The fourth cup of coffee free. <laughs> I took that down right after the Thanksgiving rush. Anyway, Mary, I'm really serious with Daisy. You know, she's one of the sweetest girls I've... Oh, hello, Phil. Hiya, Jackson. Hello, folks. Here's little old Harris on the day after Christmas, so cheer me from Alaska to the Panama. It's nice. <laughs> oh, hmm, how do you like an entrance like that? Phil? Phil? What? Phil, how in the world can you walk out on the stage like that and ask an audience to applaud you? Jackson, when you ain't got talent, you gotta have guts. <laughs> that I can believe. Yeah, yeah. Hey, hi, you, Livy. Say, Liv, I don't want you to think I forgot you this Christmas. Well, Phil, I was a little bit hurt when I didn't even get a card from you. A card? <laughs> Listen, doll face. <laughs> I got something special for you. Come here, baby. 
<laughs> Come out over here. Come on up a little closer. Move right in. That's it. Now pucker up them lovely lips and hold on tight, babe. Come, come on. That is a gift, and it'll keep you warm till next year. <laughs> Phil, Phil, you are without a doubt the most egotistical man I ever met in my life. Mary, why'd you let him kiss you? Mary. <laughs> Mary, she won't be able to talk for an hour or two. Say something. Hi, Mark. <laughs> now, Mary, stop. Stop going along with him. He's hammy enough. Now, let's... Oh, say, Jack, I want to talk to you about the commercial. The boy... Hi, Don. Oh, well, hello, Phil. Hey, Don, I want to congratulate you on being picked the number one announcer on the air. Well, thank you, Phil. Now, I don't want to seem immodest or undignified, but the honor will certainly lend to my prestige. I have an uncle in the back room who thinks you're awful. <laughs> then it's quiet. And, Phil, in this thing about uh, Don, if you're referring to that article in Fame magazine, you know, there was something about me in it, too. I wouldn't know about that, Jackson. My kids must have skipped that part when they read it to me. <laughs> your kids read it to you? Phil, so aren't you ashamed to let your children know you can't read? No, Jackson, they love it. They think I'm a character. <laughs> what? Whenever I do something, the little one nudges the big one and says, Good <laughs> I gotta say one thing, Phil. For a guy like you, you've got a wonderful family. Well, thanks, Jackson. Hey, by the way, I was just gonna ask you if you want to go hunting with me. I'm going up the High Sierras again. The High Sierras? Yeah. Oh, are you gonna hunt? Oh, no. Oh, no. You're not gonna catch me with that gag again. Go work it on somebody else. Hmm? Say, Phil, what are you gonna do this New Year's Eve? Well, me and Remley are going around frightening people, you know, like we did on Halloween. Frightening people? Yeah, what fun we had. We made up like goats and went to a nightclub where Maxie Rosenblum and Maxie Bear were doing their act. Well, what's exciting about that? Well, here's what happened. She Remley started off by going into Rosenblum's dressing room and began to haunt him. Oh, and did you haunt Bear? No, I had a sheet on. <laughs> Kid. Bye, Phil. So long, Phil. Uh, you know, I think it... Say, Jack, what are you saying at the door for? I was just thinking about Phil. Remember what a nice, normal fellow he was before they started hiding microfilm in his head? <laughs> oh, well. Say, uh, Jack, I want to talk to you about the commercial. The boy... Jack, a minute, Don. Before we get started with the commercial, there's something I want to phone Rochester about. Well, can't it wait till later? No, Don, this is important. I'm having my new girlfriend, Daisy Dickinson, over for dinner tonight. And I want to see if Rochester has everything all set. It'll only take a minute to call him. Say, Mabel, what is it, Grace? Say? <laughs> Mr. Benny's line is working. Yeah, I wonder what portrait of Jenny wants now. <laughs> I'll plug in and see. Yes, Mr. Benny. I'll bring the house immediately. Huh? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I got them. Thank you very much, and a Merry Christmas to you, too. Oh, yeah, they were just beautiful, and they fit me perfectly. Now I'll bring you hot. Great, right, kid. What did Mr. Benny give you for Christmas? My two front teeth. <laughs> Gee, I didn't even notice. Smile and let me see them. Oh, how lovely. Two great, kid. Merry Christmas, Jack Benny. <laughs> Maple. Well, Mr. Benny knows how I've always wanted to see a Rose Bowl game. And he's taking you to the game? No, he gave me his place in the ticket line. <laughs> you know, he's awful thoughtful this time of the year and kind of cute, too. When he come in this afternoon, he tipped his hat to me and I just had to kiss him. I know, I kissed him, too. He's a shrewd one, all right. <laughs> Planting mistletoe in his toupee. <laughs> He doesn't need mistletoe with me. I kind of go for him. Last night, he drove me up to the top of Mulholland Drive, and we parked there for hours. 
Why, Mabel Flopsaddle. <laughs> Please, Grace, you're breaking the mood. <laughs> anyway, we drove up there early in the evening, and as we sat in his car, the city looked like a carpet of brilliant jewels as the millions and millions of lights went on. Oh, that must have been romantic. Romantic nothing. He just sat there wishing he owned the electric company. <laughs> with me. What do you mean? A few months ago, he took me out in his car, and my goodness, was he a need to be there. Did he try to kiss you? How do you think I lost my two front teeth? <laughs> you know, Jason, there was a time I thought that... Hello? Yeah, Mr. Benny, I tried to get your house, but the line is busy. Oh, well, I'll try again later. Thank you. Say, Jack, I've been trying to talk to you about the commercial. We'll have to do the commercial without the sportsman quartet. But why? Aren't they here? Well, yes, but that's what I've been trying to tell you. They have very bad coal. All four of them? What are they doing about it? They chipped in and bought a four-way coal tablet. <laughs> John, you got the award for being an announcer, not a comedian. And anyway, whether they have coals or not, we need a commercial. I know, Jack, but how can they sing when they have coal? That's their problem. All I know is I have to have a commercial. Now, go ahead with it. Okay. Take it, boys! Happy days are again We'll do easy for Again we will all set up as Dessert hard Thank you, happy days for you and me Lucky strikes are here to stay In fact, they never get away So we'll celebrate fun I can tell you just what to do. Get in bed and stay there. When we're old and things are rough, we'll light a lucky cake one puff. Then we'll feel much better, sure enough. Happy days are here again. Yes, here again. They must have caught that cold from Guy Lombardo. Anyway, Don, it was all right. Jack, you ought to be ashamed of yourself making the boys sing when they had such bad colds. They had to sing through their noses. Fred Allen's been doing that for 20 years, and he sounds awful. <laughs> Happy New Year, Dennis. <laughs> Don, you better tell well, me. Well, Portland, look who's coming down Main Street. Titus Moody. Dennis. Howdy, bub. Dennis. <laughs> Now, Don, you better tell the boys. Oh, for heaven's sake. Come in. Uh, remember me, Mr. Benny? Huh? Oh, yes. You're the lingerie clerk in that department store who sold me that nightgown for my sister last week. Yeah. The nightgown with the loops on the bottom. Yeah. A nightgown with loops on the bottom? Yeah. When you go to bed, you put the loops over your toes so the nightgown won't creep up on you. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Did you send it to my sister? No, that's why I'm here. We found out those nightgowns are dangerous. Dangerous? Yeah. My wife has one of those nighties with the loop. And last week in the middle of the night, she started to get out of bed and almost broke her neck. <laughs> How? Uh, what happened? She had her loops over my toes. <laughs> down to the store and get something else for my sister. Okay. Ask for me, Ronald J. Coleman. <laughs> Ronald J. Coleman? I threw in the J so people won't confuse us. <laughs> well, I'll see you later. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> you know, Mary... I can't understand why they put a fellow like him in the lingerie department. Well, Jack, maybe deep down inside he's very sensitive. How can he be sensitive? He came in here with a gopher sticking out of his collar. <laughs> anyway, I'll have... To. I'll get it. Hello? Hello, Mr. Bennett. It's Roger. Oh, hello, Roger. 
Chester. I was trying to get you before. Is everything ready for dinner tonight? Don't worry, boss. Everything will be fine. Just fine. Good, good. I really want to impress Miss Dickinson. Now, what did you do about the campaign? Same as always. I slapped the mum's label on a bottle of ginger ale and put it on ice. What? And when you open it, I'll be hiding behind the screen with my pop gun. Look. Let's synchronize our watches now. Okay, I've got 528 and a half. Roger. Good. Now, Rochester, I hope you remember the instructions I gave you about tonight. Yes, sir. After I finish serving you and Miss Dickinson, I'm supposed to, I'm supposed to turn all the lights down low. Uh-huh. Put soft music on the phonograph and spray the room with Chanel number no. 5. Uh-huh. Then quietly leave the room and let your blue eyes take it over from there. That's right. Then when I'm outside, I'm supposed to turn the garden hose on the windows so you can say, Look, honey, it's raining. You can't go home yet. <laughs> yeah, but watch it tonight. The last time, the window was open. <laughs> the girl hadn't been Esther Williams, she would have drowned. <laughs> now, Rochester, fix everything up nice, and I'll be home in a few minutes. Okay. Uh, uh, goodbye. Goodbye. Oh, say, boss. Now what? I forgot to tell you. Uh, there was quite a bit of excitement today. An airplane flew over Hollywood and started skywriting. Skywriting? What did it say? Next week, Jack Benny's program moves to... Moves to where? Moves to where? I don't know. NBC's anti-aircraft shot him down. Oh. Well, we'll find out later. Goodbye, Rochester. Goodbye. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, next week we'll be with you again at the same time with the same cast on another network. However, I want to take this opportunity of thanking everyone connected with NBC for a very pleasant association. And I also want to wish everybody a very happy New Year. Jack will be back in just a minute, but first, smoke a Lucky to feel your level best. Smoke a Lucky to feel your level best. You see, Lucky's fine tobacco picks you up when you're low, calms you down when you're tense, puts you on the right level to feel and do your level best. It's good to know that fine tobacco can do this for you. And that's why it's so important that you select and smoke the cigarette of fine tobacco, Lucky Strike. For as every smoker knows, L-S-N-F-T, L-S-N-F-T, Lucky Strike means fine tobacco, mild, ripe, light tobacco. No wonder Lucky Strike is the overwhelming favorite of tobacco experts. For more independent auctioneers, buyers, and warehousemen smoke Luckies regularly than the next two leading brands combined. So smoke a Lucky to feel your level best. Get on the right level, the lucky level, where there's real joy in living, where it's fun to be alive. The lucky level where you feel your best and do your best. Smoke a lucky to feel your level best. Smoke a lucky to feel your level best. Get on the lucky level where it's fun to be alive. Get a carton of luckies and get started today. Good night, everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, listen again next time to the Jack Benny program, which will be heard on another network at the same time. This is NBC, the national broadcast. Mm-hmm.